Stay up to date on light novels by downloading our mobile app Zero Books Universal Zero Books USA Only Zero Books iOS Download all your favorite light novels Chnovels.com Join our Discord and meet thousands of LN readers to chat with Prologue, The Young Tiger Awakens, Summer of the 1543 Road Year, Continental Calendar, approximately three years before Suma was summoned to this world in the steppes northeast of the Union of Eastern Nations. Above the broad blue sky and the towering cumulonimbus clouds, below the vast carpet of grass that seemed to stretch out forever. With no great mountains, only gentle hills, if you strained your eyes, you could see far into the distance. Four mounted knights raced across those steps like the wind. The four knights all bore arms and wore armor. The orange-haired mounts they rode were like a cross between a mountain goat and an oryx. These animals were called Thames box, and they were raised to serve in place of war horses. A Thames box could leap to great heights with a rider on its back, giving birth to the leaping cavalry, a type of troop that only existed on these steps. Riding at the lead of the group was a big man who was a little over the age of twenty. The big man turned back to shout, ha ha ha. You're falling behind, Kaysen. H hold on, the youngest of the group, the boy riding at the very rear, practically screamed in response. Lord Fuagawa. The one leading the group was Fuagawa Han. He was the 22-year-old son of Rega Han, the unifier of the steppes. This was before he met Durga the Flying Tiger so he rode a Thames bock like the others. But even at this time, he already had the appearance of a general. The boy at the rear, who had a quiver and bow gun on his back, was Kaysen Shuri. At thirteen years of age he was the youngest of Fuagar's cohorts, but his skills as a mounted archer were good enough to leave any of the others speechless. Bwah ha 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 ha! If you keep whining, we'll leave you behind. Kaysen said one man in the middle of the group. He rode atop a saddle with decorations that could have competed with those of the Polish winged hussars for showiness. Kaysen frowned. The way those wings jangle is too noisy, Gaten. Ha ha. Too bad. These wings are my trademark. His name was Gaten Burra. He was the only human present, thus having no wings. He was vain and superficial, but a talented commander who used the iron whip he kept at his waist to fight using a highly variable style of combat. He <laughs> he, Lord Fuagar doesn't need laggards following him. That's what you said when you left Maumir behind, Kaysen glared resentfully at Gaten who shrugged. There was nothing else to be done about Maumir. He rode on a step yak. Maumirioku. The man they were talking about, was even larger than Fuaga. He was a powerful warrior who wielded a big hammer. However, due to his massive size, he was unable to ride a Thames bock. Instead he rode a step yak, a large, woolly cow-like creature raised on the steps. That left him unable to keep up with Fuaga and the rest, so he would have to catch up with them at his own slow pace later. If you two keep blathering, you're going to bite your tongues Shuu Kin Tan, Fuagar's childhood friend, warned. Being the same age as Fuagar, he was a superb warrior and strategist. It was expected that he'd become Fuagar's closest aide the day Fuagar took his father's place as king. Shuu Kin brought his Thames bock up alongside Fuagar's. Anyway, Fuagar, just how far do you plan to go? As far as I can. Ha. Huh. Don't you think it'd be fun to keep going until we run out of land? Fuagar said, looking at the horizon with a laugh. Shuukin pressed his fingers into his forehead, shaking his head with dismay. We're heading north right now. If we keep going, we'll end up in the Demon Lord's domain, you know. So. We'll make the Demon Lord's domain part of our domain too. Are you insane? 
Even your great father was pushed to his limits just unifying the steps Shuukin said, but there was a glint in Fuagar's eye. My old man had to start with just a single tribe. That's why unifying our homeland into the single nation of Malmkitten was all he could manage. But I'm starting with Malmkitten. Shuukin, my friend, do you think me a lesser commander than my father? No. You are greater than he. Knowing Fuagar as well as he did, these words were not mere flattery, but something he genuinely believed. Martial prowess, strategy, command, Fuagar lacked in none of them when compared with King Rhaegar, and he had a greater charisma that drew others to him. Fuagar smiled widely and thrust his fist towards the heavens. I'll race from this step and go as far as I can. The routes we take will become our roads, the things we see will become our land. We'll expand our country to the utmost limit. It was a bold claim. And yet, Shuukin didn't think it was impossible. Ever since the Demon Lord's domain appeared, the people of the continent had tended to look down. They stopped hoping for things to become better, and instead prayed that they could face a tomorrow no worse than today. Despite that, Fuagal had his eyes set on a bright, distant future. This was how a leader ought to be. Lord Fuagal. I will follow you anywhere, said Kaysen. Ha ha ha. It's fun to run with a commander, after all, agreed Gaten. The two had been listening to their conversation. Fuagal and Shuukin looked at one another then laughed at their reaction. Of course. I'll be with you too, my friend. Yeah, Shuukin. Come on the endless journey with me. The two of them drove their Thames box to run even faster. However, that winter, the moment of destiny arrived, Rhaegar Han, founder of the steppe nation Malmkitten, suddenly passed away. The cause was an epidemic disease but his death came so suddenly that rumors spread saying it was the work of an opposing political faction. The fact that every tribe began making disquieting moves shortly afterwards only poured fuel on that fire. The day of Rhaegar's funeral came. The tradition of his tribe was to dig a hole in the open steppe, lay the body and funerary accessories to rest, then finally slaughter a horse and bury it with the deceased. Rhaegar had asked for that kind of traditional burial when he was still alive. Old man. Is this as far as you could go? Fuagar thought as he looked down at his father laid in the ground. You unified the steps and became king. You, a man like none before, unfettered by tradition. And yet, you still chose to be buried in the old ways. What will I do? Will there be a time when I, too, entrust myself to our customs? I want to live a more glorious life and meet an end I can be satisfied with. As Fuagar contemplated, his ten-year-old sister Yuriga clung tightly to his side. He put a hand on her shoulder, pulling her even closer. Suddenly, a messenger arrived, shouting, I bring a message. The tribes hostile towards Rhaegar have banded together and are headed this way now. Given their words, it was likely another messenger would rush in before the funeral ended. Damn. They must see Lord Rhaegar's passing as their chance to strike. Shuukin said, his voice full of distaste. Yuriga squeezed Fuagar tight. Big brother, don't fret, Yuriga. Fuagar gently placed a hand on her shoulder to push her away, then called out to an old muscular wolf-eared soldier nearby, Gayfuku. The man's name was Gayfuku Kian. He was of the mystic wolf race, but unlike Tomo, he had not left as a refugee, having served the house of Han under Rega. Gayfuku crossed his arms and said, Sir, gather the men at once. Just the ones who can come. Yes, sir. Should I put out the call to our allied tribes as well? No need. 
They'll want to stay out of this until a victor is made clear. I'm sure they're waiting to see if I'm a worthy heir to Rhaegar Han. And that's exactly what I'm gonna show them. Next Fuagar looked to his young friends. Shuukin, Maumia, Gaten, Kaysen. Yes, sir. Each of you, gather the men you've trained for this day. We will show our prowess. Those who oppose us and those who choose to wait and see shall come to kneel before my feet. Yeah. The enemy had rounded up around 3,000 men. Fuagar's personal forces numbered a thousand. And yet, this did nothing to erase his indomitable smile. Gaten, take a hundred riders to attack their right flank. Make it showy and draw their attention. Understood, Commander. Kaysen, take a hundred mounted archers to shoot at their left flank. Make them break formation. Yes, sir. Having received their orders, Gaten and Kaysen went to attack the flanks. Taking advantage of their swift Thames box, they stuck to tactics that damaged the enemy while limiting their own casualties. It was similar to flies swarming around the mass of enemies that all rushed towards them in one group. The enemy that had tried to overwhelm them with numbers was caught off guard and broke formation. Seeing this, Fuagar put on his helmet, and said to Shuukin, OK, Shuukin. We're going straight in. To disrupt the enemy and spread chaos, right? Exactly he replied. Fuagar turned and called to a huge man riding a step yak, Maumia. You take the infantry. Once the enemy is confused, charge in. Right. Understood. Maumia bellowed, thumping his chest with one hand while the other held his large hammer. Fuagar nodded. I'm leaving the defense here to you, Gayfuku. Take care of everyone. Leave it to me, young master, no, my lord. Gayfuku said, crossing his arms in front of him. Turning to face forward once more, Fuagar gave the order, All right, let's move, Shuukin. Yeah. The two of them led the leaping cavalry into the middle of the enemy. As they approached the enemy's front line, they bounded over the soldiers who were holding their shields ready, easily clearing the defensive line to attack the archers behind them. The archers, who had relaxed their guard, assuming they were safe behind the shield-bearers, were put to the slaughter by Fuagar and his men's blades. We have the numerical advantage. Regroup. One commander in an especially impressive suit of armor tried to recover from the chaos, but... You're in the way. What? With one slice of Zangonto, the rock-rending blade, Fuagar parted the man's head from his shoulders. The man must have been a major commander in the enemy force, because the chaos accelerated. By the time Maumir arrived with the infantry, the enemy had completely collapsed. The leaping cavalry pursued their fleeing enemy and showed no quarter. When all was done, the steps were slick with the blood of their foes. Fuagar and his men had defeated their attackers despite facing superior numbers. With this victory, Fuagar proved himself a worthy successor to Rhaegar. No. In fact, he proved he might be even greater. The steppe tribes all submitted to him. Even the tribes that Rhaegar had only been able to bring under his sway as allies submitted, making Fuagar the true king of the steppes. The young tiger's road to hegemony began here. Chapter 1 The Wavering States Start of the 1549th year, Continental Calendar, Suma defeats the giant sea monster, Oyamijuchi, the report of the Kingdom of Frydenia and the Archipelago Union's conjoined effort to slay the monster which terrorized the nine-headed dragon archipelago was greeted with great excitement in their respective homelands. One reason for such excitement in the kingdom was that this was the first time the summoned hero Suma had done something so heroic. 
Sumer's only victorious campaigns before this point had been in the war against Amidaniya, and the expedition to the Union of Eastern Nations. The war with the Principality of Amidaniya had hurt both sides, and any gains had nearly been nullified. It was only thanks to the efforts of one Roroa Amidaniya that the kingdom and principality had been peacefully brought into a union, and neither country was declared the victor or loser. As for the expedition to the Union of Eastern Nations, he had made a big show of that being done at the request of the Grand Chaos Empire. Although Ishihar had joined them there, along with other personnel who would make the country stronger, that was hard for the common people to see. Many of them believed it had been a whole lot of effort for nothing. However, with a growing awareness of how important Ishihar was, Suma's foresight was being proven. Still, what he had done there wasn't seen as an especially heroic act. Nonetheless, this time Suma had sent the fleet to the nine-headed dragon archipelago, slaying the Kijoya Maijachi that had wreaked havoc on the land. It was a clear show of military prowess. And to top it off, he had brought the fleet of the archipelago Union, up until now believed to be a hostile nation, back with him. For the common people who were not privy to what went on behind the scenes, it looked like Suma defeated the monster that was tormenting the archipelago Union, and made them submit to him out of admiration. Those rumors had the people ecstatic about Suma's glorious victory. Meanwhile, in the Nine-Headed Dragon Archipelago, they had heightened regard for the Kingdom of Frydenaya which had helped them to slay Oyamaijachi, and King Suma and Princess Shabon were lauded for the key roles they played in that victory. Suma was now being praised by the population of two nations, but news of his exploits had not yet reached the people of other states, excluding the rulers, and other people of importance. That was because of another, greater accomplishment. Fuagar of Malmkitten has retaken a portion of the Demon Lord's domain. Reclamation had been the goal of mankind for more than a decade, and it had raised Fuagar and Malmkitten's profiles both inside and outside the Union of Eastern Nations. The fervor of the people inside was especially intense. Voices calling for the reorganization of the Union to make Fuagar their supreme leader or a unified state with Fuagar as their king, were growing by the day. The Union of Eastern Nations had a history of its many small to medium-sized states annexing one another and breaking apart. The whole area was a mess of familial alliances. It had been hard for any one state to stand out in the middle of all that. Even though the Kingdom of Frydenaya on their southern border was gradually growing in power, this state remained unchanged. The people had waited many long years for someone to come and break the deadlock. Now, Fuagal had arrived. The great man they had been waiting for. They saw the light of hope in the way Fuagal charged blindly towards his ambitions. However, the stronger the light, the deeper the shadows it casts. As his admirers increased in number, so did the number of people who viewed Fuagar as a threat. Matthew Chima, father of Ishihar and Matsumi, and ruler of the Duchy of Chima, was one of them. This is bad. Very bad, Matthew murmured to himself as he paced around the office. A sharp-eyed man in his late twenties watched him. Father. What has you so agitated? In response to the sharp-eyed man's question, Slam. You know what, Hashim. Fuagar Han. Matthew shouted, slamming his hands down on a nearby desk. The man he called Hashim was his eldest son, Hashim Chima. He was the one who had most strongly inherited Matthew's talent for scheming. During the recent demon wave, an outbreak of monsters, Matthew had come up with the unorthodox plan to secure allies and increase his own influence. He offered his famously talented children, with the exception of Hashim, the oldest, and Ishihar, the youngest, as rewards to those who came to their aid. 
because Hashim was heir to the house of Chima, he had not been included as one of the rewards. However, if you were to ask someone, at least, someone who didn't have unique standards like Suma, who the most talented of the siblings was, then even the siblings themselves would tell you that it was Hashim. Matthew told Hashim, Lately, not a day goes by where I don't hear that man's name. That's to be expected. He is reclaiming the demon lord's domain, even if it was only a part of it. Not even the empire could do that. It's not surprising that the people would support him fervently. I'm telling you that's a problem. Matthew glared at his aloof son. Should this continue, his voice within the union will grow too strong. There are already those calling for him to be made king of the entire union. I see. But is that not inevitable? His charisma must be powerful enough to draw all of those people to him Hashim said coolly, to which Matthew let out an angry snort. The ignorant masses know not the danger of the man. His eyes are focused far in the distance, beyond the demon lord's domain. Retaking that wasteland will likely not be enough for him. I am sure he will swallow every state in the Union. You believe he seeks to unify the Union of Eastern Nations? Hashim asked, but Matthew shook his head. It could be even worse. That sort of man is not satisfied if he is not first in everything. He may even seek to compete with the Kingdom of Frydenia in the South and the Grand Chaos Empire in the West. That comment made Hashim stroke his chin thoughtfully. A union of Eastern nations that can compete with the Kingdom and Empire for hegemony. I might like to see that. Don't be a fool. The entire organization and structure of the Union of Eastern Nations will be gone by that point. All that will be left is a country of Fuagar worshippers Matthew spat, practically disgorging the words in distaste. He will destroy everything. The blood ties built between our countries, and the diplomatic network our house has worked so hard to create. If that man sees them as an obstacle, he will eradicate them completely. If we don't stop him before he grows to his fullest, it will be too late. Please, father. Don't tell me you mean to join the Antifuagar faction. Sir Fuagar is married to Matsumi, remember? The reproachful look Hashim was giving him made Matthew sigh. I welcomed their marriage because of what an extraordinary man he was, but that man was far too extraordinary. If only Matsumi would keep him in check, no, if it comes to it, kill him, father. Matsumi. She seems to adore Fuaga. I doubt she'll do anything to stop him. That is why I need to take the initiative. Matthew looked resolute as he spoke. Now is the time. Already a third of the countries in the Union of Eastern Nations swear loyalty to Fuaga. The rest are either wary of him or confused. He must be stopped before his faction grows and the anti Fuaga faction sees further attrition. As far as Matthew Chima was concerned, or rather, as far as small nations like the Duchy of Chima were concerned, Fuaga was a threat to the web of diplomatic ties they had worked so hard to build up. Maintaining balance inside the Union through diplomacy was how the past Dukes of Chima had survived. That was why Matthew couldn't suffer Fuagar's existence. Matthew rose and walked towards the door. I must contact my children scattered throughout the nations. It would be reassuring if we could receive support from the Kingdom of Frydenia where Ishihar is, but I heard that Fuagar's younger sister is also with King Suma. If Fuagar sent her with the intent of making her King Suma's bride, it may be more dangerous to call in the kingdom's forces, he left the room talking to himself like that. As Hashim watched his father go, I'll have to caution him against rash and delusional actions he said to himself in a quiet voice. Around the time that Matthew Chima was making contact with the anti-Fuagar faction, 
far from the Duchy of Chima, in the governmental affairs office in the Kingdom of Frydenia's Parnam Castle, Suma was reading a report from the Black Cats, as well as a routine update from Julius. Both of them essentially said, the Antifuagar faction inside the Union of Eastern Nations is growing more active than ever before. In the not-too-distant future, the Antifuagar faction will take some sort of action against the Pro-Fuagar faction. Phew, when Suma finished reading the reports he laid them down on his desk, leaning back in his chair with a sigh as he looked around the room. The only ones in the office aside from him were Lysia, the first primary queen, Hakuya, the prime minister, and Kijetara, who had brought him the Black Cat's report. Suma told them, the Black Cats and Julius are in agreement that the Antifuagar faction will act soon. Julius notes the Antifuagar faction has been maintaining contact with one another across a wide area inside the Union of Eastern Nations. Despite this, it's been done in a way that keeps the ringleader hidden. We can assume someone rather sharp is on the move. Yes, Sire Kijetara agreed. My men have also failed to find whoever is directing the Antifuagar faction. Suma nodded. I can't blame them. That whole country is a mess of marital alliances, after all. Their ability to coordinate their actions internally is incredible, but they're closed off to the outside. Even for the black cats, that has to make gathering intel hard. Indeed. So just how many people are in this Antifuagar faction? Lysia asked, and Suma checked Julius's report for the answer. At least twice as many as the pro-Fuagar faction, apparently. That's surprisingly large. Hasn't he made a name for himself retaking part of the Demon Lord's domain? Among the people of the Union he has, yes. But the ones that command the troops are the rulers who stand above those people. As far as they are concerned, the way Fuagar has focused the expectations of the public upon himself is intolerable. If their own people want to be ruled by Fuagar, that makes their own positions pretty tenuous, after all. I see. So even if the people back Sir Fuagar, there are a lot of states that are against him Lysia said clapping her hands together as she figured it out. Suma nodded. And the larger the country, the stronger that tendency is. Malmkitten is a steppe region that was first unified as a nation under Fuagar's predecessor, Rega. Being forced to play second fiddle to an upstart nation like that is going to rub a lot of people the wrong way. The longer their traditions and the more pride they have in their position as a powerful country within the Union, the more they are going to push back against it. In fact, the most powerful nation inside the Union of Eastern Nations, the Kingdom of Shan, has already declared themselves part of the Antifuagar faction. The Kingdom of Shan was a medium-sized state with the largest territory and the greatest power inside the Union of Eastern Nations. They also provided the largest number of troops to the Union Army, a military composed of forces provided by all the member states, giving them the greatest clout in that organization. They had also provided reinforcements to the Duchy of Chima during the Demon Wave, and, due to Suma's withdrawal, been recognized as having made the second largest contribution after Fuagar and Malmkitten. For this they were awarded the brawny second son of the House of Chima, Nata. The current king of Shan was Shama Shan. If you were to compare him to someone in the kingdom of Frydenia, he was a muscular old warrior like Owen or Herman. The country valued strength in a way similar to mercenary state Zem, so Shama had welcomed Nata, who could swing around a big axe, as his own son. Lysia cocked her head to the side and asked, Then is King Shama the head of the Antifuagar faction? No. Looking at the secrecy in the way the Antifuagar faction communicates, I can't imagine King Shama is directing them was Julius's reading of the situation. 
in the same way that the Western Army at the Battle of Sekigahara had Moraita Umoto as their supreme commander and Ishida Mitsunari as operational planner, there might be another man pulling the strings behind the most powerful member of the faction. The Western Army at Sekigahara. When that thought crossed his mind, the face of a man who probably excelled at this kind of scheming did too. Don't tell me it's him. It was none other than Matthew, who he had thought of as being similar to Sanada Meizuki, a supposed two-faced man. But Suma didn't say anything. This was just baseless speculation. Besides, considering that Matthew had sent his daughter Matsumi to marry Fuaga, Suma couldn't be confident he was in the anti-Fuaga faction. Obviously, that wasn't out of concern for his daughter. If Fuaga rose to the top, Matthew already had a marital tie to him, so Suma had assumed it was unlikely he would join the anti Fuaga faction. However, Suma's reading of the situation could be incorrect. Due to his refusal to use his family as political tools, Suma had put out of his mind the fact that there were people who could. If he had realized Matthew's scheming at this point, Suma would definitely have tried to stop him, whether he was able to or not. Because all this was doing was feeding the tiger they called a great man. There are more in the anti-Fuaga faction than we expected. Enough that it's possible the pro-Fuaga faction could lose. But you don't actually believe that, do you, sire? Hakuya asked, sounding certain, and Suma nodded. If Fuaga was an opponent they could beat with mere numbers, I wouldn't see him as a threat. Even if Fuaga took over all of the Union of Eastern Nations, he would still have less land and power than we do. The thing that makes Fuaga dangerous isn't numerical superiority or the power of his nation, it's that he's riding the flow of things. The flow, you say? Yeah. Of the times. The atmosphere of the era we live in, you could say. Those who join a great man like Fuaga are considered just, and those who oppose him are evil. It's an atmosphere that naturally assigns roles like that. In the final stage of the Warring States period, the actions of great men like Adar Nobunaga, be they good or evil, were largely approved of, or at least tolerated. It's like how people defend Machiavelli as the prince by saying you can't see its true value without first understanding the scheming nature of the Italian peninsula during his time. The houses of Azakura, Azai, and Takeda which stood in the way of Adar Nobunaga's conquest were destroyed as they tended to be seen as stubborn fools who couldn't adapt to the new era. This was especially true for the kind of people who only see them as winners and losers written about in the textbook. Unless you're a real history buff, you don't go around thinking about the situations of those sorts of destroyed houses. Suma sensed that Fuaga was the same sort of great man. There are people who are praising Fuaga as some kind of savior. Those who stand in his way will be deemed fools and if they try to harm him, they'll be derided as enemies of mankind. No matter how powerful the country, that would be difficult to overturn. Similar to the way people in the empire venerate Madame Maria as a saint. Hakuya asked, and Suma nodded deeply. Yes, that's right. The anti faction must not understand that. He's that much of a problem. Ha, Lysia said with a sigh. Kijetara quietly stepped forward. If he disturbs your heart so, my liege, then perhaps we should, absolutely not. Suma shouted, cutting off Kijetara's suggestion of assassination. Fuagar is dangerous because he's riding on the flow of the times. We could call his intentions the will of the times itself. And, this is said frequently but you can't change the times with assassinations and terrorism Suma said, leaning back in his chair, arms crossed. Great men are monsters that give birth to eras. This era of confusion longs for the great leaps of a man like Fuaga. 
so even if someone did manage to assassinate him, the next Fuagar would simply appear to follow in his tracks. No, if anything, after seeing what happened to Fuagar, whoever came next would be even more extreme. Even after Ada Nobunaga died in the betrayal at Honalji, Hashiba Hideyoshi immediately took up leadership of the attempt to unify the country. It didn't lead to a return to an era of rivalry between warlords. And when Hideyoshi fell, Tokugawa Yasu took his place. If you look at it as a transition from an era of rival warlords to that of a single great power, you could say that while the rulers changed, the flow of the era remained unchanged. Great men create eras. To look at that another way, you could also say that eras choose and give birth to great men. That was the sense Suma had gotten from studying history in the world he came from. For instance, in the world Suma came from, there was a dictator whose name was synonymous with evil. The dictator faced many assassination plots and attempted coups d'etat throughout his life, but had any of them succeeded, would the history that followed have changed somehow? This has been said many times, but it was the people of that era who created the dictator. So long as the will of the people and the situation they find themselves in do not change, another similar dictator, or perhaps political party, will simply rise to the top. And won't the new dictator seek to do what he feels the dead one should have? In a more extreme fashion. Sima Qian lamented in records of the grand historian that sometimes excellent men die unfairly due to the flow of the era by saying, the power of heaven is small. But if the heaven he was talking about is the flow of the era, then I'd have to say what's truly small is the power of man, thought Suma. Machiavelli spoke of the concept of Fortuna, the goddess of chance, in opposition to Virtu, or individual initiative, as the fate that could not be changed. Or that could, perhaps, have its flow made more gentle, if only slightly, through Virtu. Right now, Fuagal had to be the man best loved by Fortuna. Anyone who confronted him directly was in for a world of hurt. That's why Suma said, if the times have chosen Fuaga, what we need to change is not him, but the times themselves. If the times have no need of Fuaga, then men like him will cease to be born. Sorry. That was all a little too abstract for me to understand Lysia said apologetically. What exactly are you thinking we should do? I still don't know yet. But I have the key. Suma rose and walked over to stand in front of the map of this continent, slamming his hand on the north of it. It's the demon lord's domain. The majority of people's unease now comes from the existence of the demon lord's domain in the north. If this issue can just be resolved, great men like Fuagar will no longer be needed the way they are now. Ha! Huh. But isn't Fuagar gathering support by doing something about the Demon Lord's domain? Isn't that a contradiction? Lysia asked. Yesuma nodded in response. It does look like a contradiction. But I think that's the essence of what a great man is. They are needed in times of chaos, but not in times of peace. When the great man races to end the times of chaos, he is heading towards the world where he will no longer be needed. The great man created by the era transforms the era by his own power and then fades away. Or, because of the changing times, the era chooses a new leader, and the great man is cast aside. That had to be one of the more tragic aspects of the great man. Then Hakuya said to Suma, so, to sum up. What you are saying is that we should avoid opposing Sir Fuagar for the time being, sire. Yeah. We have no choice but to avoid fighting Fuagar while figuring out how to handle the Demon Lord's domain, and also strengthening the country in preparation for the conflict. I do see some small hope in regards to the Demon Lord's domain. Back in the Star Dragon Mount range, he had encountered a mysterious cube. 
he'd heard it ask him to go north. If Suma could encounter the being called the Demon Lord with sufficient preparation, he might be able to gain something that would let him move the era. There existed a slight hope of that. And if Fuagar attacks us with the Union of Eastern Nations before then? Lycia asked. That is easy to deal with Hakuya responded, rather than Suma. The Fuagar faction's new country will have no one who has experience running a state of such a large size. He will lack bureaucrats too, so if we simply turn it into a war of attrition, our opponents will be the ones to expend themselves first. That said, Sir Fuagar must know that, so he will not make a move against us until he has the overwhelming advantage, or he finds himself in a desperate situation. What a troublesome opponent, yeah, you said it. Suma had to agree. I'll have to tell Julius to stay out of the Antifuagar faction, Suma thought as he looked at the map of the Union of Eastern Nations. And also, if it comes down to it, he should flee to the kingdom with the Lastanian royal family. Chapter 2, Assassin and Ripples, Start of the Fifth Month 1549 th year, Continental Calendar, Fuagar was leading a Malmkitten military procession as it advanced through the ruins north of the Union of Eastern Nations, in the southeast of the Demon Lord's domain. They marched in a long, undefended, snake-like column as if to boast there was no enemy that could defeat them. In fact, the monsters that had long infested this area had already been exterminated by Malmkitten. The road the troops were traveling along was now stable enough that traveling merchants could use it. Here, in this land where it never snowed, they had been able to fight properly even in winter, but the summer heat made it hard to fight for any length of time. For that reason, the battle to reclaim the Demon Lord's domain would have to take a break during the seventh and eight months of the year, when the region was hottest. However, in order to stay on the offensive right up until that point, Fuagar had decided they needed to let the troops rest. He was currently pulling them back to the safe zone. Standing out in the middle of the column was the great white tiger, Durga. Fuagar was lying on the tiger's back his armor removed. He was using this opportunity to nap as Durga walked along at a relaxed pace. ZZZ. Audible snoring could be heard. Although they had returned to safe territory, there were still violent creatures that lived in the area, and he was surrounded by armed soldiers. That he could sleep in this situation spoke to Fuagar's strength, and the bold personality underpinned by that strength. A single Thamesbok rider approached Fuagar. Please wake up, Lord Fuagar. H.M. What is it? Waking to the sound of his name being called, Fuagar sat up and scratched his head. Noticing that it was Shuukin who'd roused him from his slumber, he asked, What's up, Shuukin? Did something happen? No, nothing in particular. We're about to arrive. Home. Oh, we're finally there, huh? Fuagar said, stretching. Traveling with an army's always so slow. I could have been here with Durga in no time. You're our commander-in-chief. Who could lead the men if not you? Sheesh. The bigger the military gets, the more people care about stuff like rank. Even you've gotten used to calling me Lord Fuagar now. Because of their close age, Fuagar and Shuukin had once treated one another casually, like friends. And it wasn't just Shuukin, there were many others in the army like Maumia, Gaten, and Kaysen, who had long been his partners in mischief. Ever since Fuagar took the throne, though, Shuukin had begun showing him the proper respect as a retainer so as to keep his other subjects from disrespecting him. It must have made Fuagar feel a little lonely. Shuukin shrugged his shoulders with a look of exasperation on his face. You're the sovereign of a nation. Of course I'd pay you due respect. 
Anyways, we're on the march, so please wear your armor and helmet. You're setting a poor example for the troops, and more importantly, it's careless. Don't be so stiff. We've pretty much wiped out all the monsters around here, haven't we? Shukin shook his head, a stern look on his face. You're right that we won't see an attack by monsters. However, there are some who have not taken kindly to your profile rising inside the Union of Eastern Nations. There could be assassins along the road, Lord Fuaga. I've sent out scouts, of course, but, human jealous is scarier than any monster, ha. Huh? What a nuisance Fuaga said, digging the wax out of his ears as he listened. Shukin furrowed his brow at his liege's in caution. How can you talk like this has nothing to do with you? Your life is in danger. Hey, Shukin. Wouldn't you say our country has grown? Fuaga asked, suddenly changing the topic. H.M. I suppose it has, Shuukin cock his head to the side quizzically. We've expanded outside the steppes, and we have a lot of protectorates. It's fair to say we have the greatest momentum of any country in the Union of Eastern Nations. Yeah. It's like this was fate. If there's a will of the heavens, it's apparently on our side Fuagar replied, with a suspiciously calm tone. Don't tell me, you're saying because the heavens are on our side, we don't need to worry about assassins. Shukin gave him a pointed look, as if to say, that's not how things work. Fuagar shook his head with a wry smile, looking up to the sky. We've overcome all the trials we've faced to grow our country. So, maybe that's why, when things are going too smoothly, it actually makes me more uneasy. Am I moving forward of my own will? Or is there some unseen force pushing me? Lord Fuaga, Shuri muttered, hearing his sentimental words. Well, it's not a bad feeling. If I keep riding this current, it will take me further, higher. And if I fall along the way, I'll be able to accept it means I was never cut out for anything more than that. It's fulfilling, in a way. You shouldn't talk about falling like that. It's ominous. Gahaha. It's fine, Sir Shuukin, said a wolf-eared warrior as he approached. It was Gay Fuku of the Mystic Wolf Race. He flexed his pecs and biceps striking a pose as he shot the two of them an overbearing smile. He was still a mass of muscle despite having passed middle age. If a vile assassin comes anywhere near my lord, my well-toned body will be your shield. I have built this strong back and these herbs all for the house of Han. Ha! Ha! Gay Fuku continued striking poses like a bodybuilder as he spoke. He was sweaty and the temperature around him had probably risen a good 5 degrees Celsius from his body heat. Fuagar and Shuukin did their best not to look at him and kept talking. By the way, where's Matsumi? I don't see her around. If you're looking for Lady Matsumi, she went on ahead with the vanguard to the city where we will be staying starting today. I believe she was just as bored with the slow journey as you are, Lord Fuagar. She's such a free spirit. I'm jealous. You'd better not both disappear on me at the same time Shuukin said out of exasperation, earning him a shrug from Fuaga. Then. Behold these roaring biceps, thick. Ugh. As Gay Fuku approached to give them a closer look at his muscles, something suddenly sprouted from his arm. Upon closer inspection, it appeared to be an arrow. If Gay Fuku hadn't raised his arm just then, the arrow would have flown straight at Fuaga. They instantly grabbed their weapons, looking around the area. Weren't you supposed to be watching out? We were, over a broad area. We used your effective range as a guideline. Which means they're shooting from outside it. Must be someone skilled. 
Firing such an accurate shot from beyond the scope of their marching procession was no small feat. Gay Fuku. You okay? Fuaga asked. Th this is nothing. If I was able to serve as your shield, I could ask for nothing more Gay Fuku said, tearing the arrow from his arm with a grunt of pain. The wound was shallower than they had thought, causing Fuaga to smile a little. Yeah, you saved me. It could be poisoned. Get to a medic immediately. Surely the enemy must still be aiming for you Gay Fuku protested. Don't worry about it. You prevented their surprise attack. And without the element of surprise. Whoosh. Smack. Another arrow flew in, only to be deflected by Fuagar's Zanganto. That's how it's gonna go. If I know the arrow's coming, then cutting it down's easy. And that shot just told me roughly where they are. Shuukin, the soldiers who noticed the assassin are starting to make a fuss. Get them to calm down. Don't tell me you're planning to go after the sniper yourself. It's too dangerous. Shuukin warned him, but Fuaga was having none of it. The enemy's a good distance away. Without Durga's speed, it'll be hard to catch them. But that doesn't mean, besides, I'm going to make them pay for hurting one of my men. Personally. With ferocity in his eyes, Fuaga drove Durga onwards. Having lost the will to argue anymore after seeing those eyes, Shuukin could do nothing to stop him from going. Then. Once Durga had leapt into the sky, Fuagar placed a hand on the flying tiger's back and said, I know you can sense the enemy, partner. Lead me to them, would you? Quirk. Durga roared and they picked up speed. As they did, Fuagar spotted a figure on top of a distant hill, in the middle of a thick copse of dead trees. This discovery was quite exciting to him. If someone could take a shot at him from that far away, the world still had surprises left to throw. Then another arrow came flying. Whoosh. Ah. Because he was closer now, the arrow arrived quicker, and Fuagar twisted out of its way rather than try to cut it down. The closer he got, the faster they would be coming. Despite the increasing danger, Fuagar still smiled. I like this. It's tense. Haven't felt this pumped up in a long time. He soon closed the distance to his enemy. Neither of them would miss at this range. Fuagar jumped from Durga's back and spread his wings to glide, taking aim at his enemy in the treetops. The enemy was doing the same. They got the shot off before him. Its aim was true hurtling straight towards the center of his face. Goo. Fuagar instinctively twisted his head to the side, but couldn't get completely out of the way, and it struck the gap between his helmet and cheek. The arrow must have been magically enhanced, he felt it tear through his cheek's flesh inside the helmet. But despite feeling his own blood splatter inside the helmet, his eyes never left the enemy. Twang. Fuagar loosed an arrow from his own great bow. It flew straight, impaling the sniper through the chest. They fell head first, like a puppet with its strings cut. At that moment, either of them could have fallen. The deciding factor had to be where they'd aimed. The sniper, confident in his own abilities, had aimed for the head, certain he would make the kill. Meanwhile, Fuagar knew that even if he messed up the shot, he could still win if he closed the gap, and so had aimed for the center of mass. Ugh. TCH. Fuagar tore the arrow from his helmet as he touched down on the ground. Having escaped the threat to his life, and with the adrenaline from slaying a powerful foe fading, the gouge in his cheek started to throb with pain. Fuagar took off his helmet and walked over to the sniper. He'd been a young man, no more than twenty years old. 
The arrow Fuagar fired had taken him in the heart. H.M. This guy's. Fuagar had a feeling he knew the man, but couldn't remember from where. Not long after, Shuukin and the Thamesbok riders caught up with him. Lord Fuagar, are you all right? Shuukin asked, sounding concerned. I'm fine he replied with a wave. I took a minor wound, that's all. You're bleeding. Please, don't be so reckless. I'll be more careful next time. We've got more important stuff to talk about now. Fuagar wiped away the blood running down his cheek, indicating to the sniper with his chin. This was the sniper. I think I've seen him somewhere before. Ha. Huh. But this is. You know him. You should too. This man is Goshima. Lady Matsumi's younger brother. What? Fuagar's eyes bulged as he looked at Gosh's corpse. He'd seen Gosh at the awards ceremony, but had only had eyes for Matsumi, and so he hadn't remembered him. My brother-in-law tried to kill me, and I struck him down. Gosh had been a simple warrior. This couldn't have been something he'd decided to do on his own. Someone must have directed him to make an attempt on Fuagar's life. The image of a man flashed through his mind. It was the face of the man who was the father of his darling wife, and who had always seemed suspicious somehow. This is what happens the moment I start moving towards my ambition, ha. Huh? His grip on Zangento tightening, Fuagar looked up to the sky. At some point, solitary raindrops had begun to fall. I guess, I'm gonna have to tell Matsumi about this. Fuagar thought before walking back to Durga, a feeling of hesitation gripping his heart. It was a silent night. Matsumi sat at the window of a dimly lit room, idly staring outside. The earlier rain had let up, and a round white moon had shown its face through a gap in the clouds. I wonder what kind of face I must be making right now. Matsumi thought to herself. She had certainly been shocked when she heard about the death of her brother Gosh, and that Fuagar had been the one to kill him. Yet, despite this, she was not as torn up about it as she'd expected to be. That confused her. From the moment she decided to join Fuagar on his road to dominance, she had known this was a possibility. She'd sensed her scheming father might try something. Perhaps that was the reason. It wasn't that she didn't feel sadness and anger, but that at some point she had resigned herself to this happening. She didn't want to see herself in the mirror now. Because, probably, her face wasn't that of an elder sister mourning the loss of her younger brother. As she stared vacantly out the window, there came a knock at her door. It was Fuaga. Can I come in? Normally, he would have strode in without asking, but this time he did. Taking note of the consideration he was showing her, Matsumi smiled a little. Yes, please do, darling. Yeah. I will. Fuagar closed the door behind him and walked over to Matsumi. Sorry he continued, for shutting you up in your room like this. Have I been shut up in here? Really? Matsumi cocked her head to the side a little. There are no guards. And the door wasn't locked. It's just a temporary measure anyway. My retainers all know what you're like. They know you wouldn't do something short-sighted out of anger. But some of the newcomers are worried you might try to avenge your brother. Just try to think of this as us protecting you from them doing anything malicious. Yes. I understand Matsumi said, pressing herself tightly against Fuaga. When she did, his body stiffened a little. Do you think, I would try to avenge Gosh, darling? No, not really, but, I'm ready to accept your anger and grief. I'm ready to get slapped, no, punched for what I did. 
I'll stand here and take it for 10 or 20 hits. If I were to punch your brawny body that many times, I think my hands would come off the worse for it. Matsumi smiled a little, but it was short-lived. I've been thinking. What would I be doing now if you were the one who fell? I doubt I'd be nearly as calm. She stroked the fresh wound on Fuagar's cheek as she continued. If the arrow had been a little closer, I might have lost you. If you had died, I don't think I would have been able to forgive Gosh or my father who no doubt instigated this. I am certain I would have sought revenge. That's pretty intense. I like that about you though. And yet, I cannot even resent you for what you did. When I think about how little my bond to the house of Chima meant to me, I feel a sense of loneliness. Her house had survived in the Union of Eastern Nations with its mess of small to medium-sized states through subterfuge. In their history, they had repeatedly taken advantage of their own parents, siblings, and children. That was partly why Matsumi felt a bit of a disconnect with Matthew, obviously, but also her own siblings. The twins, Yomi and Sami, were close, but the other siblings all had their own areas of expertise, and that left little in common for them to talk about. Matsumi had really cared about her youngest brother, Ishiha, who had been seen as talentless at the time. If he'd been the one killed, she might have bawled her eyes out. Ishiha had left her side to go to Fridenaya, where his gift had been given the chance to blossom. Matsumi's only place now was here with her husband Fuaga, surrounded by the men of Malmkitten's army. I know you just said he instigated it, but, you're sure it was Duke Chima pulling the strings? Fuaga asked and Matsumi nodded. It has to have been. Although the plan feels too sloppy to be one of father's. In light of the haphazard nature of the plan, Matsumi suspected something had gone differently from how Matthew envisioned. Nata and Gosh both had a tendency to overestimate their own strength and ability. He may have struck before my father intended him to. Oh, yeah. I'm a cold woman, aren't I? Calmly analyzing my own brother's death like this. No, I can tell how hurt you are Fuagar said, hugging her from behind. You were betrayed by your own family. There's no way you wouldn't be sad. You're just telling yourself it was inevitable because of the kind of house you were born into. Darling. Yeah, that's right. I'm your darling husband. Your family. TCH, these sorts of lines suit that guy better. Well, whatever, just for today, I'm gonna say them. As your husband, I'll accept all of the sadness and anger you feel towards your family. Matsumi buried her face in Fuagar's chest, clutching his clothes. I, can't forgive my father. Yeah. I can't forgive the way he uses us for the stability of the house, and then throws us aside for the same reason. I, I can't allow him to obstruct your path, darling. Yeah. I want to cry. I never wanted it to come to this. Go ahead and cry. You don't need to hold it all in. Matsumi let out a little sob, and then a much louder wail. Her complex feelings had left her unable to cry, but now she finally did. The tears flowed ceaselessly like a dam had broken. Fuagar seethed with anger as he held the bawling Matsumi. You made her cry, Matthew Chima. You made Matsumi cry. His arms tightened around Matsumi. You made my woman cry. That's gonna cost you. Big. On this day, Fuagar decided that Matthew was his enemy. Meanwhile. Slam. On hearing the report of Gosh's death, Matthew Chima kicked over the chair of the desk in his office. Why? Why did Gosh die? He'd just been told that Gosh had attempted to assassinate Fuagar, which resulted in his death. 
As Matthew threw a fit, his eldest son, Hashim, watched him with an impassive look on his face. Was this not your plan, father? No. When we gathered the kings of the Antifuagar faction for a conference, we talked about a plan to assassinate Fuagar when he was returning from his campaign. We assumed that after eliminating the monsters, he would let his guard down, and it might be possible to slay him. Matthew slammed his hands on the nearby table. But I never proposed anything this sloppy. Ghosh's skills were suited to the task, so I did discuss an assassination plan centered around him. But the idea was rejected because, if we were to fail, it would put Fuagar on high alert. Yet Ghosh carried out the assassination plan Hashim pointed out. And I don't know why. What was Ghosh doing there alone in the first place? Matthew clutched his head. The proposed operation had him leading a unit, or possibly an even larger force, not going in by himself. That would have lowered the risk of Fuagar escaping. And yet Ghosh goes and tries to assassinate him on his own. He released his hands and raised his head up. It's also strange that he stayed there and let himself get killed. When you consider his long range, Fuagar shouldn't have been able to pinpoint Ghosh's location after the first shot. Had he run and hidden when his first attempt failed, he should have been able to get away. Matthew looked utterly baffled. Hashim sighed at him. I can think of only one possibility. Ghosh was acting on his own initiative. What? Of all my siblings, Natta and Ghosh have always been the most confident in their abilities. Overconfident, you might say. And he had been waiting for a chance to put those skills to use and make a name for himself. N no. Matthew's eyes widened with surprise. Hashim nodded. It seems probable that Ghosh heard about the ambush plan from the King of Gabi, who he served. He then thought that, with his skill at archery, he could definitely slay Fuagar. If this was, indeed, Ghosh acting on his own initiative, it would explain why he didn't bring anyone with him. Knowing his personality, he would have thought that a large group increased the risk of him being found, and they would only get in his way. Hashim sighed as Matthew's jaw hung open. And so Hashim continued, the reason he didn't flee after missing his first shot is that he knew he would have several more as Fuagar closed in on his position. He only needed one of them to hit, and so was certain he could kill Fuagar. That is just how highly he overrated his own abilities. That fool. Matthew punched the table again. That damned, overconfident fool. Hashim watched his raging father with cool eyes. You are the one who raised him to be that way, he thought, but he didn't say it out loud. You praised our abilities far more than we deserved in order to raise opinions of us abroad. That was what made Natta and Ghosh arrogant, and they came to look down on those without talent. They were especially harsh to Ishiha and our sisters hated them. Natta and Ghosh had belittled and tormented Ishiha because, at the time, he was believed to be without merit. Their younger sister, Matsumi, stood up for him, but Hashim had been uninterested in their quarrels. Later, when Ishiha developed an unusual talent in the kingdom of Frydenaya, Matthew and the other rulers of the Union had deeply regretted letting go of him. If we consider this most recent outrage, I think it's clear to see who was truly the talentless one, Hashim was thinking as Matthew suddenly looked up, as if realizing something. This is bad. Fuagar's anger will turn towards us and the kingdom of Gabi. We can't afford to sit around. We have to unite the anti-Fuagar faction before he makes his move. Matthew said, hurrying out of the office. With a cold look on his face, Hashim snorted as he watched Matthew go. I cautioned him against acting rashly, but he goes and embarrasses himself like this, 
overconfident in his own abilities. Crossing his arms, Hashim stroked his chin as he thought about it. Still, this Fuagal Han. He managed to escape Ghosh, did he? No matter how excellent a man is, without the love of the heavens, he will fade away all too easily. I suppose this means that he has the makings of a great man, loved by the heavens. In which case, Hashim smirked to himself. Chapter 3 The Wavering Nations The failed attempt on Fuagar's life broke the Union of Eastern Nations. While there had already been signs of it coming, the botched assassination made the anti Fuagar forces move more proactively, resulting in a clear division into two camps. In terms of the number of people, there was nearly no numerical difference between the pro- and anti-Fuagar factions. However, if counted by the number of states, the anti-Fuagar faction had nearly double the number of nations in it. This was because even if an individual supported Fuagar, if the rulers of the state they belonged to were a part of the anti-Fuagar faction, they were forced to be anti-Fuagar as well. In fact, the more pro-Fuagar the people of a state were, the more likely their leaders were to join the anti-Fuagar faction. They hated that their own power base was waning, and it was affecting their ability to govern. All of this meant that the leaders of countries that were confident in the power of their military and nation tended to oppose Fuagar, feeding the growth of the anti-Fuagar faction. The anti-Fuagar faction had three leaders. King Shammar Shan of the Kingdom of Shan, the largest nation in the Union of Eastern Nations, Matthew Chima of the Duchy of Chima, and Bito Gabi of the Kingdom of Gabi. Shammar, in particular, was well aware that his country was the most powerful in the Union of Eastern Nations, and he could not allow a situation where only Fuagar's accomplishments were acknowledged to continue. This was not solely Shammar's own decision but also the will of the people of the Kingdom of Shan. The people of Shan saw themselves as the center of the Union of Eastern Nations. They were not happy to see the Fuagar faction's forces succeeding, and supported King Shama in his opposition to them. Even if Shama had not intended to oppose Fuagar, the people beneath him might have forced him to do so anyway. Duke Chima and King Gabi, on the other hand, were taking proactive measures because of their connection to Goshchima, the man who had attempted to assassinate Fuagar. Matthew was Gosh's father, while Bito was the master Gosh had served. They were both assumed to have been involved in the plot. In regard to that matter, each had released a statement declaring, Gosh acted alone. He was not given any orders to act. This was partially true, as Ghosh had gotten ahead of himself, but now that Fuagar had determined they were his enemies, the truth of the matter was no longer an issue. Once a confrontation with Fuagar was inevitable, Matthew moved proactively, using his web of diplomatic entanglements to grow and unite the anti-Fuagar faction. However, in a surprising turn of events, of all the countries Matthew's children had gone to serve, the only ones that openly joined the Antifuagar faction were the Kingdom of Shama, where his second son Nata served, and the Kingdom of Gabi, where his third son Gosh had served. In the south of the Union of Eastern Nations, near the border with the Kingdom of Frydenia, was a small state known as the Kingdom of Roth. In a castle within the capital city of Roth, King Heinrich Roth stroked his white beard as he held a meeting with King Lombard Rumus the young monarch of the neighboring kingdom of Rumus. Heinrand was of a gentle disposition, while Lombard was young and full of promise for the future. Two girls had joined the kings at the table. Aside from the fact that they tied their hair on opposite sides, the girls were almost identical. Next to Lombard was Yomi. She was an excellent midge, and a literate girl with an abundance of knowledge. To Heinrich's side was Sami. Like her elder sister, she was also an excellent midge and a lover of books, and she also excelled at arithmetic. These twin sisters had been won by Lombard and Heinrich at the awards ceremony. 
The elder of the two, Yomi, had received a proposal from Lombard soon after offering her services to the kingdom of Rumus. While they had yet to be wed, she was his fiancée. King Heinrich, meanwhile, had taken a liking to the younger sister, Sami, and adopted her as his daughter. Today, the four of them were seated around one table, discussing what they would do going forward. But is this really okay? Lombard began. Duke Chima is in the Antifuagar faction, right? Shouldn't we side with him? Absolutely not Yomi and Sami said in unison, causing Heinrich's eyes to widen in surprise. He's your father, isn't he? You aren't conflicted about this. We do feel conflicted. But the answer is still no Yomi and Sami spoke as one, their faces serious. I received a letter from Big Brother Hashim. It said, you don't need to follow father's wishes. And, then, speaking in unison again, they said, join Fuagar's faction if you can, but if not, at least remain neutral. What? Sir Hashim supports Sir Fuagar, then. Lombard said in surprise, but soon shook his head. No, but Sir Hashim is Duke Chima's eldest son. He must be working together with him even now. I can't believe he would tell us to join Sir Fuagar despite that. Could it be that Sir Hashim has some plan in mind? Heinrich asked, but Yomi and Sami shook their heads simultaneously. We don't know. Big Brother Hashim is the most prudent of all us siblings. We can't predict what he's thinking. That's what makes him so frightening. The looks in Yomi and Sami's eyes told Lombard and Heinrich that their brother Hashim was no ordinary character. In light of that knowledge, Heinrich asked, But Sir Fuagar struck down your brother, Gosh. Don't you hate him? Don't worry about our feelings. We weren't that close Yomi and Sami said in unison again. Big Brother Nata and Big Brother Gosh were proud of their strength. They looked down on us for being bookworms. They told me math was a depressing hobby. They were especially harsh on our youngest brother, Ishiha. We didn't want to get involved, so we stayed out of it though. Matsumi was always defending him. I like Matsumi. Sir Ishiha who went to the kingdom of Frydenaya, ha. Huh? Lombard said with a sigh. Word of Ishiha's accomplishments in the kingdom of Frydenaya had made its way back to the Union of Eastern Nations. He had written the Monster Encyclopedia together with the black-robed Prime Minister, distinguishing himself as the foremost expert in the study of monsters. Thanks to Ishiha, they had become more efficient at gathering and using monster parts, which had produced untold wealth for the kingdom. This was all rumors, though, so it could have been somewhat exaggerated. The fact that Ishiha, once known as the only Chima sibling without any talent, had undergone such a drastic transformation must have galled all the elites who had been at the award ceremony that day. It's a shame to have let such a valuable resource get away, Lombard lamented. They say it was King Suma's younger sister who recommended him. We should praise her insight. I suppose she lives up to her other name as the Wise Wolf Princess. When they heard the two kings were talking about that, the sisters puffed up their cheeks. Lord L.O.M., do you regret choosing me? Father would you have preferred to adopt Ishiha? Seeing the girl's anger, Lombard and Heinrich both smiled. Of course not. I couldn't imagine marrying anyone but you, Yomi. Even if I was given the chance to choose again, I am sure you are the one I'd pick Lombard said, throwing his arm around her shoulder. I feel the same, Sami. Having a daughter like you, at my age, is the greatest happiness I've ever known Heinrich said, patting her on the head. Yomi and Sami took on contented looks, like kittens who had just gotten scratched under their chins. 
They all relaxed for a little while before Lombard found his resolve and said, If you can accept it, Yomi, then I would like to side with Sir Fuaga. He is a man of rare caliber. I aspire to be more like him, not as a king, but as a warrior. I'd love to fight alongside him. I accept it. Do as you feel is right, Lord L.O.M. Lombard nodded and said, Thank you. Meanwhile, Heinrich said, I think, I'll remain neutral. We have relations with many states and houses that belong to the Antifuagar faction. I have no intention to oppose him myself, but I cannot attack them. Ha ha ha. I must be getting old. If I were just ten years younger, I might have been able to make a decision like yours, Sir Lombard, as he let out a self-deriding laugh, Sami cupped his hands in her own. I think that's good. I love this side of you, father. Because it's so unlike our real father. Yomi asked teasingly, and Sami laughed. You got it. And so, the kingdom of Roth chose to remain neutral and the kingdom of Rumus sided with Malmkitten. Matthew was intensely disappointed to find that, despite sending his daughters to serve there, he could not secure them as allies. While the number of states in the Antifuagar faction grew, the repeated rejections by his own family made Duke Chima feel a sense of urgency, and he even sent a letter to his youngest, Ishiha. However, Ishiha was not the only child to have gone from the Union of Eastern Nations to the kingdom. Fuagar's younger sister, Yuriga, was also staying there as an international student. And Fuagar had sent her a letter too. The weather had been unstable for the past few days. I was in the governmental affairs office with Lysia and Hakuya when we called the three kids, Tomo, Yuriga, and Ishiha in. Once they arrived, I informed both Yuriga and Ishiha that they had received letters from their homes. First, in Fuagar's letter to Yuriga it said, Duke Chima's third son, Ghosh, came for my life, and I killed him. It was straightened to the point. Further, he also wrote, in the near future, I will raise troops to defeat the kingdom of Gabi and Duchy of Chima which tried to kill me. Things in the Union of Eastern Nations are about to get violent, so don't come home. Talk to Suma and have him protect you from any Antifuagar elements inside the kingdom that might take you as a hostage. Once I had read the letter, I sighed and looked at Yuriga. It's so like Fuagar to only write the facts, and about his concern for your well-being. Normally. You'd expect him to ask you to probe into whether or not I was going to intervene. He'd never write something like that in a letter you were clearly meant to read, Yuriga replied. If you had been planning to act, I intended to send him the message subtly, in a way you wouldn't notice. I'm sure my brother was counting on that when he sent this sort of inoffensive letter. You know, I think I like this girl Lysia said seemingly impressed by Yuriga's forthrightness. They had similar personalities, so she must have felt a certain sympathy for Yuriga. If their positions were reversed, Lysia would likely do the same things. A subtle message. Were you going to send your brother a sack of beans tied at both ends? Ha! Huh. What does that mean? Oh, nothing. Just talking to myself. There is a legend that says before the Battle of Kanagaseki, Nobunaga's little sister Oiki sent him a sack of red beans tied at both ends as a way to subtly inform him that the house of Azai, which she had married into, intended to betray him. Well, in this world, they didn't have the Battle of Ajukizaka, which the sack of red beans was an allusion to, so there was no way she'd get it. Besides, if Yuriga was Oiki in this analogy, then as the people who were holding on to her, we'd eventually be destroyed. Getting back on track, I read the letter from Matthew to Ishiha next. It said, the attempted assassination of Fuagar was Ghosh running off on his own. 
Fuagahas started making moves to use the assassination attempt as a pretext to purge anti-Fuagar elements in the Union of Eastern Nations. That man is finally revealing his hidden ambitions. We will unite the anti-Fuagar faction around the Kingdom of Shan, the largest nation in the Union, and strike down Fuagar's ambitions before they swallow us whole. Our forces now number three times Fuagar's. That was likely an exaggeration, but he had grown the number of allies on his side considerably. It just showed how many rulers felt threatened and offended by Fuagar. And at the end of his letter it said, once Fuagar's ambition has covered the whole of the Union, he will no doubt turn his fangs towards the kingdom of Frydenia. That is just how dangerous of a man he is. When we have wiped the Fuagar faction from the Union, we would like to form a cordial alliance with the Kingdom. Well, basically, he was saying, we'd love it if you'd join us, but please just don't side with Fuagar I guess. I agreed that Fuagar's ambitions wouldn't end with uniting the Union, but still. He wrote this letter to you, didn't he? Isn't he concerned for his son? That's just how father is, Ishiha said with a sigh. Hakuya took both letters. Between both of these and the intel we gathered ourselves, I can more or less see what happened. Most likely, Duke Chima and King Shama were secretly working to bring together the anti-Fuagar faction to assassinate Fuagar. However, Duke Chima's third son, Gosh, was too eager for glory and moved alone in a failed attempt to assassinate Fuagar. Instead, he was killed. Fuagar decided to take revenge on the anti-Fuagar faction, forcing Duke Chima to speed up his plans, you're probably right I agreed. Things were moving faster than I'd anticipated, and it was giving me a headache. This gauche guy had definitely moved the clock forward on this era in a big way. The two letter recipients had no responses. They stood quietly, absorbing the information. Yuriga, Ishiha, Tomo looked at them both, her eyes full of concern. Speaking of headaches, I had to consider how this was going to affect the relationship between these two. Yuriga's brother had killed Ishiha's brother. But that was brought on by Gosh's attempt to assassinate Fuaga, and contrary to my expectations, Ishiha's father Duke Chima was involved. On top of that, the one that Ishiha loved most, his big sister Matsumi, was Fuaga's wife. If she hadn't left him by now, that had to mean Matsumi supported Fuaga. Collectively, the situation was a real mess. With all the crisscrossing familial and hostile relationships, they must have been confused how to act towards one another. For as long as you're in this country, I'll guarantee safety for both of you I said, breaking the tension. They both looked at me in surprise. It's already been decided that Ishiha will be serving here. As for Yuriga, she's been entrusted to us by Fuaga. That's why I want to make your safety our top priority I imparted. With that in mind, I want to hear both of your thoughts. Do you harbor any hostility or resentment towards each other? I, Ishiha was the first to speak. Don't hold this against Fuaga. Gosh never treated me well. When you told me he died, it felt like it had nothing to do with me. If anything, I resent my father more. The way he didn't hesitate to attack the man big sister Matsumi married. It's just horrible. I see. And you, Yuriga. I can't forgive this Gosh or Duke Chima for trying to assassinate my brother she said, crossing her arms and looking away. But I don't feel anything towards Ishiha. My brother made it out fine, and big sister Matsumi who likes Ishiha, is still on my brother's side. If he says he doesn't hold a grudge over my brother killing Gosh, then I'm not going to say anything about it. Though she said it that way, I felt like I detected a hint of stubbornness. Lysia. 
how would you interpret what Yuriga just said? I didn't know how I should act towards Ishiha after hearing my brother killed his. I'm relieved to hear he doesn't hold a grudge, sounds about right. That hit the nail on the head, and Yuriga blushed. H hey. Nice one, Lysia, I thought. You understand her because you're so similar. Thank goodness, Tomo, who had been quietly watching as things played out, started to cry. She must have been worried about her two close friends all this time. I'm so glad she said between sobs, you two don't hate each other, I, I am not going to end up hating you two. Yuriga stammered. Why Yerishiha fretted. We're going to be just fine, so please, don't cry. Yuriga and Ishiha panicked as they tried to console a bawling Tomo. Tomo really had been blessed with such good friends. While I was busy being happy for her as a member of her family, Hakuya said, Now then, sire. What do you want to do about this? What do I want to do? We'll stick to our original policy and not get involved. No, I guess that's not gonna be good enough, huh? However, the assassination plot that was the cause of all this was an act of terrorism, and must be decried. I want to release a statement saying we cannot accept changes to the status quo brought about by terrorism. Is that okay? Won't you be seen as pro Fuaga? Lysia asked, sounding concerned, but I shook my head. We have to do it. Because this incident started with an act of terrorism, whether Duke Chima and his people intended for it to happen or not, we can't justify gauche actions. Whether Fuagar ultimately wins or loses, that remains unchanged. If I were to bend my principles on this out of fear of Fuagar, it would leave a lasting effect on my ability to rule. That's the way it is, Ishiha. Are you okay with that? Ah. Uh. Yes. I can't approve of what Big Brother Ghosh did either. With Ishiha on board, we proceeded as we had discussed. But if, someday, the kingdom of Frydenia is destroyed by Fuaga, I might come to regret this decision. I might think, if only I had banded together with Duke Chima and the rest to put him down. But that was only one of many possibilities. Seen from the past, the future is always a series of coincidences. Seen from the future, the past always looks like it was inevitable. Then what of the present? For that, we just have to trust in our own choices. Chapter 4, A Family Divided The Kingdom of Frydenia released a statement denouncing the attempted assassination. This caused a huge shock in the Union of Eastern Nations. Fuagar's supporters loudly crowed that, the Kingdom of Frydenia has recognized the legitimacy of our claims and further stretched to claim. King Suma is our ally. In response to this, the countries of the Antifuagar faction said, King Suma denounces the attempted assassination, but has not declared his support for either side and, the Kingdom of Frydenia remains neutral. Of these two claims, the Antifuagar factions was closer to the truth. It was a fact that Suma's statement did not directly support either faction. However, the pro Fuagar faction's claims had a greater effect. Between Suma is pro Fuagar, and Suma does not necessarily support Fuagar, if we look at which of these claims is more powerfully worded, it is obviously the former. Even if the interpretation is a stretch, they have stated it definitively, making it easy to reach people. The latter claim, Suma does not necessarily support Fuagar, leave Suma's intentions unclear. This is because they could not say, Suma does not support Fuagar or Suma is anti-Fuagar. The result was something Suma had predicted. He had thought of Machiavelli's words, if you choose to remain neutral, you will fail most of the time firmly drilled into his head, so he had been hesitant to remain neutral when it came to Fuagar. 
that was why he chose a method that indirectly made it appear that he supported Fuaga. Suma was still wary of him though. At the same time, he sent a letter to Julius who, due to the Kingdom of Lastania's alliance with the Nuthung Dragon Knight Kingdom, was forced to remain neutral. It said, if it becomes necessary, our country will shelter you, so flee to the Kingdom of Frydenia with Princess Tia and everyone else. Hakuya the black-robed Prime Minister warned against the dangers of welcoming a former enemy like Julius, but it was strictly a warning. He never thought that Suma would do something that would sadden Roroa the way abandoning Julius and Princess Tia would. Hakuya believed that as long as Julius cared for Princess Tia, he wouldn't get ambitious again, but he needed to raise the complaint so that Suma would always keep the possibility in the back of his head. Releasing a statement denouncing the attempted assassination also caused Duke Chima and the Antifuagar faction's attempts to recruit neutral states to their cause to stagnate. While, ultimately, the Antifuagar faction did grow to three times the size of the Pro-Fuagar faction, they were not able to gather any further allies. The Kingdom of Frydenia's actions were more than enough to disappoint Matthew. Matthew was in Weedon Castle in the Duchy of Chima griping to his eldest son Hashim. King Suma didn't have to do that. If he wasn't going to side with either of us, he should have just stayed quiet. I didn't expect him to denounce us. Calm down, Father Hashim chided the grumbling Matthew. The Kingdom of Frydenia must have been uninterested in intervening in the conflict all along. It's important that we've been able to confirm that King Suma won't send reinforcements to Fuagar and will stay out of this fight. Well, yes, but, Matthew still seemed unconvinced. Of all the children I sent abroad, the only ones to join the Antifuagar faction were Nata in the Kingdom of Shan, and Ghosh who went to the Kingdom of Gabi. The others are all either pro-Fuagar or neutral. What did I even send my children abroad for? Ghosh's rash actions have brought harsh eyes down on the entire house of Chima. However, although the state we sent him to has joined the Fuagar faction, Nike has returned to us Hashim said in an attempt to pacify Matthew. It was true that Matthew's fourth son, the beautiful boy who was a master of the spear, Nike, had been dismissed from the country he had been sent to when they joined the Fuagar faction. They must have been scared to shelter a relative of Ghosh, even if he was a relative of Fuagar's wife Matsumi as well. One powerful warrior returning to us will have no great effect on the larger picture Matthew said, slumping his shoulders and resting both hands on his desk. Our negotiations have grown the number of countries in the Antifuagar faction. However, that doesn't mean that all of their people are now opposed to Fuagar as well. There will be those that go to join the Fuagar supporters, and others who divert supplies to them at all levels of society. Even if we clamp down on it, they'll risk their lives to join him. It's like dealing with zealots. Fuagar is practically the founder of a new religion called Fuagasm. That must be Fuagar Han's potential Hashim said after a pause. Matthew snorted. It's an abomination. The way things are, we cannot use our numbers to strategically encircle him until he runs out of supplies. The longer we take, the more countries will switch sides to join the pro-Fuagar faction. It seems we truly have no choice but to end it all in one decisive battle. Matthew stood up straight and walked towards the door. Fortunately, we have an overwhelming numerical advantage. Now, it's simply a matter of how we invite Fuagar to the field of battle. It would be a nuisance if he were to hole up inside the castle and force us to fight a battle of attrition, he mumbled to himself as he left the office. Hashim let out an exasperated sigh as he watched Matthew go. Then, once his father was gone, a slender and attractive young man entered to take his place. Nike. Brother.
I passed by father mumbling to himself in the hall the fourth son of the house of Chima said to Hashim, resting his spear against his shoulder as he spoke. He seems rather agitated. He is. Goshsova eagerness must have messed up all his plans. And yet, you still plan to follow him when he acts like that? Nike asked, suspicion in his eyes. What do you mean? What I'm saying is that playing along with a gamble like this doesn't suit you. The brother that I know doesn't take losing bets, or even ones with even odds. Hashim shrugged his shoulders at this. Who can say? Aren't you the same way? Hashim replied, staring straight into Nike's eyes. Although, even if you were dismissed by your master, I had expected you to go to Mutsumi instead. You like her more than father, don't you? This time, it was Nike's turn to shrug. Well, yes, but, I had my own reasons for coming. I'm here of my own will, okay? Hashim looked at Nike for a time, but Nike had always been aloof, and Hashim couldn't read his thoughts. It might be more accurate to say that Nike wouldn't allow him to. Hashim gave up. That is fine with me. As I wrote in my letter, so long as you refrain from any rash actions. I understand, brother. I'll be going now Nike responded and left the office. As he walked through the halls of Whedon Castle, Nike sighed. He'd sensed something unsettling about Hashim. Our brother has something in mind, big sister Matsumi. Just as Hashim had said, Matsumi was the only one in the house of Chima that Nike felt any affinity towards. Up until Ishiha was born and branded the talentless one, it had been Nike who'd been the brunt of Nata and Ghosh's bullying. Matsumi was the only one to protect him then. With time, once Nike awakened to his gift for the spear, and his abilities grew, Nata and Ghosh stopped saying anything about him. Instead, they moved on to tormenting Ishiha. That was why Nike had no attachment to the house of Chima. The reason he had returned here at all was because of a request from Matsumi. A secret entreaty that she had kept secret even from her beloved husband Fuaga. Our house really is divided, huh? Matthew and the eight siblings were each acting towards their own ends. Their hearts were so far apart that they each had to make their own decisions. One result of that had been Ghosh's attempt to assassinate Fuaga. Even their youngest brother, Ishiha, had found a place for himself in the kingdom of Frydenia where he was growing in prominence. I'm glad Ishiha went to the kingdom. Matsumi would have been devastated if he'd been caught up in all this. Out of all his brothers and sisters, in a way, Matsumi was the only one who had tried to stay connected to him. Nike wanted to respect those feelings, if nothing else. The Antifuagar states in the east of the Union of Eastern Nations were the first to rise up. The main force that Fuagar was leading to retake the Demon Lord's domain was north of the Union of Eastern Nations. They formed a wedge that separated that main force from Fuagar's base in Malmkitten. Fuagar had left half of his elite soldiers behind to defend his home country. The Antifuagar faction believed that by keeping those elites from rejoining the main force, they would be reducing Fuagar's strength of arms. In addition to this, the operational planner of the Antifuagar faction, Matthew Chima, had closely studied the Elfridenian Amidenian War of 1546. The, then provisional, King of Elfriden, Suma Kajuia, had made a show of attacking the capital city of the Principality, Van. This allowed him to lure the Principality forces led by Sovereign Prince Gaius VIII to a favorable battlefield where he destroyed them. Matthew decided to use these events as a reference. By using Fuagar's homeland of the steppes as bait, he would keep Fuagar from settling in for a siege, and instead settle things with a short, 
decisive battle on favourable ground while they still had the numerical advantage. With Fuagar's supporters spread throughout every country, it was effectively impossible for them to encircle Fuagar's company and cut off their supplies. And the longer they took, the more nations would switch to Fuagar's side. This demanded a swift and decisive victory in battle. In fact, Matthew had already received reports that Fuagar's forces were marching towards Malmkitten. With the Kingdom of Shan at their center, the forces of the Antifuagar faction headed for the grain-producing region, the Sibyl Plains, where they had set up their defensive line. This region was part of the Kingdom of Gabi. It was as if a tiger was heading towards many layers of traps. As the final confrontation with Fuagar drew near, inside Gabi Castle, which looked down over the Sibyl Plains, Matthew was in the room that had been assigned to him, enjoying a drink alone. As he did, his fourth son, Nike, came to visit him. When Nike entered and saw the glass in Matthew's hand, he furrowed his brow. Father! Is this really the time to drink? Now is exactly the time to drink. I've already made every move I can. Now we simply wait to see which side the heavens favor. If all I'm doing is waiting, what better way than with a drink? The calmness in Matthew's voice made Nike feel uneasy, and he subconsciously clenched his fists. Matthew had seemed to suffer from intense mood swings lately, but now he seemed awfully calm. Nike had thought he would be showing more excitement or trepidation before the battle with Fuaga. It didn't feel like he was using alcohol as an escape either. The battle with Fuaga with Matsumi's husband is almost upon us. Doesn't that make you feel anything? Nike asked, his anger bleeding through into his tone slightly. And yet, Matthew didn't bat an eye. I've long since run out of such hesitation Matthew said in a relaxed tone as he looked at his glass of red wine. Look back on the history of our country, of our house. Here in this land where so many nations have been born and then perished, why is it that our petty state has maintained its independence using every means available to it? It was solely to keep our line going. In order to maintain the House of Chima's independence, there were even times when we had to fight against our own family. Only one side needed to survive. Matthew paused taking another sip of his wine before continuing. We fought among ourselves, and after the war, the winners would plead for the losers to be spared. If that was not granted, they were cast aside. We stand on top of many such sacrifices. You and I both. Hearing his father's words, Nike felt as if his feet were giving out from underneath him. I'm intimidated. Me by father. Nike was confident that, in purely martial terms, he had surpassed his father long ago. In fact, if they were to fight here, Nike would surely have won. Matthew wouldn't stand even a remote chance of winning. Yet, in spite of that, and despite Matthew not placing any particularly strong emphasis on his words, Nike was overwhelmed by his speech. And now it's your turn to fight with my sister, you're saying. Nike somehow forced himself to ask. Even he thought he sounded like a petulant child. Matthew laughed scornfully at himself. After Gauche's recklessness, this became inevitable. And it's not your fault that he acted so recklessly, father. In order to spread you all across many countries, as a means of preserving our line, I talked up your gifts too much. Planting the seeds of the arrogance that would destroy him was certainly my own failure. You sound so detached from all this, Nike nearly said. But he didn't. Regardless, Matthew seemed to be cognizant of his words here. Through this conversation with his father, Nike had learned that this was how their house had preserved their bloodline. If we win this battle, then even in the worst scenario, 
the house of Chima will only lose Mutsumi Matthew told the now silent Nike. The kingdom of Rumus, where Yomi is betrothed to the king, is part of the Fuaga faction, but they are far from Fuaga's main force and Malmkitan, so they will focus on defending their own borders. They won't be directly involved in this war. Even Matsumi, provided she doesn't die in battle, might be able to be saved after the war. Knowing Matsumi, I think she'll follow Fuaga to the end, though, that is her decision. If she chooses life, there are still ways to save her. Conversely, if we are defeated here, I am the only one who must die. What? Nike's eyes widened in shock. Matthew, however, still spoke in a relaxed tone. Lay all of the blame on me. If you say that you were only following my orders, I am sure Matsumi will plead for your life. It seems Hashim is well regarded by Fuaga too. I'm sure he'll manage the house of Chima well. Father. What are you saying? Do you not care for your own life? Nike protested, and Matthew smiled a little. I do only as our family has for all this time. At the very least, our line will live on. Once he had said that, Matthew drained the rest of his wine. That man, will drag everything in. He'll destroy all the bonds our house has created, swallowing us whole. If we ever side with him the lives of our entire clan will be in his grasp. As head of the house of Chima, I couldn't bear that. Father, if you think about it, Ishiha leaving for the kingdom may have been divine providence. Now, no matter how chaotic the union of eastern nations becomes, our blood will survive. Divine providence. It's not like you to say that, Father. He was supposed to be more calculating. To plan for every eventuality, doing whatever was necessary to avoid the worst outcome, that was how Matthew, how the House of Chima, was supposed to operate. It was almost as if Matthew had decided that his own death wasn't the worst outcome. No, father. Don't tell me you, Nike started to say, but didn't finish. Matthew chuckled. You may be right. So, Nike my boy. Don't waste your life. I wish you had said that to me sooner, and in a different way, Nike turned to go, unable to face his father any longer. Big sister Matsumi probably understands how you feel better than any of us, father. That's why, I didn't want the two of you to end up opposing each other. I see, I don't need you to tell me not to throw away my life. I will act according to my own will. With that said, Nike took his leave. Alone in the room once more, Matthew poured himself a fresh glass, and slowly sipped away at it. Chapter 5, Battle of the Sibyl Plains, 15th day, 6th month, 1549th year, Continental Calendar, on this day, a force of 7,000 men led by Fuagar entered the Sibyl Plains a grain-producing region inside a valley surrounded by mountains inside the kingdom of Gabi. Overlooking the plains was Gabi Castle, home to their king. Once they passed through the Sibyl Plains, they would enter an area that was a wild mix of pro- and anti-Fuagar groups. There was nowhere for the anti-Fuagar faction to mass their troops, so they desperately wanted to force Fuagar into a final showdown here. On the other hand, Fuagar's forces would be able to join up with the rest of the troops in their home country if they could just get through the plains. That was why a united force of groups from the anti-Fuagar faction, hereafter the united force, arrived first and were waiting for Fuagar when he arrived. The united force had seen what Malmkitten's elite warriors could do during the demon wave and realized they would be defeated in detail if they didn't fight with cohesion. To that end, they didn't indulge in any unnecessary delaying maneuvers along the road, instead concentrating their manpower in the Sibyl Plains where they would confront Fuagar's main force. 
Thuagar and his men knew of the united forces' intentions, but daringly walked into the trap, seeing it as a good opportunity to wipe out all those who opposed them. Without anyone planning it that way, both forces had decided that this was the place for their final showdown. Thuagar's first order was to take Fort Sibyl at the entrance to the Sibyl Plains. We can't take a lot of time. We'll take it quickly with a total offensive. Maumia. Yes, my lord. I am here. Lead the foot soldiers in a charge. Understood. Let's go. Maumia, the giant man with a massive hammer, rode in on his lumbering step yak, and the men chased after him on foot. Once he finished watching them go, Fuagar gave orders to the remaining troops. Shuukin, Gaten. Have your cavalry run around and throw the enemy into disarray. Kaysen, your archers will support the other forces. They can only have so many men holed up in a fort of that size. Crush them quickly. Yes, sir. Now that they had their orders, the commanders moved into action. Shuukin and Gaten's groups circled around the fortress making it look like they were going to attack points that were lightly guarded, forcing the defenders to spread out. Meanwhile, any enemy archers who leaned out to take aim at them were shot down by Kaysen's bowmen. All of this reduced the pressure on Maumir's infantry that were attacking at the front. Now's our chance. Let's go. Maumir held his shield up against the arrows pouring down on him from the fortress as the infantry arrived in front of the main gate. Getting down off his step yak, Maumir wound up with his massive hammer and slammed it into the gate made of thick logs. Ha! Crack! Two of the logs snapped clean in two, creating a gap. I'm not done yet. A second, then a third swing widened the gap. Seeing this, the defending leader decided it was impossible for them to resist any longer. We can't last any longer. Retreat. Retreat. The defenders lowered rope ladders from the walls, scattering in all directions. There had been 500 men in Fort Sable, but that wasn't nearly enough to defend it against an army of 7,000. They had also been told by Duke Chima to abandon the fortress quickly so as to lure Fuagar's forces deeper in. Because of that, the defenders retreated without putting up a proper resistance. Having taken the fortress without significant losses, Fuagar stationed 500 troops and the commander Gaifuku there to defend it. Gaifuku had not fully recovered from the wound he took protecting Fuagar during the attempted assassination. And so, the preliminary battle was won by Fuagar's forces. After reorganizing, Fuagar's force of six to five hundred men headed into the Sibyl Plains. It's hot, Fuagar muttered to himself as he rode on Durga's back, advancing along the road with his troops. I feel like it's only gotten hotter since we entered the plains. That's how these mountain basins are Matsumi, who was riding beside him, said, pointing to the mountains. The hot wind blows down from the mountains. I suppose you wouldn't see much of this sort of terrain on the steppes of Mount Kitten though. It's unfamiliar to me, yeah. The rocky desert was already too hot for my tastes but the humidity here makes it even worse. I almost miss the dry heat of the desert Fuagar grumbled as he loosened his collar. Oh, my Matsumi chuckled. You wouldn't hesitate to face thousands of soldiers, and yet a little heat like this is enough to make you cry. Ha ha ha. Well, I can't change the weather with brute force, after all. Could you two please act a little more aware of the danger we're in? Shuukin rode up alongside the two of them to complain about the way they were bantering in the middle of what would become the site for the final battle. He pointed down the road in the direction their forces were headed. Even from this distance, you can see it. The enemy intends to meet us here. On the road up ahead, 
they could see the banners of the Antifuaga faction. Even just eyeballing it, there had to be between 10 and 15,000 eagerly awaiting Fuaga and his men. If Fuaga's forces made it past Gabi Castle and could join up with the elite troops from his homeland, it would be no easy task to take them down. Once that happened, with the support of the pro-Fuaga states, he would devour the anti-Fuaga countries in the Union of Eastern Nations starting in the East. That was why the United Forces' victory condition was, do not let Fuaga's army get past Gabi Castle. Even if they let Fuaga himself get away, so long as they managed to chase his army back north, it would kill the pro-Fuaga faction's inertia. If the people who were lionizing Fuaga saw him suffer a crippling defeat, it might disillusion them into leaving his side. If that happened, it would be Duke Chima's time to shine. He'd use every diplomatic trick available to dismantle the pro-Fuaga faction. Meanwhile, what the United Force believed the pro-Fuaga faction's victory condition was, get Fuaga past Gabi Castle and back to his home country no matter the cost. They didn't necessarily need to eliminate the United Force here in this battle. If Fuaga could just break through the United Force's encirclement, he would be able to win in the long term. They believed that, as the smaller force, Fuaga's army would head straight for their victory condition and recklessly attempt an attack through their center. That is why, of the 14,000 troops, including Zemish mercenaries, the United Force had scraped together, 6,000 were placed in the center to block the exit to the Sibyl Plains, while the rest were divided into 4,000 on each flank in order to surround Fuaga. It was clear to see that they meant to stop Fuaga's forces from attacking down the middle, then pick him apart from the sides. If both factions followed established tactics, that's no doubt how it would have played out. However, Fuaga would never fight using established tactics. He hated it when people tried to place him into a box. The United Force had misread his intentions. With a swing of his arm, Fuaga gave the orders. Position a thousand men on our right and left flanks. We'll have them hit the enemy's left and right opposition. Shuukin and Gaten will take the right, while Maumir and Kaysen will command the left. Established tactics said the smaller force needed to keep its fighting strength concentrated. However, Fuaga chose a formation that seemed to challenge the anti-Fuaga faction head-on. Have they gone mad? King Shama Shan said in astonishment as Fuaga's army got into formation in the distance. He'd been watching from the United Forces' main camp. Because the Kingdom of Shan had provided the largest portion of the United Forces' fighting strength, Shama was their commander-in-chief. They mean to fight us head-on when they have only half our number. Does that just show how confident they are in their own strength? King Gabi, who had become vice-commander, cocked his head to the side. No, their army is a mixed force Shama spat. Fuaga's own men can't account for even 2,000 of their number. The rest have to be mercenaries, volunteers, and refugees. It's an insult that they think they can face us head-on like that. Calm yourself, King Shan. And you too, King Gabi Duke Chima, who had been standing by their side, tried to mollify them. Matthew had been staying close to Shama as an advisor in the United Force. He pointed to the flanks of Fuaga's army. From what I can see, Fuaga separated off a thousand men to each flank but that leaves more than 4,000 in the center. Our own center has 6,000 troops. He likely means to use the 2,000 on the flanks to prevent us encircling him, then break through the center where the difference in our strength is not so great. I see. So the armies on his flanks are sacrifices, then King Gabi replied and Matthew nodded. It's a heartless plan, but an effective one. I surmise. 
They only need their main force to get past us, after all. And there is no shortage of fanatics who would throw their lives away for Fuaga, ha. Huh? Hum. His army was always incredible at charging through the enemy, after all Shammar said, recalling how the soldiers of Malmkitten had repeatedly torn apart hordes of monsters during the demon wave. If the united force faced that head-on, they would no doubt take considerable losses on their own side. After some time stroking his goatee, Shammar finally came to a decision. Very well. We'll call back a thousand men from each flank in order to strengthen our center. No matter what else happens, we cannot allow Fuagar to get past us. I believe that would be a good idea. Matthew nodded in agreement. And with that, the formation of each army had been decided. Courage. Yeah. Finally, Fuagar's army collided with the united force. The planners on the United Forces side thought that, as the smaller force, Fuagar's army would focus their power in the center and attempt a breakthrough. They had strengthened their own center, anticipating the 4,500 troops in the center of Fuagar's army would desperately charge the 8,000 in theirs. However, contrary to their expectations, the 4,500 troops in the center of Fuagar's army advanced slower than the two flanks, and actually stopped short of the United Forces own. Then, following established tactics, they began their attack at range with arrows and magic. Not a single unit charged the United Forces center. Instead, there was a shootout as the United Force returned fire. As they watched from the United Forces' main camp, Shammar and Matthew grew suspicious. What is going on? Shammar asked. Are they not planning to attempt to attack through the center? They've come to a total stop. Although that is what established tactics would dictate, they can't be sane, challenging us head-on with inferior numbers. Matthew nodded. I agree. Malmkitten's strength lies in the mobility and penetrative strength they have as a people of the steppes. I remember quite well just how fearsome their charges were during the demon wave. That's why we did more than enough to prepare for it, as he said that, Matthew looked towards the anti-air repeating bold thrower. They had carried it down from Gabby Castle and installed it here in preparation for a charge by Fuagar's army. If one considered Fuagar's reckless courage, it was entirely possible he would rush in alone on Durga's back, so this was a measure against that. Yet, despite their careful preparation, there was no charge from Fuagar's army, leaving Matthew and the others disappointed. It would seem Fuagar hasn't focused his strength in the center, Shama said, pointing to the left side of the battlefield. That was where 1,000 of Fuagar's men were fighting 3,000 of the United Forces. Despite being outnumbered 3 to 1, Fuagar's army had the United Force on the back foot. Squinting a little harder, they could see something jumping around like fleas on the battlefield. It was Malmkitten's leaping cavalry. If we can see so many leaping cavalry, that thousand must be Fuagar's most powerful force. And, while it's too far for us to see from here, they must have stopped our attack on the right side as well. The thousand on Fuagar's left flank must be elite warriors too. That means Fuagar placed his strongest forces on the flanks, then, Shama nodded in agreement with Matthew, stroking his goatee. Was his goal not to break through the center, then? Does he mean to defeat our flanks and surround us on three sides? Or perhaps he means to crush one of the armies on our flanks, then attack from the side? The side attack seems most likely, but, if he was doing that, he would have concentrated his strength on one flank. That is what I would do. A successful encirclement or a side attack would depend on how quickly you can defeat your opponent. I agree. If he takes too long, reinforcements will arrive from the center. 
Fine, send a message to the units in the rear of the center. Shama ordered his subordinates to take 1,000 men from the center to each of the flanks because of the protracted shootout. Now that they knew Fuagar's elites were to their flanks, there was no longer any reason to make their own center unnecessarily thick. Matthew stroked his chin as he watched. It could be that Fuagar's aim is to attack our flanks today in order to thin out the center. Then, tomorrow or later, once we are predisposed to believe that the majority of his strength is in his flanks, he'll place his elites in the center, and attempt a rapid breakthrough. Hmm. In that case, we need simply be cautious in our troop deployments, the same as today. The biggest headache will be if he has some other plan in mind Shama said, looking to the castle behind them. Gabi Castle has hardly any defenders now. Fuaga left 500 men at Fort Sibyl near the entrance to the plains, right? What would you think of a plan to secretly move that 500 to take our castle? If they'll come to Gabi Castle, that makes things easier Matthew said with a wry smile. In fact, we should let all of Fuagar's army in. What? I have told the defenders to set fire to their provisions if the castle seems likely to fall. This is enemy territory for Fuagar. If he attempts to settle in for a siege here without resupply or reinforcement, how long can he last? We, on the other hand, will continue to receive supplies so long as we hold the southeast exit to the Sibyl Plains. I see. That would make it easier if we gave them the castle, yes Shama agreed heartily, slapping the sword at his waist. Matthew smiled wryly. Well, given Fuagar's wild nature and his nose for danger, I doubt he would fall for such a ploy. I think it's best that we try to make him drop his guard and attempt an assault through the center. Then it's a battle of endurance today. What a headache. The two of them watched as the battle bogged down to a stalemate. In the southwest corner of the battlefield which Shama and Matthew had been watching, Fuagar's commanders Shuukin and Gaten were going wild with their leaping cavalry. In comparison to the wise and brave Shuukin, Gaten was callow and attention-seeking, but could show resourcefulness in a tight spot, and was a good commander capable of thinking flexibly. ha -ha. As his leaping Thamesbok touched down, Gaten cracked his twin iron whips, wrapping one around a man's neck and breaking it, while the tip of the other pierced through another man's throat. His versatile fighting style and the whooshing sounds of his whips terrified the soldiers around him. What's this? None of you dare approach me. But you opposed Lord Fuaga. And I was so looking forward to seeing what brave generals the United Force had to. Despite his taunting, the soldiers of the United Force were too scared to get within range of Gaten's whips. Honestly. You people aren't even worth my time. Moving on. Once he had confirmed no one was going to be coming at him, Gaten started busily looking around the area. A short distance away he saw Shuukin lop the arms off a mounted soldier and impale the man's throat. Gaten rushed over to his side. It's irritating, having to stay in one place while fighting. Wouldn't you agree, Sir Shuukin, right hand of our lord? Gaten. There's no time for idle chatter on the battlefield Shuukin said without so much as looking at him. Gaten shrugged. I don't see why not. We're having an easy enough time. If, instead of this mixed force of 500 horsemen and 500 leaping cavalry, we could call Maumir or Kaysen over here from the north side and get together a group of a thousand leaping cavalry. We could break through these pitiful soldiers with ease. Our orders were to delay them, Shuukin said as he swung his blade down on an enemy soldier who approached him. I'm sure Lord Fuagar has something he's thinking of. We just have to trust in our lord, and put our martial prowess to work. Or am I wrong? No, 
You're not wrong, Gaten said as he swung his whip. Crack. It traced a low arc, sending three enemy infantrymen flying at once. Then, catching the tip of his whip as it returned, Gaten chuckled. For me, it's been surprising to see our lord starting to give us such precise orders. He's always been better at just charging in and crushing his enemies. He must have realized that wasn't enough on its own, wouldn't you say? Lord. Fuagahan has his eyes set on something beyond this sort of internal conflict, a more distant conquest. As he said that, Shuukin looked up to a sky that was yellow with all the dust that had been kicked up. How far would Fuagar climb from here? It didn't matter where he was going. It didn't matter how far it was. They wanted to follow him. They wanted to chase after Fuagar's dream together. That was what all Fuagar's followers wished for. Suddenly, Gaten's Thamesbok leaped. As it did, the tall grass where Gaten had been was instantly mowed down to less than half its former height. If he had still been there on the ground, Gaten would have lost his feet along with the bottom half of his Thamesbok. Hey! Nice dodge. A big man carrying a huge axe walked towards them with heavy steps. I'd expect no less from one of Fuagar's commanders. You're well trained. Surprised, Shuukin asked, who goes there? Natachima, commander for the kingdom of Shan the man with the big axe introduced himself. He was the second son of the house of Chima. Although he was younger than Hashim, the eldest son, his stern expression made him look older than Hashim who was in his mid-twenties. Lifting his axe, Nata seemed to be sizing up the two of them as he spoke. From the lackluster fight going on in the center, it seemed like Fuagar wasn't around. I was hoping I could fight him if I came to this side, but, he's not here, huh? We have no reason to tell you that. Gaten shouted as he drove his Thamesbok into a big jump. Then, swinging both whips, he tried to pierce Natta's neck from both sides. However, Natta dropped his axe to the ground, catching both whips in his hands. What? Gaten cried out in surprise. Natta smirked. An interesting trick. But I saw it coming. Natta pulled on the ends of the whips he was holding, twisting his body around like he was doing a hammer throw. Gaten was sent flying along with his Thamesbok, but let go of his whips in midair, and used the reins to pull off a landing somehow. Ugh. Damn your idiot strength. Gaten struggled for a response to the incredible power that had thrown both him and his mount. Then. As Natta hefted his axe and was about to go finish off Gaten once and for all. Ha! Ugh! Shuukin charged straight at him, catching Natta by surprise. Shuukin's sword aimed to mow through his torso, but Natta caught it with the handle of his axe. Clang! The sound of metal striking metal echoed. Goo! Don't get in my way! Whoa! With a powerful swing of his axe, Natta sent Shuukin flying several meters, Thamesbok and all. Shuukin recovered in midair, and landed his Thamesbok. As he did, Gaten rushed over to him, having picked his whips back up. He's got one hell of a throw. Yeah. Maumir's probably the only one on our side who could match him in pure strength. That's trouble. Let's work together and finish him off quickly. I'll make an opening, hold on, Gaten Shuukin said, holding out his sword to stop Gaten from rushing off again. Our mission is to keep the fighting at a stalemate here. We have no time to deal with this savage. Let's leave him be and head to the next place. But, oh, come on. You're running away. You're supposed to be Fuagar's men. Natta tried to provoke them, but Shuukin didn't pay it any mind. I've seen your strength. Yes, 
You're far stronger than any ordinary man, but, you're still no match for our lord. What'd you say? Nata grunted. Shuukin could sense his anger. Even if this man were to stand before Fuaga, their lord would not see him as anywhere near the threat that King Suma was. Nata's strength was the simple sort, reliant only on his martial prowess. Let's go, Gaten. Right. The two of them left Nata and rushed off to find the next place where their allies were struggling. What? Damn it. Left behind, Nata ground his teeth, slamming his giant axe into the ground in frustration. It dug a trench rut in a corner of the battlefield. Meanwhile, at the same time. Don't push too hard. Move the line up slowly and steadily. In the center army, Hashim, the eldest son of the house of Chima, was carefully commanding his troops. As he did, the fourth son, Nike, came over to him. Big brother Hashim. Big brother Nata seems to have rushed off to the left side of the battlefield on his own. Let him go. The only cure for stupidity is death. Nike didn't rebut his elder brother's words. On this first day of fighting, they all kept their intentions hidden. Nothing was concluded, and both armies withdrew to their camps with the setting sun. That night, once the fighting of their first day on the Sibyl Plains was finished, Shama, King of Shan, invited his commanders to the main camp for a war council. Among them were his advisor, Duke Matthew, as well as King Gabby. We've taken heavy damage to both of our flanks Shama said, pointing to the sides of the united force on the map spread out across the table the commanders were standing around. Fuagal had most of his strengths in the flanks, as we suspected. We were able to repel their attacks with the reinforcements we sent, but we took considerable losses in the meantime. HMPH. How irritating spat King Gabby. But we must have cut down Fuagar's main fighting force in return. If you look at the number of casualties, our forces indeed had the worst of it. However, we hold a geographical advantage here Matthew said in a calm tone of voice. This is the kingdom of Gabi. We can pull our wounded back and give them time to recover, filling the vacancies with fresh troops. Fuagar's army, on the other hand, cannot contact their homeland so long as the southwest exit to the Sibyl Plains remains sealed. They cannot rest their men or replace them with new ones. Home. You're right. The enemy can't get reinforcements said Shama. Yes. Matthew nodded in agreement. And those troops that report directly to Fuagar are currently the core of his army. If we whittle them down, he cannot replace them immediately. If battles like today's continue, Fuagar's army will die the death of a thousand cuts. Yeah, the assembled commanders cheered at Matthew's analysis. Gratified now that he understood his side held the upper hand. Shama plopped himself down on a camp stool and crossed his thick arms. I understand our advantage, but then why is Fuagar fighting the way that he is? This is a battle of attrition. Indeed. I cannot understand why Fuagar's outnumbered army would choose to fight like this. When one of the commanders shared that same opinion, Matthew brought a hand to his chin and got a pensive look on his face. I have been questioning that myself. If we try to explain their actions logically, it would be to convince us that Fuagar will place his best forces in the flanks again today so that we also focus our forces there from the beginning. Then he would instead place his main force in the center, and rapidly break through ours, home. In that case, we need to simply continue fighting as we did today Shama concluded. You're quite right Matthew nodded. If we keep constantly aware of where Fuagar's main force is and position an appropriate number of troops in response, we should have no problem. But, but what? Shama asked, 
responding to Matthew's uncertain tone. Matthew seemed to hesitate for a moment, but found his resolve and answered, It's just, this isn't Fuagar's preferred style of fighting. Fuagar was not this tactical. If an enemy rose up before him, no matter who it was or how great the threat, he would keep pushing forward. And that stance was shared by his army. Matthew questioned whether Fuagar would really adopt this sort of thoughtful troop deployment. With the refugees lifting him up as some sort of great man, and a grand army assembling beneath him, perhaps he's changed. How impertinent Shammer said dismissively. Yes, that could be it, Matthew nodded. Whatever the case, if Fuagar wants to join us in a battle of attrition, we could ask for nothing better. I just ask that you all remain cautious. The commanders all nodded in agreement. 16th day, 6th month, 1549th year, continental calendar, as the battle entered its second day. The moves they made were exactly the same as on the first. Fuagar's army positioned their strongest fighters on the flanks, and the united force sent reinforcements to their own flanks, bringing the fighting to a stalemate. However, unlike the united force which could afford to change out their side units, Fuagar's forces were still exhausted from the previous day's fighting and found themselves a little pressured. As for the center, they were engaged in a shooting match like the day before, and there were no intense clashes there on this day either. TCH Fuagar watched from his main camp with a sour look on his face. He sat on a camp stool, stomping his feet repeatedly. It had left a clear imprint of his foot in the ground. Matsumi, who was beside him, let out a sigh. Why don't you calm down a little, darling? Acting irritated here won't do anything to bring us victory. I know. I know that, but, it hurts, staying here in the main camp while everyone else is out there fighting. Matsumi sighed once more and shrugged her shoulders. That is what it means to be commander-in-chief. Sitting put like this doesn't suit me. Going wild with all our strength, racing around and seizing victory with our own hands, that's how we've always fought before now. But you know they'll take your head in no time if you do that, right? Matsumi's chiding left Fuagar speechless. If you are going to seize hegemony on this continent, you need to change your simplistic way of fighting. The Grand Chaos Empire is massive, and Uriga's letters warned you not to take the Kingdom of Frydenai lightly either didn't they? If you are going to face those nations on equal terms, your army needs to evolve even more. I know. That's why I'm staying put now, isn't it? Fuagar responded, sounding unamused. Matsumi smiled at the sour look on his face. I believe that Sir Suma would trust his followers to handle things at a time like this, you know. Yeah, I'll bet he would. Suma understood that he had no martial prowess or gift for commanding troops, so he would trust his subordinates to handle things at times like this. Because he was the type that preferred not to be on the front lines, he could sit in the main camp without getting agitated like Fuagar. Because he could imagine it so easily, Fuagar stopped stamping his feet. Believe in my people and wait. It pisses me off that he can do that and I can't. He he. That's right. Let's trust in the people who are chasing your dream with you. With that said, Matsumi walked around behind Fuagar and rested her hands on his shoulders. Chapter 6, Turning Point of History, Sibyl Plains, Night After the Second Day of Battle the battle remained at a stalemate throughout the second day, and after a meeting with the other commanders, Matthew was visited by his eldest son, Hashim. Father. Hashim. What is it? I wanted to hear your opinion on the way Fuagar's forces fight. Home. You find it odd too, then. 
Matthew asked, crossing his arms. They went along with our battle of attrition, just like on the first day. Fuagar wasn't the type to fight like this. I can't understand why. Does he have a plan of some sort? Either he's gained the capacity to command a large army, or his men have inflated his ego to the point where he believes he is acting strategically, if it's the latter, that would make our lives easier. Whatever the case, it's unsettling not being able to read our opponent. Especially when Fuagar hasn't shown himself on the field of battle, that is worrying, yes. Then why don't we try giving him a kick in the butt? Hashim suggested as Matthew was pondering. Matthew looked up. Do you have an idea? Our scouts report that the fortress near the southwest entrance to the plains is now defended by 500 of Fuagar's men. We will raid it stealthily so that his main force doesn't notice. With the fort taken, his retreat will be blocked. Once we light a fire under his behind, Fuagar will be left with two choices, retreat or try to force his way through. I see. We prepare thoroughly and wait, then if he attempts a breakthrough, we pincer him with the troops from Fort Sibyl, and if he retreats we simply launch a pursuit. Matthew ran some quick mental calculations and decided the plan would work. This battle closely resembled the Battle of Nagashino from Suma's Old World where, before the final battle at Shitaragahara, a unit led by Seikai Tadatsugu took Tobiga swimmer from the Takeda. The loss of the fortress threatened the Takeda's retreat, and they lost many important vassals as they withdrew. It was the decisive cause of their defeat. Hashim's plan had parallels to this. Having gotten a positive response, Hashim continued his explanation, we will send 500 of our own men, and borrow a thousand familiar with the local terrain from King Gabi. If they travel through the mountains from Gabi Castle, they won't be discovered. Home. But you realize I can't leave the main camp while we're dealing with Fuagar, yes? Of course. That is why I will lead this raid. I will take Nata and Nike with me as well. You stay with King Shama, father. When will you carry it out? This very night. I have already made the proposal to King Gabi, and he was in favor. He, you move fast. Matthew laughed. Hashim lowered his eyes and laughed too. I am your son, after all. Godspeed, then. Don't mess this up. Yes. You too, father. With that said, Hashim turned around and left the main camp. Matthew watched his son go in silence. Seventeenth day, sixth month, 1549th year, continental calendar, on the third morning after fighting began on the Sibyl Plains. Matthew received a report saying a combined Chimagabi force of 1,500 men had retaken Fort Sibyl. Hashim's done it then, has he? Matthew let out a sigh, moved by his son's success. The report said that very few of the 500 soldiers there escaped, but those that did likely rushed to Fuagar to report that Fort Sibyl had fallen. If Fuagar sent soldiers to retake Fort Sibyl, the united force would launch an all-out offensive against his weakened main force. Surely they could overrun him with sheer numbers then. Matthew stayed at Commander-in-Chief Shammer's side throughout the night, watching Fuagar's forces closely. And yet, dawn came without any movement. Do they mean to do nothing even after losing Fort Sibyl? Shammer crossed his arms, groaning. They can't move Matthew replied. Because if they do, we'll push into them. Home. Regardless, we've set a fire under them now. The fall of Fort Sibyl has completely severed Fuagar's supply lines. If they fight the way they did yesterday, we need only wait until their provisions dry up. Or rather, if we press them even sooner, some of Fuagar's devotees will flee. 
his army will collapse upon seeing the legend stripped from him. Indeed. That is why we must end this today. Matthew looked at the quiet camps of Fuagar's forces. He has two options available to him. Fuagar can attempt to break through the united force to reach Malmkitten, or retreat to the north to reorganize. Although, should he choose the latter, he faces a pincer motion from us and the soldiers at Fort Sable. He. No matter how powerful his men are, they'll be exposing their vulnerable backs as they retreat. Our men will slaughter them. Shammah had the hungry eyes of a warrior. Matthew nodded. Yes. That is why I expect our enemy to choose the breakthrough option, where there is still some hope of victory. But when I recall the illogical way his forces fought yesterday and the day before, I have to consider that he may not make the straightforward decision. It makes no difference. If they come at us, we surround and crush them. If they flee, we chase down and devour them. Our advantage will be unchanged. It's simple and easy to understand. Yes, I suppose it is, in contrast to Shammah's optimistic grin, Matthew felt a subtle ominous unease taking root in his heart. This was because despite Fort Sable supposedly having fallen, Fuagar's camp was too quiet. What are you thinking, Fuagar? He thought. He glared at Fuagar's army but he could find no answer. In order to prepare for an attempted breakthrough, the united force hardened their defenses, not sending their flanks forward like yesterday. If the enemy were going to recklessly charge in, there was no need to encircle them, and thereby thin their own center. If the united force kept their defenses hard to absorb the charge, they would be free to strike from the side or behind after that. Bring it on, Fuagar, the united force seemed to say as they waited eagerly. However, as for what Fuagar's forces chose to do. I bear a message. Fuagar's forces have begun to retreat, the messenger rushed into the united force's main camp to report. Shammah's eyes bulged after hearing the message, and he kicked aside his camp stool as he rose to his feet. Looking out, the message was true. Fuagar's forces were hastily retreating along the road to the northwest. Are they mad? Even if they retreat here, do they think they can recover up north? Perhaps they do, Matthew said, furrowing his brow. If their only goal is to get Fuagar away from this battlefield, there is some logic in fleeing northwest where we have fewer troops. But at the same time, it means making his men pay a heavy price in casualties. What do you want to do? There's no question Shama responded, drawing his sword and pointing it towards Fuagar's army. We pursue. Fuagar may escape, but we must strike down as many of those who follow him as we can. This is the decisive battle, men. Here we eliminate any chance of Fuagar's recovery. Yeah. The soldiers of the united force cheered in response to Shammah's speech. The horns were sounded to signal an advance, and the united force moved to chase Fuagar's forces. As Shammah mounted his horse to join the march, he told an approaching Matthew, you're ill-suited to violence. I leave defending the main camp to you. Yes. Godspeed to you Matthew said placing his hands together in front of him. Shama nodded before riding off. Matthew gazed at the battlefield as he watched him go. The important thing is that the Chima blood and name live on. So, don't waste your lives in vain. Normally during a retreat, an army leaves rearguards behind it. The troops chosen for a rearguard are elites, and they must be led by a loyal commander. The longer the rearguard holds off the enemy's pursuit, the higher the chance of their lord, and by extension the rest of their allies, surviving. In short, the rearguard is expected to be completely annihilated. 
That should tell you just how amazing it was that Kinoshita Tukishira led the rearguard in the retreat from the Battle of Kanagasaki, yet still returned alive. And yet, the odd thing is, Fuaga's forces had no rearguard. Despite the fierce pursuit of the united force, the rear units of Fuaga's army appeared to be fleeing in disarray. Pwa. Tch. Fuaga. As he cut down fleeing soldiers, Shama shouted, I misjudged you, Fuagal Han. What is this disgrace? You leave your men and flee. How are you supposed to be the great man of the Union of Eastern Nations? How are you humanity's hope? For Shama, who had anticipated a stirring battle, this one-sided massacre irritated him. Looking past the common soldiers he was venting his frustrations on, Shama saw Fuagar's forces were already passing by the foot of Fort Sibyl. The vanguard was much faster than the disorderly rabble at the rear. Fuagar's army must have placed their best fighters at the lead during the retreat. If so, Fuagar may get away, he thought. Assuming Fuagar had his best men at the front, their ability to break through would be considerable. The plan had called for the men who took Fort Sibyl to seal the exit to the plains, but it was difficult to delay the enemy, and they might be able to break through. Then let me bury as many of the fools who followed Fuagar here as I can. Without his followers, Fuagar will be a man with his arms and legs torn off. Swinging powerfully as he sliced through enemy soldiers, Shama glared ahead of him. Meanwhile, at the other end of that glare, Fuagar clenched his fists as he rode on the back of Durga the Flying Tiger. Gritting his teeth as he heard the faint dying screams of his own men behind him on the wind, his shoulders trembled. Darling, Matsumi, who was riding along with him, said with a voice full of compassion. Fuagar opened his clenched fist and held the open hand out towards her. I know, Matsumi. Fuagar put his hand on Durga's back. I can't stop anymore. Or turn back. Only race in the direction Durga is facing. Darling. No, Lord Fuagar. I will follow you wherever you go. And so, Fuagar and his people escaped from the Sibyl Plains. It happened as the united force pursued Fuagar's army past the foot of Fort Sibyl. This is strange. Shama thought, sensing something was off. Why are all of the fallen here enemy soldiers? Most of the soldiers lying along the road were Fuagar's men. Normally, a lack of one's own dead comrades would be a thing to welcome, but they were taking far too few casualties. The plan had called for a combined force of 1500 from the House of Chima and Kingdom of Gabi to block Fuagar's retreat. These forces, which were to collide directly with Fuagar's vanguard, should have taken considerable losses. And yet, there were no corpses from that combined force along the road. Did they abandon the attempt to block Fuagar's forces out of fear? They'll have to be called to account for that later. As Shama was pondering, suddenly his own pursuing forces came to a stop. Why? Why have you stopped? You'll let Fuagar escape. A messenger ran over to him and said, I bear a message. Fuagar's army has come to a stop outside the Sibyl Plains. What? Shama exclaimed. In response, the messenger relayed even more startling information, furthermore, Fuagar's army has split to the sides, revealing his cavalry were marching in formation in the center. At the head of them is a massive tiger. Fuagar Han. It's his main force of 2000 then. Why turn around here? Wasn't their goal to let Fuagar and his most powerful warriors escape? As Shama was wondering that, he noticed the terrain around them. This was the valley leading into the Sibyl Plains. It was a narrow road surrounded on both sides by mountains, drawing the 13,000 men of the united force out in a long line. No, it can't be. 
have we been lured in? Just as Shama correctly appraised the threat, and was about to order his troops to halt, a messenger rushed up to him from behind, out of breath. I, I bear a message. The forces of the Kingdom of Gabi and the Duchy of Chima in Fort Sibyl, what? What about them? Shama demanded. Th they appear to have turned on us. They're sealing the entrance to the Sibyl Plains. Shama was dumbstruck by the messenger's words. His troops were stretched out along the narrow valley. Now their retreat was cut off, and Fuagar's forces had turned to face them. I see it now. You were aiming for this all along, Fuagar. We had assumed you meant to join up with the rest of your forces, but from the very beginning, you intended to settle things here. Fuagar stood at the front of his army, glaring at the united force. Finally. Finally, I can let loose. Yes. Things have worked out just as Big Brother Hashim said they would Matsumi, who stood at his side, agreed. Her face was the picture of calm, but her arms trembled a little as she held the reins. For Fuaga, this was a once-in-a-lifetime chance. For her, however, this situation was incontrovertible proof that her elder brother Hashim had betrayed their father Matthew. Although she would never say so, that must have shaken her up badly. But she was doing her best to hide it. That being the case, Fuagar chose to pretend not to notice out of consideration towards her. Fuagar pointed Zangunto towards the united force. I've made you endure a lot. But that ends now. They've formed a neat little line, waiting for us to cut them all down. Come on, men. Cut them down, leave them to bleed, and race onward. What you see there is the road to our time. Yeah. The men who had been forced to endure let out a cry that vented all their frustrations up until this point. It was a roar that seemed to shake the earth itself. Then, holding Zangunto ready, Fuagar gave the order. Courage. Archers, loose your arrows. Bito, king of Gabi, gave the order and the famed longbowmen of Gabi rained magic-enhanced arrows on the rear of the Antifuagar faction's united force. W.H. Watt. An attack from the rear. Gah. The sudden rain of arrows from behind knocked the soldiers of the united force from confidence in their assured victory to feverish confusion. Some tried to flee in the opposite direction of the arrows in their bewilderment but for some reason the troops ahead of them had stopped advancing, resulting in congestion. They couldn't run away. Damn you, King Gabby. You traitorous wretch. The soldiers that learned of the betrayal were enraged, and men were sent to deal with those infuriating longbowmen. However, they were blocked by infantry from the Kingdom of Gabby, the Duchy of Chima and the 500 men from Fuagar's army who had been holding the fort. With heavy infantry sealing the tight passage, the soldiers of the united force could not break through, and all the while a rain of arrows had them dropping like flies. In the middle of the infantry desperately trying to hold back the united force. Ha! Huh. Only the section led by Nata was blowing away the onrushing soldiers like they were nothing. Resting the large axe he had been swinging around on his shoulder, Nata clicked his tongue in irritation. TCH. I took this side because my bro said I should, but all I'm getting to fight here are small fry. Nata, who had been in the service of the Kingdom of Shan, had ended up betraying his father Matthew and his liege Shama due to Hashim's persuasion. Originally, he had been looking forward to his battle with Fuagar who was seen as the most powerful in the Union, more than anything. Hashim had told him, even if you stay with the Kingdom of Shan, you will only ever face enemies from inside the Union of Eastern Nations. Perhaps you would enjoy a once-in-a-lifetime battle with Fuagar under Sir Shammar's command. But don't you want to fight the warriors from outside this country? 
don't you want to fight countries larger than any nation in the Union? Then, Hashim extended the invitation, Nata, come to Sir Fuagar's side with me. His ambition is too great for the Union to contain. He'll show you battles the likes of which you've never seen. The irresistible allure of those words brought Nata into Fuagar's camp. However, as things stood, he was currently insatiable. As if to vent his frustration, with a swing of his large axe, Nata bellowed, You had best not bore me, brother. Or I'll tear into you and Fuagar too. In a place somewhat more removed from the front line, the remaining Chima sons, Hashim and Nike, watched him. He's like a wild beast Hashim said of his brother. High maintenance, but, just as easy to manipulate. Brother. I see you really do take after our father Nike said with a harshness in his eyes, but Hashim smiled faintly. Heh. I'll take that as a compliment. There was no sarcasm in his tone. Even as he parted ways with his father, he was not entirely unhappy to be compared to him. Big brother Nata is simple, so I can understand him, but, how did you convince King Gabby? Nike asked, shaking his head. It was easy. The reason King Gabby is at the center of the Antifuagar faction now is that people believe he masterminded the failed assassination. Hashim let out a throaty chuckle. He thought that, with the suspicion of being the one behind Ghosh's attack hanging over him, even if he joined the pro-Fuagar faction, he would never be forgiven. I revealed to him I had ties to Sir Fuagar, and told him that if he were to betray the united force and distinguish himself in battle, he would not be held responsible for the failed assassination. Once I showed him a written promise to that effect from Sir Fuagar, it was easy to push him into going along with it. It all came together just like that. What would you have done if he hadn't agreed? If persuasion wasn't an option, I would simply have worked with Fuagar's forces to eliminate him during the attack on Fort Sable. It would have been a bit more of a hassle, but that's for another time. Right. Nike felt newfound fear at how easily Hashim could say such incredible things. I thought the commands seemed out of character for Fuaga. So this was all your planning then, brother. In order to wipe away all the anti fuaga elements in the Union with this one battle, I needed events to play out like this. The test was whether or not Fuaga could control himself until now, and, as I had expected, he is fit to rule. Even as his own comrades were sacrificed, he endured and did as I had advised him. He is deserving of every ounce of wisdom I can support him with. The sparkle in Hashim's eyes told Nike all he needed to know. Nata wasn't the only one who had been waiting for the moment he'd take flight. Hashim, too had been looking to cast aside the tiny birdcage of the Union in favor of a place his talents could be put to use, and a master who would use them. Hashim stared at Nike. But not everything went as planned. I was sure that, even if your pro Fuagam master cast you out, you would go to Matsumi's side. Nike stared straight back at Hashim. You can't count on everyone to move as you expect brother. I'm a flesh and blood human. I'll act according to my own will. Now then, Nike shouldered his spear. So long, brother, I'll be taking my leave. When he heard that, without any change in expression, Hashim placed his hand on the hilt of the sword at his waist. I appreciate your cooperation in the plan. However, if you mean to go save father at this late stage, could you cut me down, brother? Nike asked, glaring at Hashim. If you were to simply compare their martial abilities, Nike had the upper hand, but Hashim was an above average warrior in his own right, and depending on how he applied his skills, he might still come out on top. The air grew tense for a moment but Nike waved his hand to show he had no hostile intent. 
Don't worry. I'm not planning on going to father. Actually, I get the feeling he wouldn't want me to. Based on their conversation the other day, Matthew seemed to have accepted the current situation. If Nike went to save him, he'd only get angry and drive him away, he was sure of it. I'll escape by following the swamp to the southwest. I have, some objectives of my own I want to accomplish. Ah. If you tell Fuagar's soldiers the fourth son of the House of Chima is on their side, and they should let me go, that'd be a big help. I see, Hashim removed his hand from the hilt of his sword. That is unfortunate. I had hoped you would join me in supporting Sir Fuagar. If possible, I'd ask you to avoid becoming his enemy in the future. It would sadden Matsumi, I'm sure. I have no desire to become Big Sister Matsumi's enemy, not that I have any desire to work with Big Brother Hashim or Big Brother Nata either. Nike felt like he and Hashim were incompatible. It might be similar to the way he'd felt about his father Matthew. Still keeping those feelings hidden, Nike lowered his head. Well then, brother. I'll pray for your success. Yeah. And I'll pray for your safety. And with that, Nike left the battlefield without turning back. Meanwhile, Shama had found Fuagar on Durga's back in front of the United Force, crushing soldiers under the flying tiger's paws. Dismounting, he shouted, I take it that you are Fuagar Han. I challenge you to a duel. Hearing him, Fuagar's advance slowed. Then he turned to Shuukin and Kaysen who were with him and said, Shuukin. Kaysen. You lead the cavalry to keep on crushing the united force. I'll take care of this guy. Ha. Huh. Lord Fuaga. Kaysen was confused. Lord Fuaga. If you simply ignore him, someone else will strike him down. Shuukin said with a harsh look in his eyes but Fuagar had a fierce smile on his face. Their commander-in-chief chose to get down off his horse and face me rather than run away. It wouldn't be right to just let any ordinary soldier be the one to slay him. I'll strike him down myself and seal our victory. But, go. That's an order. Ah. Yes, sir. Let's go, Kaysen. Ha. You're sure? Kaysen sounded surprised. There's no reasoning with him when he gets like that Shuukin explained, his face warping into a grimace. We don't have the time right now. If we dilly-dally, the ringleaders of the Antifuagar faction might escape. You understood? Follow us, men. The duo led a mixed cavalry unit of horse and Thamesbok riders to strike the overstretched ranks of the united force from the ends, crush them underfoot, and reap their lives. Shuukin cut down a fleeing soldier, while another who held his ground, hoping to land at least one blow before he fell, took an arrow through the throat from Kaysen and collapsed. It was like an avalanche, wiping everything away. The united force fell into a state of panic, unable to advance or retreat, many of them being trampled by their own comrades. In the middle of all this, as victory was more or less certain, Fuagar approached Shama and leapt down from Durga's back. Shama, King of Shan. It would be a shame to trample such determination under Durga's paws. I'll take your head myself. Then come for it, you whelp. Fuagar and Shama's battle began. Initially, Fuagar was entirely on the defensive. Clang. 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 Fuagar used Zangunto to repeatedly block Shama's pounding blows. It feels good and weighty. Truly the sword of a man with a kingdom on his shoulders. What nonsense. Do you have nearly the determination I do, Fuagar Han? Of course. With that, Fuagar's Zangunto flashed, slicing Shama's raised right arm off below the elbow. 
Seeing the shocked look on Shama's face, Thuagar told him, I'm prepared to carry that weight and more. You are, are you? Shama's calm expression made it hard to believe he had lost his right arm and a considerable amount of blood as he sat down on the spot. To think a man like you would be born in these lands. These lands where there are too many nations, all of them medium-sized or smaller, none able to stand head and shoulders above the rest, Shama looked up at Fuagar, laughing at his own expense. What do you think? Of me? Was I a foe who made you struggle? Yeah. It wasn't a small number of my men who died to pay for this victory. Hearing Fuagar's words, Shama smiled despite the pain in his right arm. He he he. If I blocked your path even a little, I could ask for no more. Oh, yeah. So long. You were the first great wall in my way. With that, a flash of Zanganto parted Shama's head from his body. His face showed not a hint of fear as he died. He left for the next world without anguish or regret. Fuagar closed his eyes and offered just a moment of silence, then raised his voice to declare, I, Fuagar Han, have slain the enemy commander, Shama Shan. The death of Shama caused even greater chaos among the anti Fuagar force who, unable to advance or retreat, lost many men to another charge by Fuagar's cavalry. Even if they escaped the charge, the recovered infantry came in for revenge, adding to the pile of corpses. And so, at the same time as Fuagar's forces had fully dominated the united force, Shuukin and Kaysen were rushing down the highway across the Sibyl Plains. Their goal was the united force's main camp. Now that King Gabi had turned traitor, it was safe to assume Gabi Castle was already in Fuagar's hands. All that remained was to take the lightly guarded main camp, and capture the remaining mastermind, Matthew Chima, thereby ending the war. Kaysen. You lead the cavalry and run down the fleeing members of the united force. I'll lead a unit to take the enemy's main camp. Understood. Be careful, Sir Shuukin. Right. You too. Each wishing the other success in battle, the duo parted. When Shuukin left the pursuit to charge into the enemy's main camp, he found it strangely deserted. This is odd. Have the defenders already fled? Walking past the Chevaux de Frise, Shuukin and his men cautiously advanced deeper into the main camp. There they found a single man inside the curtains where the former commander in chief, Shama, had once been. Your, Duke Chima. Shuukin asked, recognizing him, and Matthew crossed his arms and lowered his head. Indeed I am. I assume you must be a commander of some renown. I am Lord Fuagar's subordinate, Shuukin Tan. A close associate of Fuagar's, then. That's good. Matthew's cool expression made Shuukin suspicious. What do you mean by that? Oh, nothing. I just wanted to have a little talk before I take responsibility for my actions as a commander of the defeated army. And if it was the common soldiers who charged in here, I'm sure they would have beheaded me before I could say another word. Those words, before I take responsibility. Shuukin realized Matthew was prepared to die. As a warrior, he could mercilessly cut down men who opposed him, or those who turned their backs and fled. However, when he encountered someone who had accepted death, it was in his nature as a warrior to want to pay his respects. Shuukin dismounted and stood before Matthew, who smiled wryly at Shuukin's forthrightness. So. What is it you wanted to talk about? Have a seat first, Matthew gestured towards the camp stools. Shuukin took a seat, and Matthew sat across from him. You're the only one in the main camp now, Duke Chima. Shuukin asked and Matthew nodded. Yes. When they saw the main force broken, 
the defenders fell over themselves in their hurry to flee. But this is King Gabi's domain. Now that he has sided with Fuaga, I cannot imagine they'll get far, and that's why you haven't fled. Because it would be pointless. Shuukin asked and Matthew chuckled a little in response. I need to take responsibility as the one who started this war. Besides, I had something to leave with you. I prepared it while I was waiting for you to arrive. Something to leave with me. At that, Matthew produced two letters from his pocket. One is to Fuagar's wife, Matsumi. The other is to Hashim, who has joined you. You're welcome to check the contents, but, well, they're a will of sorts. A will. And you want it given to Hashim too. After he stabbed you in the back. It was Hashim who had been corresponding with Fuagar and had caused Matthew's strategy to fail. Shuukin, who had assumed Matthew would resent him for that, found this request suspicious. You think I would resent him? Ha ha ha. Matthew laughed at the idea. Why would I? He demonstrated more than enough talent in this war. There's no question he's fit to take over the house of Chima. Then, his expression relaxing, Matthew continued. Here in this land, where so many powers rise and fall, there are times when a small nation must do questionable things in order to survive. What Hashim did here is what our family has always done all this time, and what I myself have done too. He truly has inherited my blood. His eyes showed no indecision, he fully believed his words. I cannot understand, Shuukin replied. Of course not. You're not a member of our house, after all. Having said that, Matthew asked Shuukin, by the way, what became of Nata and Nike who took part in the battle? I believe Sir Nata joined our side along with Sir Hashim. Sir Nike cooperated with Sir Hashim for some time, but I've received reports that he's since withdrawn from the battlefield. Hmm. If we started a war of this scale, and I am the only Chima who needs to lose his life for it, then that is an excellent result. He spoke as if his own life meant nothing. It showed just how long his family had been doing arithmetic with their own lives deciding who would live and who would die. Still, Shuukin couldn't stop himself from asking, Duke Chima. Have you no mind to surrender? It's not too late. You are Lady Matsumi's father. That makes you Lord Fuagar's father-in-law. I am sure even my lord must respect your ability to have gathered so many against him, I cannot Matthew refused firmly. If I were to shamelessly cling to life, it would weaken Matsumi's position and lessen Hashim's value as a man who abandoned even his own father to join Sir Fuaga. That is the one thing that I, as head of the House of Chima, cannot do. With that, Matthew rose from his seat and handed the two letters to Shuukin. I am satisfied. Hashim has grown to the point where he can carry the House of Chima and I was able to face a great man in a grand battle at the very end. It's a shame I couldn't win, but I have no regrets. Duke Chima, Matthew turned his back to Shuukin, and sat down on the ground. Now, take my head back with you. I'm counting on you to deliver those letters. I swear it will be done. Shuukin rose and drew his sword. He lifted it up high then swung down. The conniving Matthew Chima. A man who suffered ignominy, giving everything to preserve his house and bloodline, died a death far more noble than the life he'd lived. One battle had ended. The valley leading into the Sibyl Plains was littered with the corpses of the United Forces soldiers, and the river ran red with their blood. The survivors fled in all directions, or surrendered and became prisoners. It was safe to assume that 80% of the Antifuagar faction inside the Union of Eastern Nations were wiped out on this day. 
as Fuagal's forces were cleaning up after the battle in the middle of the Sibyl Plains, three individuals came to his tent in the main camp and bowed down in front of him. They were the ones who had switched sides in the middle of the battle, King Gabi, Hashim Chima, and Nata Chima. Shuukin and Matsumi stood on either side of Fuaga. Well done, I guess I should say Fuaga said, looking down at them from the camp stool he was sitting on. Will you swear loyalty to me now? Yes, sir. King Gabi said, bowing so low his forehead nearly scraped the dirt. While Gosh acted alone, it is my fault that I was unable to keep one of my people under control. I also went down the wrong path and joined the Antifuaga faction. Yet you accepted me, my lord, even though I once opposed you. In order to repay this debt of gratitude, I intend to work myself to the bone on your behalf. We feel the same as King Gabi Hashim said, bowing his head. Fuagar rose from his camp stool, taking his Zangunto from Shuukin, and laying the blade against the side of Hashim's neck. The look in Fuagar's eyes made King Gabi break into a cold sweat. You have my thanks for what you did, but I have no love for those who stab others in the back Fuagar said as he looked down at Hashim. The cold blade touched Hashim's neck. If Fuagar pulled it just a little, the sharp Zangunto would slice through his flesh, and a crimson shower would burst forth. A long silence passed between them. It was so quiet that the racing hearts of all those who were watching this tense scene unfold sounded noisy. Once the painful silence passed, Fuagar withdrew his blade from Hashim's neck, then, sitting once more, he struck Zangunto's pummel on the ground. It is not to happen again. I want all three of you to remember that. Yes, sir. The three bowed their heads in unison. Fuagar continued, Hashim, stay. The other two, leave. The rest of you are dismissed. Nata and Gabi took their leave at his command. Once they had left the tent, a short time passed, and then Fuagar handed his Zangunto back to Shuukin before putting his hands on his knees. Was that good, Hashim? Yes, sir. An admirable performance Hashim said, raising his head with a nonchalant expression on his face. Fuagar smiled wryly when he saw it. You were on our side all along. In fact, we were following a plan you dreamed up. I never thought I'd have to call you a traitor. As Fuagar said, despite remaining with Matthew and the United Force, Hashim had been leaking information to Fuagar. He had also been the one to suggest using a fake retreat to draw their enemies into the narrow valley where they could eradicate them with a counter-attack. This war could largely be considered Hashim's strategic victory. Hashim smiled. The rest of the commanders will hear about the look in your eyes when you told me never to betray you again from King Gabi. That will give them the impression that while you are generous enough to take in your former enemies, you are also frighteningly merciless to those who oppose you. Though Hashim could not have known this, what he was saying was remarkably similar to Chapter 18 of Suma's favorite book, The Prince which said, it is necessary for a prince to understand how to avail himself of the beast and the man. The law is to be used with men, and force with beasts. This is because in the real world a ruler must at times confront men who will abandon their beliefs like wild beasts, and at those times the ruler must not hesitate to use force to make them submit as beasts do. The lesson is that a ruler must have two faces. Hashim continued, also, if we create the impression that I was the leader of those who switched sides to join you, then every time you recognize one of my accomplishments, you will look like a big man who is not prejudiced against people because of their backgrounds. Most of the soldiers captured in this battle were just following orders. If they see me being treated well, they will feel safe joining you. I see, at the same time. If anyone hopes to conspire against you in future, 
they will attempt to win me to their side first. When they do, their plans will be exposed, and we can deal with the rebellion before it even begins. Ha ha ha. Wonderful. Fuagar slapped his knee as he cackled. I've always wanted a man like you, someone who's always thinking two steps ahead. My followers are all strong, but they are only a step or two removed from barbarians who think you can solve any problem with fighting. Only Shuukin, Matsumi, and Kaysen would be of any use at political dealing. Although, with Kaysen's young age, no one would follow him. Surely you don't need to belittle your own followers, Shuukin chastised him with a sigh. It's the truth. When I think about what's to come, I know we'll need to gather people with different abilities that we don't have, and put them to work. Luckily, there's someone who's given us an example of how to do that. Fuagar spoke with Suma in mind. He was confident he would never lose to Suma in martial prowess or charisma, but when it came to knowledge and the ability to use people, Fuagar had to acknowledge he was no match. That's a good way of thinking. Hashim nodded. To that end, we must take control of the Union of Eastern Nations swiftly, and find the talent hidden there. In particular, our lack of bureaucrats to handle domestic affairs could prove deadly. If we mean to expand our territory, we will need to gather enough administrators to manage all of it. Knowing that's the truth just makes it more painful to hear, Fuagar shrugged his shoulders in exasperation. But of course. I plan to bring in more people and expand. You'll lead them, Hashim. In your eyes, though, is King Gabi someone we can use? Hashim smiled slightly. My brother Nata fights like a wild beast, and that is all he has in his head, so he is easy to manipulate. King Gabi, however, is the sort of person who puts his own self-preservation before the benefit of the group as a whole. There is a high risk he will turn again, so we cannot give him any important task. I knew he was untrustworthy. Then, what do you think we should do with him? From here on, you will no doubt work to mop up any remaining anti-Fuagar elements, Lord Fuagar. There will eventually be a difficult battle, and when there is, he should be placed on the front lines with orders to keep our losses to a minimum. Then, afterwards, we can hold him responsible for his poor performance. His bowmen are powerful, so let's place them under your direct command when that is done. There was a coldness in Hashim's eyes, and the look on the honest Shuukin's face made it clear he didn't like it. Fuaga, however, laughed raucously. Well. It looks like I'm going to need guys who can make suggestions like that from now on. You'll help me, of course, won't you? That has been my intention all along. Please, keep marching on through the light of day, Lord Fuaga. Hashim's words showed his determination to be the one who would handle all of the work in the shadows. As he looked at Hashim, Fuagar asked something that had been bothering him. Tell me one last thing. Did you not feel hesitant to betray Duke Chima, Matthew Chima? That question made Matsumi, who had been quiet all this time, shudder a little. She must have had her own thoughts about her brother who had betrayed their father in order to join them. Here, for the first time, Hashim's eyes grew harsh. He looked straight at Fuaga, almost as though he were glaring at him. No one, not even you, Lord Fuaga, could possibly understand what we had between us as father and son. Oh. It was father himself who raised me into the kind of commander who could make a decision like this. You are a great man, known throughout the world, and I determined that you would be able to put my talents, talents which were wasted here in the cage that is the Union of Eastern Nations, to use. Were my father younger, and not as constrained by his position, no doubt he would have taken the same path I have. 
I am sure that my father understood my actions, just as I understood him. Fuaga was overwhelmed for a moment, but soon let out a sigh. You really were father and son. Shuukin. Yes, sir. Shuukin walked before Hashim and dropped to one knee, producing a letter from his pocket which he offered to him. I am the one who cut down Sir Matthew. I was there for his final moments. I see, this is the letter that Sir Matthew asked me to deliver to you. There was another, that one addressed to Madame Matsumi. When Hashim accepted the letter, Shuukin bowed his head and then returned to his original position. Matsumi pulled out her own letter so that Hashim could see it. In mine he apologized for opposing Lord Fuaga, worsening my position, and said that he was satisfied with his life. He also wrote that I shouldn't resent you. It seems, he understood you just as well as you said. Matsumi lowered her eyes in sadness. Hashim closed his. After some time, Fuaga spoke, I looked through his letter to you. You should read it. Yes, sir. If that is what you wish. Hashim opened the letter, looked through it, then. Ha! His eyes went wide. Unlike in Matsumi's letter, there was not one word of apology, not one request for forgiveness, let alone a word of grievance. It only said how things were to be handled after his death. Included were a list of names and the countries those people were presently attached to. As Hashim processed everything, he held the paper so tight that it crumpled. It was a list of all the human resources that Matthew could think of. When the main unit of the United Force was destroyed, Matthew had spent all the time he had left before death came for him writing out the names of people they could hire to support Fuagar's domination. There was not one unnecessary word there. However, that showed that Matthew recognized Hashim's abilities, and went to the afterlife knowing the family was in good hands. What happened, to my father's remains? They've been carefully preserved, and no one will touch them. Matsumi will hold a funeral for him later. I see, Hashim hung his head, not looking up for some time. Tears streaked down Matsumi's cheeks as she looked at him, almost as if she were crying because he could not. Seeing the tears on her cheeks, Fuagar thought, you made her cry twice. You damned fool, as he thought of the late Matthew Chima. Chapter 7, Groundwork in the Battle of the Sibyl Plains The anti-Fuagar faction was greatly weakened by the loss of the majority of its fighting force, as well as the central figures. Shamashan and Matthew Chima. The Antifuagar states were destroyed one after another by Fuagar, the states that supported him, and even rebellions by the Fuagar supporters among their own citizens. As this unfolded, there were those like Hashim Chima, who led an army and distinguished himself in battle, quickly earning his place as Fuagar's advisor, as well as those working hard out of a desperation to prove their loyalty like Bito Gabi. Among those who swore loyalty to Fuagar after the war, some were cast out for failing to live up to expectations, while others were found to have been plotting against him, and were cut down. There were those who rose during the chaos, those who were destroyed, and those who could only watch it all happen. In the midst of all these conflicting emotions, blood was shed all across the Union of Eastern Nations. Three months after the Battle of the Sibyl Plains, the Union of Eastern Nations was in the process of being reorganized with Fuagar as the sole power. With so many different forces, it had been hard for any one country to stand out in the Union of Eastern Nations before, but a centralization around Fuagar was now underway, that was the report I had just heard from Hakuya in the Governmental Affairs Office in Parnam Castle. He's moving faster than I expected, I said, giving my honest reaction. I was scared of his potential as a great man, and the charisma that pulls people to him as he blindly chases his dream. 
the way he seems so innocent, without any dark side, and only grows larger and larger. Yes, I agree, but on the flip side, because he has no dark side, there is a certain naivety about him. Because of his great generosity, he would even welcome outsiders who couldn't share his dream into the fold. I thought that would eventually cause friction and discord which would pull the rug out from under him. If Fuagal had the kind of charisma that drew everyone to him, and a willingness to accept anyone, then that would include those interested only in preserving themselves, or who secretly harbored hostility towards him. The great men of history often were tripped up by mediocre commanders who could not appreciate their vision, and those who rebelled against them. I thought Fuagar would be the same. But the way that he's treated those who were late to join him isn't like Fuagar. Basically, he's bullied them and driven them out, or framed and killed them. He wasn't the type to do that. At times, a ruler must be prepared to do both good and evil. Sir Fuagar must have found himself someone who can advise him when it is time to be evil Hakuya responded wariness creeping into his voice. His handling of the Antifuagar faction has been logical and cruel. His advisor must be a good one. You mean Hashim Chima from your report? I believe so. The man seems to have inherited much of Duke Chima's aptitude for diplomacy and scheming. That's troublesome. He's the kind of person I least wanted Fuagar to have at his side. I let out a sigh, tapping my temple. I guess I'll need to assume Fuagar has someone close to him who can operate on the same level as you, huh? Hakuya, if you were serving Fuagar, what would your next plan be? More groundwork, of course. With the many members of the neutral faction remaining, we cannot say that he's taken control of the Union of Eastern Nations just yet. The neutrals. Ha. I rose and walked over to stand by the glass door that led out onto the balcony. Knowing Fuaga, he'll try to bring the neutrals to his side. He has the charisma to do it, after all. That would be the fastest way to bring the Union of Eastern Nations together, and would avoid earning him a lot of unnecessary enmity. But that would weaken their internal unity. If he brings in people whose stance is uncertain, it will only serve to harm him in the long run. If you look at things practically, he shouldn't do it. If I were his advisor, I would tell him that. Then I'm sure Hashim will do the same. And we've seen Fuagar has the capacity to listen to advice. We'll see more blood spilled yet. It looks like we can't expect all news to be good news. In this case, the good news was that Roroa had discovered she was pregnant some months ago. Now I'm gonna be a mama too. You keep on treating me right now, darling. I remembered the gleeful but slightly shy look on her face when she told me. I'd usually been abroad when I found out about these things before now, but this time I was in the castle, so we were able to have a big family celebration. Juna was due soon too, so I had been savoring the joys of family. Speaking of family. I looked up at the sky through the glass windows. Last Ania was neutral too. Will Julius and Princess Tia be alright? Meanwhile, in Last Ania, in the royal manor where the royal family lived, the king's agent Julius was sitting beside his wife Princess Tia, who had grown her hair a little longer and across from her parents, the royal couple. He presented two letters to the king. Father, I would like you to take mother and Tia with you on a diplomatic mission. Lord Julius. Tia shouted, gulping at what he had just proposed. However, Julius paid no mind to her, continuing to say, First you will visit Queen Sil of the Nuthung Dragon Knight Kingdom, and deliver this letter. Then I want you to travel to the Kingdom of Frydenia with an escort from the Dragon Knight Kingdom where you will meet King Suma and deliver this letter. With a Dragon Knight escort, 
I am sure you should be able to pass through the Star Dragon Mountain range. You're asking us to leave the country? King Lastania asked, looking Julius in the eye. Julius nodded. Then he opened another letter and showed it to the other three. This is a letter from Fuagar Han. Or an invitation, rather. He is holding a banquet for all the rulers who neither supported nor opposed him. It's meant to get to know us and win our support. But, having said that much, Julius narrowed his eyes. They were so cold that they made Princess Tia jump. It was almost as if he had gone back to being the man he was when he lived in Amidaniya. That is only for public consumption. There's more to it, then. King Lastania asked and Julius nodded. It's the way he treats those who were slow to join him. Punishing them to set an example to others is at odds with how Fuagar always was before now. It's very pragmatic, the sort of thing a man like me would prefer. No. His father Gaius had once told him their royal family had the blood of venomous snakes running in their veins. And a snake knows how a snake thinks. It's likely a plan from that newcomer, Hashim. Which makes it highly likely this banquet is also his idea. If so, won't failing to attend worsen our position? Yes. He will likely see anyone who doesn't attend as having the intent to oppose him, and use that as a pretext to attack. Whether we go or don't, only ruin awaits us. So we run. Julius nodded again. If Fuagar attacks with the full might of the Union of Eastern Nations, then even our alliance with the Nuthung Dragon Knight Kingdom cannot protect us. Even if we could hold them off for a time, the land would be laid to ruin, and the country would no longer be able to support itself. But a king mustn't abandon his people, my greatest worry is that the people will abandon their king. Julius forced the good-natured king of Lastania to look at reality. There are many in our own land who would like to see themselves under the protection of Fuagar. After all the suffering they experienced in the recent demon wave, it's somewhat natural they would look for someone strong to defend their lives and property. For those people, the old royal family will only be in the way. Julius had experienced this once before. When the people of Amidaniya only had Gaius to cling to, they were loyal. However, because of the liberal rule they experienced under Suma's occupation of Van, and the death of Gaius in battle, the people were quick to accept rule by the kingdom. Even when Julius regained power, many of the people supported Roroa, who was closer in temperament to Suma, and they threw Julius out. King Lastania has no counter-argument to these words born from personal experience. Instead, Tia pressed closer to Julius. Just now, you said the three of us should go. Do you mean to stay here, Lord Julius? Seeing the look of concern on her face, Julius gently stroked Tia's hair. I need to buy time so that our escape goes unnoticed. Besides, while I did say that many want to be protected by Fuagar, Jairu Koma and Lauren also love and respect the royal family as well. I need to arrange for their escape. Then I will stay too. Tia, Julius looked her straight in the eye. I'll be fine. I won't miss the right time to escape. In fact, the worry caused by you staying would make it harder for me to focus on my task. Lord Julius, besides, your belly grows larger by the day. Ah. Tia subtly laid a hand on her own stomach. Inside, a new life was growing. A child bearing the blood of the royal families of Lastania and Amidaniya. Julius pulled Tia, who now bore his child, and would soon be a mother, close to him, stroking her hair gently. You understand, right, Tia? What we need to defend most of all? Our child, of course. I won't throw my life away before finding out if it's a girl or a boy. 
Julius looked at the royal couple. So, father, mother, I'm asking you to take care of Tia. Okay. We will do everything as you say, son-in-law. Sir Julius, please stay safe. The next day, the Lastanian royal couple and Princess Tia quietly escaped the country with an escort from the Nuthung Dragon Knight Kingdom. The people were told they were on a diplomatic voyage to improve relations with the Kingdom of Frydenia. A few days before the invitation arrived in Lastania. The word Machiavellianism takes his view that sometimes, when pursuing political ends, you cannot be picky about the means, and extends that to refer to an ends justifies the means philosophy. Such ruthless people are criticized as being Machiavellian. This was primarily used by the Christian Church, with its philanthropic beliefs, to reject Machiavelli's views, and largely a misconception. Whether Machiavelli himself was Machiavellian or not is beside the question. However, Hashim Chima, who came into the service of Fuagar Khan, was most definitely Machiavellian. He proposed that Fuagar invite the lords who had been members of the neutral faction to a banquet in his new base, a castle in the former kingdom of Shama, then massacre them under the guise of a terrorist attack by the anti Fuagar faction. Fuagar, who was sitting on the throne, frowned at this, while his wife, Matsumi, who was standing at his side covered her mouth and gasped. Fuagar glared at Hashim. You're telling me to do that? No I will do it myself, without your knowledge Hashim replied, unfazed. Fuagar rested his cheek on his palm. If you're asking me to turn a blind eye, then that's no different. Is this necessary? If your goals go no further than unifying the Union and expanding into the Demon Lord's domain, then no. However, if you intend to compete with the Grand Chaos Empire and Kingdom of Frydenia for supremacy, it definitely is. There are too many things we lack Hashim explained, his eyes serious. Even if you add up the populations of every country in the Union of Eastern Nations, it is less than half that of the Kingdom of Frydenia. The comparison with the Empire is even worse, with us only having a third, possibly a quarter, of their population. No matter how we expand into the Demon Lord's domain, that is not a thing we can overturn. On top of that, both the Empire and Kingdom are stable, with excellent rulers. If things continue as they are, the gap will only continue to widen. Which is why, you want me to hurry along with the unification? Yes. The only area in which we are definitely ahead of them is that we are in an era where people seek great men such as yourself, and you provide a centralizing force. You don't mince words, Fuagar shrugged. Hashim had spoken the truth. A large part of the reason that Malmkitten, only one country in the Union of Eastern Nations, had been able to expand so much, so quickly was that they were in the right place at the right time. Ever since the Demon Lord's domain expanded, the people of the Union had felt closed in. They saw Fuagar as a leader who could break free from that, and that hope drove them to support him. But, at the same time, that is a precarious thing. Because you have gathered the people's hopes unto yourself, Lord Fuagar, you must always produce results. If you grind to a halt, their disappointment will be the end of you. You will lose the support of your people, and the nation will crumble in no time. So you're saying, if the people lose their fervor, I'm done. Yes. And we can't be sure that this era will go on for years. It could happen any time so hurry up with the unification. Precisely. Brother. Matsumi interjected, unable to simply watch any longer. The neutral faction includes, King Heinrich of Roth and his adopted daughter Sami, right? Hashim asked, finishing her sentence. The calmness of Hashim's response left Matsumi at a loss for words. It still must be done. 
Even if we are to be divided into friend and foe, the blood and family name must live on. That is how father taught us the head of the house of Chima must be. Besides, we'll only kill the king. I won't harm Sami as long as she doesn't resist. Brother, as Lord Fuagar's queen, you should be prioritizing the house of Han, Matsumi. Yes. I understand that. If this was for Fuagar's benefit, Matsumi had to back down. Seeing Matsumi's reaction, Fuaga asked Hashim, This will mean less blood is shed, right? Yes. It will be criticized as a conspiracy for some time. But, if we take the long view of things, this is the method that will have the least sacrifices. People of future generations will understand. Not that I care what some people who aren't even born yet are gonna think. Having made up his mind, Fuagar slapped his knee. Fine. You do what you think is right. By your will. Hashim bowed his head. Matsumi lowered her face in frustration. With Fuagar's permission given, the plan went into motion. Hashim sent those lords who'd remained neutral in the conflict invitations to a banquet where they would have the chance to better understand one another. There were a small number of countries, like the Kingdom of Lastania, which decided not to participate, but many of the leaders of the neutral faction gathered in Shammar Castle. And then, everyone who came was massacred. Antifuagar faction remnants who had infiltrated the gathering carried out a terrorist attack using gunpowder, and it was announced that everyone present had been caught in the blast. The news caused short-lived chaos throughout the Union of Eastern Nations, but it subsided when it was announced that Fuaga, who coincidentally happened to be out of the room at the time of the attack, had survived. Naturally, some voiced their suspicion that this was all a plot by Fuaga. However, they were drowned out by the cheering of his supporters. The Union of Eastern Nations was an agglomeration of many small to medium-sized states. Because of their size, the kings had a lot of influence, and with them gone many countries lacked anyone who could make final decisions. Those sorts of countries joined the Fuagar faction without considering revenge. However, a small number of nations fought back after their king was killed. Such nations fell at the hands of the Fuagar supporters inside them, with one of them being the Kingdom of Roth. King Heinrich had been killed in the plot. The third daughter of the House of Chima, Sami, issued a statement denouncing Fuagar, and closed the gates of their capital. Lombard, King of Rumus, who was a friend of King Heinrich and a supporter of Fuagar led his troops to the gate. The soldiers did not draw their weapons and simply stood in formation. Lombard had not come to attack the city, but to persuade them to open the gates. Madam Sami. We have no desire to fight. Please surrender peacefully. Sami. Please. Open the gate. Yomi called out, desperate to save her twin little sister. With the Union of Eastern Nations having almost entirely fallen into Fuagar's hands, one small nation resisting him would have no future. It was clear that his supporters would raise the entire country. Yomi, look out. Ha! Huh. Lombard grabbed Yomi by the arm, pulling her back. When he did, a mass of ice thudded into the ground right in front of where they had been standing and exploded. The two of them looked up to see Sami atop the walls, her raised hand pointing towards them. The soldiers of the Kingdom of Roth stood with her, bows drawn, keeping the men of the Kingdom of Rumus in check. Sami, that had been a warning shot. If she were serious, Sami had magic that could freeze a wide area. Looking down at them, Sami said, Go home, Yomi. Please, Sami. Listen to us. We have nothing to talk about Sami told her with eyes as cold as ice. My father Hein is gone. 
He treasured me like I was his own daughter, and reminded me of what a warm, loving family is supposed to be like, and then Fuaga Han murdered him. I'm telling you, that was a suicide bomber from the anti Fuaga faction, you know that's a lie, Yomi. This is how Big Brother Hashim operates. Yomi had no response to that as she'd figured it out herself. Lombard stepped forward in her stead. Even if we go home, Sir Fuagar's forces will be here in no time. If that happens, the Kingdom of Roth and all its people will be wiped out. I'm disappointed about what happened to Sir Heinrich too. But now that it has, I don't want to let the ones he loved, you and the people of his country, perish. Please, surrender. I'll defend you and the people even if it costs me my life. Knowing gentle Heinrich, I can't imagine he would have wanted you to seek revenge. Despite that kindness, brother killed him. My own, brother, a large tear rolled down Sami's face. I had a sneaking suspicion that the banquet was his plot. I told father not to go. But, he said he was worried that would draw suspicion, and he couldn't put me or his people in danger, so, he went alone. Sami, Madam Sami, I will never forgive our brother, Hashim Chima. As Sami declared that, the air chilled around them. Its moisture froze and sparkled. She was likely about to use some serious ice magic. Sami raised her hand and pointed towards Yomi and Lombard. Yomi, if you're siding with Hashim, I won't hesitate to, stop it, Sami. So this is how it goes, after all, said a voice. Ha! Huh. Shocked, Sami turned to the direction of the voice. At some point, a man wearing a hood had appeared and was standing behind her. It surprised the men of the Kingdom of Roth and Kingdom of Rumors too. As Sami reflexively attempted to use magic, the man closed in faster than she could, and delivered a body blow. Sami groaned as she was knocked unconscious. The defenders turned their bows towards the hooded man with murderous intent, but he held up a hand to stop them as he slowly drew back his hood. Put your weapons away. I'm Nike Chima. Little brother to big sisters Sami and Yomi. Yomi's eyes widened as she saw him from outside the walls. Nike. What are you doing here? Big Sister Matsumi's orders. She saw this coming, so she had me lie low in the Kingdom of Roth to protect Sami because they were in the neutral faction. With that explained, Nike hefted the unconscious Sami over his shoulder, and turned to the soldiers of the Kingdom of Roth. I will take responsibility for ensuring Big Sister Sami's safety he said. So you open the gate, and surrender to Sir Lombard. There was much chatter among the soldiers. However, after some time. Okay, the men put away their weapons. They had been obeying Sami out of a desire to at least protect the girl who King Heinrich had loved so much. Now that Sami's safety was assured, there was no need to fight. Seeing the soldiers of the Kingdom of Roth calm down, Nike carried Sami through the open gate on his shoulder. As he did, Yomi and Lombard rushed over to him. Nike, Big Sister Yomi. I'll be taking Big Sister Sami with me. You, can't stay in this country any longer. Yomi asked. As long as she stays here, Big Sister Sami will only continue to resent Big Brother Hashim and Sir Fuaga. Brother isn't so soft that he would let that go. He'd kill her eventually. And Big Sister Matsumi asked you to stop that from happening. Yeah. I don't want to lose any more family she said. I see, realizing that things were out of her hands at this point, Yomi backed down. Because even if this ended up being the last time the two of them would ever meet, that was still preferable to Sami being killed. On her behalf, Lombard asked, where will you go, Sir Nike? First, 
I'll leave big sister Sami with Ishihar in the kingdom of Fridenia. If she's there, not even Sir Fuagar or our brother can touch her easily. As for myself, well, I'll figure that out in time. But didn't King Suma support Sir Fuagar? When it came to the assassination, yes, but who knows how he really feels. That's probably why big sister Matsumi specified I should leave Sami with him. Nike loaded Sami onto a horse near the gate. Then, mounting it himself, he said his goodbyes. Farewell, big sister Yomi, Sir Lombard. Take care. You too, Nike. And, tell Sami to stay well for me, would you? Sure. Nike's horse started running, carrying Nike and Sami south. Yomi and Lombard watched them until they were out of sight. The country's finally in order, huh? Fuagar said to his advisor Hashim who stood before him as he sat on his throne in Shan Castle. Hashim had his arms crossed, and his head lowered. Indeed. The anti-Fuagar faction has been wiped away as have the neutrals who were not clear in their intent to join us. There is no one left in the Union of Eastern Nations to oppose you now, Lord Fuagar. But we made Matsumi sad to do it, Fuagar said, resting his elbow on the arm of his throne, and his cheek on the palm of his hand as he stared at Hashim. It was our only choice said Hashim, lowering his head once more. If you are going to rule the continent, the country had to be unified as soon as possible. I am sure Matsumi understands. And besides, Yomi reported that Nike took Sami away unharmed. Yeah. It sounds like Matsumi gave him his marching orders knowing things would turn out this way. I'm sorry for taking matters into my own hands she said to me. Well. We were able to take the Kingdom of Roth without a drop of blood spilled as a result, so I let it slide. Looks like you were outwitted by your own little sister, ha, huh, Hashim. Despite Fuagar's teasing, Hashim simply shrugged. If your wife is a clever woman, and also my younger sister, then surely that is something to be welcomed. However, it does seem that Sami has gone to be with Ishihar in the Kingdom of Fridenia. I can't say I approve of capable people passing into their hands. Hashim didn't seem to think much of it. Fuagar snorted. HMPH Huriga's already there. If Sami still has it out for me, do you think it's possible she'd do something to Yuriga? Should I ask Suma to protect her? It should be fine, I think. Sami's a smart girl. If there's anyone she's going to target for vengeance, it would be me. Hashim seemed unfazed by the fact his own little sister now hated him. Is this the blood of the Chimas, who had survived through subterfuge? Fuagar thought, narrowing his eyes. So, with no enemies left in the country, what now? With the Union of Eastern Nations unified under you, we will announce the creation of a new state. That will show that this is no longer a union of nations, but a unitary state. We will also formally move the center of government here to Castle Shan, which will receive a new name. With that, the largest city in the country will become the capital of a new nation that you will create, Lord Fuagar. Make the capital of the Kingdom of Shan our capital. Is my homeland, Malmkitten, not good enough? Fuagar asked, but Hashim firmly shook his head. No city on the steppes is suited to be the capital of a whole country. If we were to create a new one, and gather people to it, that would be a waste of effort. If we did create a capital in Malmkitten, the steppe folk and your long-serving commanders would be elated, but far more people would look down on you for it. We have a fine city here so we should put it to use. Oh, I see, Fuagar sounded a little disappointed, but he accepted the proposal. Wasuma here to hear this exchange, 
he would have been impressed but also troubled, thinking, so Hashim didn't let him make the same mistake as Zhuangji. Zhuangji, also known as Zhuang Yu, succeeded in destroying the Qin, but rejected his vassal's suggestion to take their capital, Xianyang, with all of its geographical advantages, as his own. To succeed and not return home is like dressing up in fine clothes on the road at night. Who will even know, he said, and moved his capital to Pengcheng. As a result, the populace and important Gu and Zhong fell easily when Liu Bang advanced east. This gave Liu Bang an advantage they couldn't roll back no matter how many victories they won on the battlefield. In regards to the way to govern cities or principalities which lived under their own laws before they were annexed, Machiavelli offers three options. The first is to destroy them utterly, the second is to reside there, and the third is to install a puppet regime to rule them. Hashim's plan was the second of these. Fuagar scratched his cheek, feeling this was all too much trouble. A new name, Ha. Huh? Won't the kingdom of Malmkitten do? It will only create a rift between your old and new followers. Although it is only a matter of appearances, it will look as though you've extinguished the countries that supported you as well. It would be better to have the people of Malmkitten continue to serve you under a new name. If it's too much trouble to think of something, we could simply call it the kingdom of Fuagar Han. If I gave it a self-aggrandizing name like that, Shuukin and the others would laugh at me pretty hard. The soldiers and people have gathered to your side. I don't think it's strange to call it that, but... There is something we must do first. Hashim's face grew serious. We must handle the last of the neutral countries inside the Union of Eastern Nations, the Kingdom of Lastania. If we leave them as they are, we cannot start a new country. That country on the western edge, ha! Huh? Fuagar crossed his thick arms and groaned. That country's a pain to deal with. They're allied to the Nathung Dragon Knight Kingdom, which has a lot of powerful Dragon Knights. And Julius, the Manite as their next king, is the big brother of Suma's third primary queen, Roroa. That makes him his brother-in-law. If we lay a hand on him, we run the risk of making an enemy. Yes. Which is why we left him to the end Hashim said, pulling out a letter. This list from father has two meanings. The first is hire these hidden talents inside the Union of Eastern Nations. And the second is if you cannot, then dispose of them before they become your enemies. This was exactly how Fuagar and Hashim had operated thus far. Those on the list who submitted were placed in positions of importance, and those who adamantly refused were killed by subterfuge. That said, with Fuagar's fortunes clearly on the rise, the number of people who would refuse to serve was small enough to count on your hands. If he were as obsessed with gathering personnel as Suma, he might have desperately tried to persuade them, but the more pragmatic Hashim was loath to go to such effort. Hashim slapped the letter shut. And the last name on the list is Sir Julius of the Kingdom of Lastania. Father believed he was the most valuable talent in this country. It would be reassuring to have him on our side, but frightening to see him become our enemy. That's Suma's brother-in-law. The same guy we were just talking about, ha? Huh? Yes. He was the crown prince of the former principality of Amidaniya, and his father Gaius fell in battle against King Suma. After that, his little sister, Princess Roroa, stole the country out from under him and sent him into exile. That's why I thought we might win him to our side with the promise of revenge against the kingdom of Frydenaya, but... It wasn't meant to be, ha. Huh? Hashim nodded. During the demon wave, Sir Julius sent his own request to the kingdom of Frydenaya for reinforcements. I approve of his willingness to bow his head to a former enemy when it's to his own benefit, but they may have become friends at that point. 
Princess Roroa sent him a wedding gift when he married the Crown Princess of Lastania, so their relationship has likely been mended too. That means Julius is close to Suma. Yes. So much so that we can't leave him be. He's a perceptive one too. He didn't participate in the banquet where we plotted to wipe out the neutral faction. What a headache, if they laid a hand on Julius, they risked stirring up the kingdom of Frydenia. For Fuaga, who found something inscrutable about Suma, it seemed too soon to be picking a fight with that country. However, Julius was too talented for it to be safe to let him stay in the Union of Eastern Nations. They might be keeping a traitor in their midst. I guess we can't leave the kingdom of Lastania alone, then, Fuagar came to a decision. Hashim gave him a big nod. Indeed. If we leave Sir Julius alone, every move we make will be leaked to the kingdom. Besides, Sir Julius is their former enemy. Even if he's killed, they'll have no choice but to stay silent. Regardless of how King Suma or Queen Roroa may feel. How do we do it? Have the neighboring states attack? No, when we attack that country, the Nuthung Dragon Knight Kingdom will ride to their aid. The Dragon Knight Kingdom was even able to fend off the Empire when it was at its peak. Although, it seems the Empire simply decided to change their policy and ignore them after seeing the heavy casualties. Hashim shrugged, but immediately took on a serious expression and said, if we don't send a credible force, it won't even put pressure on the Dragon Knight Kingdom. I believe you should lead your best men in the attack, Lord Fuagar. Me, personally. Fuagar asked and Hashim nodded. This is a battle against time. If they face the whole Union of Eastern Nations, then even with the Dragon Knight Kingdom's help, the Kingdom of Lastania won't be able to sustain themselves. Their land will be laid to waste, and supplies will dry up. So, if Sir Julius senses the invasion coming, he will likely attempt to flee the country. If he does, that will cause trouble for us. Yeah, you're right. If he goes to join Suma, that'd be a pain. Indeed. And when the Dragon Knights come out to fight, only me and Durga are gonna be able to handle them, yeah. Fuagar had seen the kingdom's Dragon Knight Halbert and his partner Ruby once before. In Fuagar's entire military, only he and Durga stood a chance against them in a straight-up fight. They were gathering the Union of Eastern Nations Wyvern cavalry and reorganizing them, but the Dragon Knights would tear them to pieces. Got it. Round up our best men. We'll attack the Kingdom of Lastania. By your will. Fuagar hurriedly gathered his best men, and set out for the Kingdom of Lastania. Chapter 8 A large skirmish word that Fuagar and his forces were marching towards Lastania had reached Julius. He sent a request to the Nuthung Dragon Knight Kingdom for aid while also planning to escape there with Jairu Koma and anyone else who wanted to join them. Julius already laid the groundwork, so Queen Silmunta was able to make the decision to dispatch the Dragon Knights immediately and lead them herself to ensure Julius's escape. However, with only his best men joining him, Fuagar's forces moved faster than Julius anticipated. Fuagar's elites found Julius's party before they could cross the border, and were almost upon them. As the Dragon Knights came to support Julius, a clash with Fuagar was imminent. You could say this battle was brought about by two geniuses, Julius and Hashim, each correctly assessing the other's abilities. Julius understood how decisive Hashim was, and planned to make his escape with plenty of time to spare. He had predicted that Fuagar's forces would take the time to carefully prepare out of a wariness towards reinforcements from the Nuthung Dragon Knight Kingdom. Meanwhile, Hashim believed that if he sent in only the elites, they might capture Julius's group before they could escape. 
If they could catch them before the Dragon Knight Kingdom could send reinforcements, he could avoid an unnecessary battle against the Dragon Knights. In the end, Fuaga, with his highly mobile unit, finally came into contact with Julius's party, but not until Julius was already close to the border. If either party had been better at predicting the other, this battle wouldn't have happened. You could say it was the result of two closely matched opponents. Horsemen and carriages raced across a field near the border with the Nuthung Dragon Knight Kingdom with Julius and Jairukoma at the lead. Jairukoma specialized in fighting on foot, but today was not the time for that, so he was riding a horse. He struck up a conversation with Julius, who was riding alongside him. Still, I wouldn't have expected this, Julius. Wouldn't have expected what? The number of people who've joined us. We asked all around the country, but only about 40 non-combatants were willing to come. Jairukoma said, looking at the horsemen and carriages behind them. The people loved Princess Tia and the royal family, didn't they? I would have thought more would have chosen to escape together with them, right now, the people want a strong king, not a lovable one Julius said, looking just a little sad. It was not out of anger or discontent towards the people, but almost out of sympathy for those who chose to stay. You can't blame them. The people shed so much blood during the demon wave. We managed to eke out a victory with the help of the Kingdom of Frydenia, but many of them still lost friends and family. Yeah. But it was the House of Lastania that protected them, wasn't it? They were grateful, I'm sure. But, what will happen to us in the next demon wave? Will Frydenia send reinforcements again? Even if they do, what if they arrive too late? We can't defend ourselves alone, can we? Those are the kinds of worries our people always had. Which is why, they came to welcome Fuaga, a symbol of power. That's just, kind of depressing. I told you, you can't blame them. Julius smiled a little. We all put our own families first. Look at me. I had Tia and her parents get out early because I knew that this would happen. Ha ha ha, you have a point there. I mean, I had my own family join them in the name of defending the royal family. Captain Lauren, who was now Jairukoma's wife, had already left for the kingdom of Frydenia along with Princess Tia and the others. Jairukoma and Lauren already had multiple children and because they were still small he'd gotten them out early. Initially, Lauren had been frustrated that she couldn't be there in the country's moment of need, but Jairukoma persuaded her of the importance of guarding the royal family. This is my second time being run out of the country, Julius mumbled to himself. Jairukoma looked at him sympathetically. Does it hurt, Julius? No. Much as I lament my own powerlessness, strangely, I'm not feeling all that depressed about it. Though, I must admit, I felt some dark feelings creeping into my heart when I fled the Principality. Suddenly, Julius looked up to the sky. It was clear, without a single cloud. I felt betrayed by my own country then, but not now. That's only natural. A country is a place for us to belong Jairukoma said, looking up to the sky as well. It's a place where we feel a sense of comfort and belonging. It's that way because we're there, and the people we care about are too. That's what a country is. That's why we love and want to defend it. When I took Lauren as my wife, and we had children together, I stopped feeling that lingering attachment to my homeland. For Jairukoma, having lost his country and become a refugee, he could understand why Julius had changed. Julius let out a small laugh. You could be right. For me, my country is wherever Tia is now. Yeah. Which is why we must survive. 
suddenly, a single dragon knight dropped out of the sky they were looking up to. The white dragon, shining in the sun, was Naden's best friend, Pai Long. On his back was Pai's partner and queen of the Nuthung Dragon Knight Kingdom, Sil Muntu. There was urgency on her gallant face as Sil shouted, Sir Julius, hurry. Malmkitten's forces are almost here. Madam Sil. Thank you for your support. Julius shouted without stopping his horse. You didn't need to honor the alliance when we've as good as lost our country already. Think nothing of it. We only did what is natural when you consider our long friendship with Lastania's royal family and how it's benefited us both. I understand the friendship, but was there benefit for you? Julius asked, cocking his head to the side. Yes. Without the kingdom of Lastania, we lose our window to the world outside. If Fuagar's power keeps growing, our country will be surrounded. Because our pact with the dragons keeps us from invading other countries, we'll be left to starve, I'm sure Sil said bitterly. If they were going to trade with Fuagar's country, Fuagar would no doubt make them swear loyalty to him. But because their pact forbade them from using the dragons to take hostile actions against other countries, Fuagar had no use for the dragon knights. If he tried to use them to fight other humans, the pact said that the dragons would all return to the Star Dragon Mountain range. Fuagar wasn't the type to show them any consideration, so he might stop the flow of supplies, and try to have the Dragon Knight Kingdom collapse from within. So, Sir Julius, once you get out of here safely, we want you to be our go-between with the Kingdom of Frydenia. Sil winked at Julius. We can have our Dragon Knights carry supplies back and forth through the Star Dragon Mountain range. You'd use Dragon Knights as couriers. Indeed, I would. Perhaps we should rename ourselves the Nuthung Courier Kingdom. It doesn't have any of the same grandeur, it's not a bad idea though, Julius thought. Smart as he was. Even in this urgent situation he was quickly thinking through the idea of a shipping company the size of a nation. The pact only forbade them from using the dragons for hostile actions against other countries. Shipments of supplies wouldn't violate that, although they might have to be strictly non-military in nature. With their massive size, a dragon could likely carry a large wooden ship. But with the dragons being the symbol of their country, and everyone aspiring to become a Dragon Knight, there might be those opposed to the idea of Dragon Knights becoming couriers. It was like using a sword that was a national treasure to mow the grass. That was probably why the idea never came up before now. Now that Fuagar was pushing them into a corner, even old-fashioned countries were going to have to change. It's the kind of idea Suma would implement with glee. Julius thought to himself, smiling. Understood. I'll see to it that King Suma gets the message. I'm counting on you. Now then, to make sure our first delivery gets to the kingdom intact, I'm going to spar a little with Fuagar's forces. Be careful. Fuagar's fiercer than you imagine. We know Pai answered telepathically on Sil's behalf. Naden and Ruby's letters told us all about him. When you pair Fuagar with Durga, he's on the same level as a Dragon Knight, maybe even better. There you have it. We won't let our guard down. We're going to give him everything we have still agreed. Godspeed, Julius nodded. You too. With that said, Sil and Pi danced up into the sky, joining up with thirty dragon knights who were waiting there and heading off to face Fuagar's forces. Half an hour had passed since Julius and Sil exchanged words. Near the border, the dragon knights of Nuthung stood in the path of Fuagar and his air force pursuing Julius. Out of the way. You're starting to annoy me. Roa one swipe of Durga's paw tore into a dragon's chest, making it rear back in pain. 
as it did, Fuagal's arrow struck the dragon knight in the breast. Gu, the dragons fell from the sky one after another, along with their knights. Sil and Pai trembled with rage as they watched the scene unfold. Damn you, Fuagawa! Sil bellowed. How dare you do that to our comrades? Pai shouted telepathically. I never expected him to be so powerful. Sil thought. When they first collided with Fuagar's forces, Sil divided the thirty dragon knights she had brought into groups. One was sent to attack and delay the soldiers on the ground, while another guarded Julius's group from the wyvern cavalry that was closing in on him. The final group, led by herself, would confront Fuagar, the biggest threat of all. He turned the tide on his own. He's like some sort of epic hero from the storybooks. Sil had taken every caution. In fact, the units she had sent after Fuagar's forces on the ground and in the air were overwhelming them. But Fuagar's own abilities had far exceeded her expectations. Fuagar and the small number of wyvern cavalry guarding him had forced Sil and her men into a disadvantageous position. To be more precise, the wyvern riders had desperately tried to buy time while Fuagar and Durga fought and won one-on-one -on -one duels. By the time Sil and Pai had exterminated the meddlesome wyvern cavalry, they had already lost five dragon knights. Never in the history of the Nuthung Dragon Knight Kingdom had they ever lost so many against one man before. The only ones able to fight against dragon knights had been other dragon knights. Unable to believe what they were witnessing, the dragon knights cowered in fear. Ha! Huh. Rushing towards a stopped dragon knight, Fuagar leapt from Durga's back, his Zangonto sparking with electricity, and swung down at the man. The dragon knight instinctively raised his sword to block, but... Zap! The moment Fuagar's Zangonto slammed into it, a thick bolt of lightning tore through both the knight and the dragon. It was the same move he'd once used to tear a big hole in a massive zombie rhinosaurus. The knight was vaporized, and the dragon fell with a great hole in its body. Only Fuagar remained using the wings on his back to hover. Pai gulped at the sight. I can't believe a human can wield lightning like Nadens, gah. If the tiger's monstrously powerful, then the man is too, ha. Huh? Sil ground her teeth as she watched Durga pick Fuagar up out of the air. We can't let him take down any more of our men. Let's do this, Pai. Yes, Lady Sil. Pai the white dragon attacked before Fuagar and Durga fully recovered. As Pai spat fire, Durga turned in order to protect Fuagar. When the flames struck, Durga was sent flying. When Durga recovered in midair, the tiger's left side had its fur burned in some places and was injured in others. Considering how little damage was sustained from the dragon's breath, it showed just how incredible a creature Durga was. Seeing his partner's injuries, Fuagar's face lost its usual calm. TCH. They're good. This won't be as easy as it was with the others. Fuagar Han. I will avenge my men. Sil swung her lance while on Pai's back. Fuagar instinctively leaned right and it grazed his face, tearing a shallow gash in his cheek. He wiped away the blood with his bracer glaring at Sil. Not bad. I guess they put you in charge of the Dragon Knights for a reason. Enough talk. Sil and Pai attacked with blades of wind and flaming breath at the same time. Fuagar had Durga rush in, dodging as they approached, then leapt from the tiger's back as before. He wreathed his Zangonto in electricity, swinging downwards at Sil. I won't let you do that. Whoosh, bash. Pai spun around like a windmill, batting away Fuagar with his wings. After being hit with a force akin to that of a charging rhinosaurus, even Fuagar looked like he was feeling the pain. Goo. Durga. 
Thuagar shouted as he was sent flying, and Durga answered his call, swinging a paw at Pai who had not recovered yet. Pai tried to lean back and out of the way, but Durga's claws were rushing towards his face. That strike, too sharp to call a cat punch, tore into him. Gwa. Pai. There were distinct, bloody claw marks on the left half of Pai's head. He'd probably lost sight in that eye. But if he fell, his partner Sil would die too. Knowing this, Pai struggled to stay aloft through the pain. It's okay. I can still fight. Pai, he, I see we're both blessed with good partners said Fuaga, who was using his own wings to float in midair at the spot he'd been knocked to. Durga rushed to his side, and Fuaga mounted the tiger again. He was a little worse for wear after being buffeted by Pai's wing, but Fuaga was still full of energy. Pai, meanwhile, was only staying in the air by sheer force of will. Fuagar pointed his Zangunto towards them and said, But Durga and I will win. Princess. The four dragon knights who had been unable to join the battle got in between them to act as Sil's shield. Even if they had to launch a desperate suicide attack, they were ready to take Fuagar down with them. Fuagar gave them a fierce grin. Bring it on. I'll gobble up as many of you as I have to. Urk. Sil grunted, her face twisting in pain. In the midst of all this, a single wyvern approached. Lord Fuaga. Lord Hashim is proposing a truce. He wants me to stop fighting. We were just getting to the good part, Fuaga grumbled as he looked down below. The ground force had been totally stopped by the Dragon Knight's attack. It was hard to blame them, given they were defenseless against fire attacks from the air. The group led by Julius of Lastania was also out of sight, having no doubt crossed the border into the Nuthung Dragon Knight Kingdom now. If he pursued them across the border, that would mean total war against them. With six dragons down, the Dragon Knight Kingdom had lost 20% of the forces they'd brought. Fuagar's own forces likely had lost a similar percentage, but having failed to capture Julius, this was a strategic loss. It looks like it's not enough for me to win on my own. Fuagar's shoulders slumped and he lowered his Zangunto before calling out to Sil. You heard the man, Dragon Knight Princess. Our targets escaped into your country. If we keep going, it'll mean war. I'm pretty sure that's not something you want either. I'll pull back my troops, so go back to your own country. Ugh, Sil's face distorted with frustration at the sudden offer of a truce. She wanted to avenge her comrades, but if they continued fighting, there would be more sacrifices. They had already succeeded in their goal of aiding Julius's escape. To continue fighting now would be an entirely personal battle. If she wasn't careful, it could violate their pact with the dragons. As the leader of the dragon knights, she couldn't afford to be a fool. Very well. But you will allow us to collect the dragons and their knights' remains. We must return them to the Star Dragon Mountain range. This is to prevent them turning into monsters like skull dragons. HMPH, fine by me. Signal the retreat Sil ordered. The dragon knights blew their whistles. Her forces near the ground stopped when they heard it. With their battle over, they all gathered to Sil's side. From there, she directed them to collect the remains of the fallen. When that was complete, the Dragon Knights organized in a defensive formation around Sil and Pai. She took one last look at Fuagar before turning to go. They're damn well organized. I could use an air force like that Fuagar thought aloud as he landed, watching the Dragon Knights go. Then, riding Durga down to the ground forces led by Hashim, he dismounted as his advisor welcomed him with a bow. 
I almost had the enemy queen too, I believe I have told you repeatedly that war against the Nuthung Dragon Knight Kingdom would be pure folly said Hashim, raising his head and shrugging his shoulders in exasperation. Then, with a sharp look in his eyes, he told Fuaga, the battle just now made me sure of one thing. If our two countries went to war, we would undoubtedly win. The Dragon Knights are powerful, but their numbers are limited. If we attack from multiple fronts, and retreat whenever the Dragon Knights appear, their country will be laid waste, and war weariness will spread throughout the majority of the population that are not Dragon Knights. You were saying that the common people would choose us over their pact with the dragons. Yes. And that would be the ruin of the Dragon Knight Kingdom. However, if that happens, we risk the Dragon Knights all defecting to other countries. That would be incredibly bad for us. So, if we are going to destroy them, we save them for last, right? I know Fuagar said putting a hand on Hashim's shoulder and nodding. Still, it's a shame about Julius. Yes. He was able to make decisions faster than I'd thought. That makes him exactly the sort of person I want for your country, and a dangerous man to make an enemy of. That's why I wanted to secure him for ourselves, it wasn't meant to be. But we managed to accomplish our other objective, right? Yes. We caught up, and were able to fight the Dragon Knight Kingdom. In Fuagar's dispatch of troops to Lastania, the primary objective was to capture the Lastanian royal family, especially Julius, but there was also a secondary objective of putting up a good fight against the Dragon Knights of the Nuthung Dragon Knight Kingdom who would be coming to assist. And if they fought well against the Dragon Knight Kingdom, Whereas the Empire could only fight them to a standstill in their heyday, the people's hopes for Fuagar would grow. Fuagar and Durga had slain six Dragon Knights. This news would not fail to excite the people's zeal. Fuagar and his men had accomplished this not in a full war against the Dragon Knight Kingdom, but in what was still a skirmish. Hashim crossed his arms and told Fuagar, up until now. The people knew we would retake the Demon Lord's domain. However, after this battle, they will think it's no dream for you to conquer the entire continent. Please, ride that wave of popular sentiment as far as it will take you. Yeah. But first, we'll need to bring together this country that no longer has any enemies in it. If we're going to rise up. We need to make sure the ground beneath our feet is steady first. Fuagar and his men headed into the capital of the Kingdom of Lastania to sort out what would happen after the war. With this battle against the Dragon Knight Kingdom, Fuagar earned himself the moniker the tiger who eats dragons from his people, and the tiger became the symbol of his forces. Fuagar would go on to be called the Great Tiger King and his followers would earn monikers of their own like the tiger's ex. His wife, Matsumi Han, was the tiger's partner his advisor, Hashim Chima, was the tiger's resourceful schemer his right-hand man, Shu Kin Tan, was the tiger's sword and the old commander who took an arrow for him, Gei Fu Ku Kian, was the tiger's shield. But it would still be some time before that happened. Chapter 9 the defectors volunteer their services in the royal capital of Parnam. Your Majesty. We just received word. It seems they will be coming Hakuya said as he entered the governmental affairs office. Oh. So they are coming, huh? I said, rising from my chair. I had been waiting for this report. It had been ten days since they'd received news of a skirmish between Fuagar's forces and the Dragon Knights of Nuthung near the border between the Kingdom of Lastania and the Dragon Knight Kingdom. Under guard by a force of Dragon Knights led by Queen Sil herself, the Lastanian refugees, including Julius and Jairu Koma, sat down in the courtyard of Parnam Castle. Having received advance word of their arrival, I met their representatives. Queen Sil and Pai for the Dragon Knight Kingdom, 
and Julius and Jairu Coma for the Kingdom of Lastania, in the audience chamber. With me were Prime Minister Hakuya, my bodyguard Aisha, and Roroa and Naden who had ties to our guests. Whoa, Pi. What happened to your eye? Naden cried out when she saw Pi standing next to Madame Sill. Pi had an androgynous looking face in his human form, but the area around his left eye was covered with a mask now. It was very stylish, looking almost like a Venetian mask. Ah uh, ha ha, Pi laughed awkwardly, pointing to the mask. The tiger got me during our fight with Fuaga. Durga did. Are you okay? Yeah. I got to a healer quickly, so I didn't go blind. The scar won't go away though. A warrior's wounds are badges of honor. As your wife, I couldn't be more proud Madame Sill said, throwing her arm around Pi's shoulder. He blushed and thought, Madame Sill calls herself the wife, but she sure is manly. At the same time. Julius and Roroa were meeting again for the first time in a while. Big brother, Roroa. I don't think we've met since the demon wave. Taking note of her swollen belly, Julius said, it sure has grown. Are you due before Tia? Yeah, I reckon I am. Looks like big sis's kid is gonna be the little sis. Oh. How has Tia been, by the way? She's been doing great, aside from being worried sick about you. Thank goodness, once everyone had the chance to check that their friends and family were doing all right, I cleared my throat loudly. All right. I'm sure you all have loads to talk about, but I'd like to handle the formalities first. Welcome to the Kingdom of Frydenia, Queen Sil and Sir Pi of the Nuthung Dragon Knight Kingdom. Thank you for greeting us, your majesty. Th thank you. Queen Sil and Pi bowed their heads in unison. I nodded. And I'm glad you could make it, Sir Julius and Sir Jairu Coma. You are welcome here. Thank you. You have my gratitude for taking in the members of Lastania's royal family. This is a greater honor than we deserve. Julius and Jairu Coma bowed their heads too. With that, I clapped my hands. Okay, I think that's enough of me in king mode. Julius, I'm sure you must be tired from the long trip, but could you explain what's happened? Very well. Julius explained all the details of what had happened inside the Union of Eastern Nations. The vast majority of it matched what our agents had reported. But having been there himself, Julius knew more about the general atmosphere inside the Union of Eastern Nation. It was a shock that the people of Lastania welcomed Fuagar becoming their new ruler. I had sensed that the people of the Kingdom of Lastania felt especially close to their royal family. I thought they loved and respected them. And yet, only a small number chose to flee the country with Julius. Everyone puts their own family first. After experiencing the demon wave, the people of the Union of Eastern Nations must have felt safer under the umbrella of a powerful figure like Fuaga. Hakuya let out a sigh as he listened to the story. We knew it would be like this, but the man certainly is trouble, isn't he? Yeah. And now he's got a schemer like Hashim with him. He'll do things that aren't like him if he has to, which is going to make predicting what they'll do even harder, I'm sure you're right. Julius nodded. The Union of Eastern Nations is Fuagar's country now. They'll be able to launch a major expansion into the Demon Lord's domain. With the Empire's more subdued approach, he may be able to become the largest nation by landmass on the continent. However, while he can expand his territory, he cannot grow his population with the same speed. There will still be a large difference in power between us, Hakuya added in response to Julius's bitter words. And yet, the current atmosphere in the world is giving Fuagar the momentum to overturn that difference. 
I learned just how strong that man is by fighting him, Sil said, crossing her arms. He's a monster on a scale like no other. Even if it was just a skirmish, I was impressed that Madame Sil had fought Fuagar and lived to tell the tale. Still, it was terrifying that Fuagar could make a dragon knight talk about him that way. I couldn't do anything, Julius said, lowering his eyes. I was right there, and could only watch as Tia's country was stolen from us. Julius, but I am alive, Tia as well, along with her parents. The old royal family's survival will be an eyesore to Fuagar's camp. Even if he doesn't care much himself, Hashim will. You could be right, from what the black cats told me, Hashim would not hesitate to employ cruelties in service to his goals. He might be a naturally Machiavellian, in the sense that word is used by people who didn't really understand Machiavell is the prince, actor. If so, he wouldn't be able to overlook the existence of the old royal family when it threatened Fuagar's rule. Fuagar may send a demand that you turn us over to him Julius said, looking me straight in the eyes. What will you do? If you refuse, it may harm your relations with Fuagar's camp. Will you still let the Lastanian royal family stay in this country? His eyes were serious. That's why I returned his gaze without looking away. I will. And I'll be rejecting any requests to turn you over, of course. I'll use your position as my brother-in-law to soften the blow. I don't think Fuagar will push the issue. Hashim may not like it, but Fuagar won't want to do anything to stir up hostility with us yet either. I was trying to comfort him, but Julius shook his head. You may be right about Fuagar, but Hashim will probably send assassins, at the very least. I intend to give you bodyguards, you know. That's not enough to assuage my concerns. Then Julius dropped to one knee. Ignoring our surprised reactions, he bowed his head with his right hand on the floor. Sir Sumer el Friden, King of Fridenia. I wish to offer you my services. Offer his services. He's gonna work for me. As proud a person as Julius is. You don't need to push yourself. I'll welcome you as a guest either way. I told you. I'm worried. Julius looked up. I could see a shadow hanging over his face. A royal family with no country has no place. Depending on how things develop going forward, Tia may find herself in a dangerous predicament. That being the case, I want to give my all to serve this country, and carve out a position for us that makes it harder to be disposed of. I understand where you're coming from, but, I crossed my arms and groaned. I'm the man who killed your father, he was Roro's father too. I chose to let old grudges go during the demon wave. We're former enemies. You left a bad impression on some people in the kingdom and principality. You'll struggle to gain their trust. You're starting with less than none. I'll work hard enough to convince the people of this country. Brother, Roroa murmured, looking concerned. I didn't know what to do, so I looked at Hakuya and asked, What do you think, Hakuya? I believe it would be acceptable Hakuya replied bluntly. I expressed my formal opposition to taking them in at all. However, sire, you made the decision to do so. At this point, I see little difference between accepting him as a guest and accepting him as a retainer. Oh. That's what you meant. Sir Julius is most certainly gifted. I have confidence in my ability to make preparations in advance and come up with a larger strategy, but taking tactical control on the battlefield is beyond me. Our reports suggest that Fuagar's advisor, Hashim, can do just that. I worry that the difference in our ability to head out to the field of battle may someday prove the difference between victory and defeat. In regards to taking tactical control, 
we had advisors out in the field like Keed. However, she was a midge and mainly operated as rear line support, so she wasn't suited to leading on the front line. In contrast, Julius could put his strategic aptitude to use in the middle of the fray. He had the martial prowess to lead troops while fighting himself too. It wouldn't be a stretch to call him a field commander. If Hakuya handled strategy and Julius took care of the smaller tactical decisions, it would be possible to operate the National Defense Force more efficiently. I looked at Julius. Even if you enter my service, I can't give you the Amidania region as your domain, you know. I am already Julius Lastania. If I am to return anywhere, it will be there. I want to do everything I can to avoid a confrontation with Fuaga. Do you understand that there may not be a home for you to return to? So long as Tia is fine, I can live with that. But if someday war with Fuaga comes, I will devote all my strength to the battle. I see. Sensing his determination, I made up my mind to serve me, Julius. I will. Thank you, Your Majesty. Hearing him call me Your Majesty feels weird. Well, considering he was the elder brother of my third primary queen, and a former enemy too, we probably had to keep a certain professional distance. I was just going to have to get used to it. But when we're not in public, I want you to treat me the same as always. It's too awkward otherwise I said, taking his hand, and Julius smiled wryly. He <laughs> he, understood. Now then, Suma, I know this is sudden, but I'd like to propose a plan for how to deal with the Union of Eastern Nations going forward. Julius was eager to put his cunning to work for me, but... You idiot. What? Roroa walked up and suddenly slapped him across the face. He looked at her in shock as she pointed at him. You've got something else to do before you start offering suggestions. Have you got any idea how worried Big Sis has been about ya? But, Julius started to argue as he rubbed his cheek, but, he must have decided Roroa had a point, because he relented. Sorry, Roroa. As long as you get it Roroa said, crossing her arms and snorting. Julius showed honest contrition, while Roroa demonstrated her dignity as a soon-to-be mother. I couldn't help but laugh at the contrast. A few days later, it appeared that not only the Lastanians had drifted to our land as a result of losing their own to Fuagar and his forces. The third daughter and fourth son of the House of Chima. Sami and Nike, had arrived at the royal castle. As far as these two were concerned, they had actually submitted an application to enter the country to the border guards before Julius arrived. I gave my permission immediately, but because they were traveling overland, Julius and the others who were coming by air beat them here. When I received word they had arrived at Parnam Castle, I met them in the audience chamber with Hakuya, Aisha and their little brother Ishiha. They weren't acquainted with me like Julius, and didn't have a position of importance like Queen Sil, so I sat on the throne during the audience while I tried to discern their intentions. Madam Sami, Sir Nike. Welcome to the Kingdom of Frydenia I said to them in king mode, and Nike was the one to bow his head and respond. Thank you for meeting us on such short notice. Sami on the other hand, with a vacant expression on her face, said nothing. She just bowed her head at the same time as Nike. It didn't feel like that was out of disrespect, or because she was plotting something. If anything, she had no plans at all. She felt lifeless, lethargic, like an empty shell. While that concerned me, I moved the conversation along. Think nothing of it. Ishiha offered his services to me. If you're his siblings, you are welcome here too. You are too kind. So, what exactly happened? I asked, looking at Sami, and Nike raised his head. 
Sir Suma. Are you aware of the present situation in the Union of Eastern Nations? I've received reports, yes. Fuaga has taken total control, correct. I heard that your father Matthew was struck down in the war. Yes. If you know, then that makes things quicker. Nike placed a hand on Sami's shoulder. During the conflict, my sister Sami's adoptive father was murdered in a plot by our elder brother Hashim, and she was driven out of the country. Nike went on to explain the events that led to their coming here. Sami had been adopted by King Heinrich of the Kingdom of Roth. He had loved her like a father, but because he was part of the neutral faction he was killed in a plot by Hashim. Sami had been attempting to fight back and avenge him, but Nike stopped her. I already knew how Fuagal had seized power from Julius's report. But it felt heavier hearing about it from an actual victim than it did just reading words on paper. I'm sure, when they write the history books, all it will say is, Fuagar won the Battle of the Sibyl Plains and took control of the Union of Eastern Nations. I think there was a commentator in the world I came from that said what is left once you remove all interpretation from the facts is history. There was likely more bloodshed than I imagine, and more tragedy. A purge of those with uncertain loyalties. I had done the same thing. Convincing myself to do it with the justification of rebuilding the country. But while I had that pretext, I'd still struggled with it. Fuaga. How about you? For the dream he races blindly towards. For the dreams others had entrusted to him. What did that great man think when blood and tears flowed? Did he struggle with it? Did he not care? Was he too dense to notice? Was he prepared for it? Or even drunk on the blood? He was too different for me to even hazard a guess. But. No matter how he feels about it, I feel like he'll stand there, facing it head on. I was weak, so I needed others to help me. When the guilt of the cruelties I had stained my hands with was about to crush me. Lycia and the others supported and consoled me. That was how I was able to just barely stay on my feet. Fuaga was so strong he wouldn't need Madame Matsumi to support him. That was what I was thinking about while Nike told the story. Once most of the details were made clear, I asked him, and... What are you doing here in my country? I wanted to leave Big Sister Sami here. Where Ishihar is? Madam Sami. Right. If I leave her in the Union of Eastern Nations now, she'll spark conflict. Big Brother Hashim isn't one to let that happen. Which is why Big Sister Matsumi asked me to get her out of there in order to keep our family from spilling any more of our own blood. This was at Madam Matsumi's direction. Yes. I have a letter from her here. Aisha took the letter Nike pulled out of his pocket and brought it to me. It spoke of Matsumi's feelings, unable to stop Fuaga because she was his wife, but wanting her sister Sami to be well. It ended saying, please take care of her and Ishiha. When I finished reading, I passed it to Hakuya and Ishiha to look through. Big sister Matsumi, Ishiha seemed especially pained by what he read there. I guess Fuaga won't be demanding that she be handed over, then. I thought. If he tried, Madam Matsumi would push back with everything she had. Fuaga wasn't the type to disregard Madam Matsumi's feelings like that. Hashim would probably scowl, but unlike Julius, he wouldn't go so far as to make an enemy of Matsumi in order to get his hands on Sami. I faced Nike and Sami. We have no intention of stirring trouble with Sir Fuagar's country. If you're looking for us to help you with your vengeance, we can't do it, okay? That is fine. I think what big sister Sami needs now is time. Fair enough. 
and you're all right with that too, Madam Sami. Sami nodded, no emotion showing on her face. Yeah. The emotional scars are going to take some time to heal, I thought. Then I turned and said, Ishiha, would you show Madam Sami your room? Okay. Come on, big sister Sami. Ishiha called out to Sami hesitantly, and her eyes widened. Then, as she looked at his face, massive tears began to stream down her face. Ishiha. Ishiha. She hugged him tight, bawling. My father. Hein. Hashim, he, he. What? Yes. I'm listening. You can tell me all about it. What? Sami wailed as she clung to Ishiha. He gently stroked her back, like you would a crying baby. For the rest of us present, all we could do was watch. Some time after that, when she had settled down a little, Sami left the room with Ishiha. It hurt to see her go, leaning on his shoulder like that. We probably shouldn't let her meet Yuriga for a while, a good point Akuya replied. I'll tell Madam Yuriga to be careful not to run into her too. Looking at Nike, I said, you can trust us with Madam Sami. So. What will you be doing from here on, Sir Nike? I wonder that myself. I'm pretty sure I can't return to the Union of Eastern Nations anymore. He was talking a little more casually now, probably out of relief that he had been able to hand Sami off to us. This was probably what he was normally like. Will you live here in this country? It's not much different to me, sheltering two of you instead of just one. Ah ha ha. I appreciate the thought, but this place is too close to the Union of Eastern Nations. Even if you have no intention of instigating anything, we can't be sure Sir Fuagar won't start a war with you. If I placed myself in your care, I might end up having to fight against Big Sister Matsumi. That's, the one thing I want to avoid. I see, he must have really loved his sister. He'd brought Sami here, even at the cost of not being able to return himself, all at Matsumi's request. As I thought, guess I can't get him to stay, a familiar voice spoke out. Bukya kya. Then how about you come to my place? Kayu said as he entered the audience chamber. I looked at him with exasperation. Kayu. You were listening. Only to what you were saying just now. When I saw Ishiha leaving the audience chamber, I figured you guys were done. With that said, Kayu crouched down in front of Nike. I remember you from the demon wave. The third or fourth son of the Chimas, right? The fourth. And you are? I'm Kayutizia, future head of the Republic. The Republic of, Turgis. Yeah. On the southern tip of the continent. Kayu slapped Nike vigorously on the shoulder. It's out of the way, and damn cold, so even the Empire hesitated to invade us back in the day. If Fuagar's gonna expand south, we'll probably be left until last. That makes us a pretty good fit for you, don't you think? It does, but, I hate the cold. Bukyakya. It might be a bit tough on a human like you, but you'll do just fine if you bundle up. Although, even the traveling merchants stop coming in the winter. What, it's not like you've got anywhere else to go, right? Kayu grabbed Nike by the lapels and pulled him to his feet. So come to my place. You seem tough, so you're more than welcome. Ah. It's already decided. Sure is. You heard that, bro. I'm taking this guy. Hey. Wait, Kayu. Before I could stop him, Kayu dragged a still reluctant Nike out of the room. Is this really okay? If he has no intention to offer us his services, 
I believe this is acceptable Hakuya said, unfazed. Sir Nike is an accomplished warrior and a sharp-minded commander, so it's preferable to him returning to the Union of Eastern Nations to serve Sir Fuaga. Oh, that makes sense. I could see Hakuya had a point. Frydenian Terminology Explainer the five great colored retainers known for his obsession with collecting personnel, Suma gathered many capable retainers to his side. Because of this, rather than use common groupings like the three dukes, the big four, the twelve divine generals, or the twenty commanders, people came up with their own groupings. One of these was the five great colored retainers. This was because a number of Sumer's retainers had aliases that involved a color. The four who were universally agreed to belong to this group were Lysia, the Golden Fortress of Ice, who was his devoted wife, Hakuya, the black-robed Prime Minister, who supported his policies, the Red Oni, Hal, who distinguished himself on the battlefield, and the white tactician, Julius, so-called because of the white clothes he wore which contrasted with Hakuya's black, who supported him with military strategies. As for the fifth, opinions were split on whether it should be XL the Blue Sea Princess, or Sebastian the Silver Deer. Incidentally, Lycia's moniker, the Golden Fortress of Ice, came from her days in the military academy where she'd coldly rejected all men who approached her. It is said that when she learned of this nickname, she nearly died of embarrassment. Chapter 10 Those who were reunited The story turns back to after the meeting with Julius. Tia, he he, you're in that much of a hurry to see your darling wife, ha? Huh? Of course I am. Who wouldn't be? Julius responded to me with a shrug. After Julius's audience, I went with Roroa and Aisha to guide him to where Princess Tia and the former Lastanian royal couple were waiting. The exiled royal family had been given a mansion in the nobles' quarter of Parnam. When we had shown Princess Tia the house, she'd said, Oh, this is too much. I know we're imposing on you, so a small house would be plenty but it would have been a lot more trouble to guard them if they lived among the common people where anyone can come and go, so I made her accept it. They were related to Roroa, the third primary queen, after all. The mansion wasn't so far that it was worth making Naden take us, so we took a carriage instead. Jairu Koma, who was now treated as Julius's servant, volunteered to act as our coachman. Jairu Koma's wife, Lauren, the former captain of Lastania's soldiers, had a live-in job at the mansion where they were hiring Lastanian exiles as guards and servants. He probably wanted to see his beloved wife and children in a hurry too. Inside the carriage, I sat across from Aisha, and Roroa sat across from Julius. Still, I never imagined you would become a mother, Julius said, looking at her swollen belly. Grandfather Herman must have been quite pleased. And Sebastian too. It's a load off my shoulders Roroa said, chuckling as she patted her abdomen. Ever since she had the twins, Big Sis CIA's been pushing me to have a kid of my own. She only got more insistent when we found out Big Sis Juna was pregnant before me. I'm jealous, though, Aisha said with a somewhat pained smile. As members of long-lived races, Aisha and Naden had a harder time getting pregnant. They both wanted children eventually, but they were going to have to take the long view of things. Speaking of children, what really surprised me was Jairu Koma's family. I'm sure Julius agreed, nodding. Jairu Koma's wife had come to the kingdom together with the Lastanian royal family as a bodyguard. At the time, she had brought Jairu Koma's children with her. Three of them. Apparently, after their first, she had immediately gotten pregnant with twins. That meant she'd given birth to three children in the span of a year. And she was pregnant with their fourth on top of that. Kayu's servant, Liparina, 
is a member of the White Rabbit race, which were famous for their fecundity. Perhaps Lauren has some White Rabbit blood in her too. Or is Gyrucoma just that virile? As I was cocking my head to the side, Julius sighed. I'm sure it's the latter. You should have seen how those two were all over each other after the wedding. It was that bad, huh? Tia got a little upset, seeing the way they were constantly going on about how much they love each other. Well, yeah. She would. You all got married at almost the exact same time, I thought. Well, now you two have a house where you can flirt to your heart's content. A house, huh? Julius got a slightly troubled look on his face. H.M. Is something the matter? When you said the word house, it made me think, if I'm coming home now, what kind of face should I be making? I wasn't able to defend Tia's country, after all. I'm not sure there was anything you could have done, was there? There was no way a tiny state like Lastania could have handled Fuagar's forces. If anything, Julius deserved praise for foreseeing the conflict and getting the royal family out safely. However, despite this, Julius was having a hard time processing it. The joy of being able to see Tia, the relief that she's safe, the shame at having our country stolen, the guilt I feel towards her. All of those things are inside of me. What sort of face should I make? Julius, you'll meet her with a smile, of course. Roroa said with a grin. Big Sis has been worried about you all this time, you know. All you need to do is say, I'm home with a smile. And try hugging her too. Oh. Yes, I suppose you're right. Roroa's encouragement made Julius smile a little. She was always good at bringing people's spirits up like this. While we were talking about it, we reached the mansion where Princess Tia and the others were waiting. This mansion, which had a rather impressive garden, was one of the ones that had belonged to a corrupt noble who had opposed me when I was given the throne. It would have been a shame to demolish them so there was talk of giving them to people who distinguished themselves. But because of who the previous owners were, no one, aside from newcomers like Poncho who had no house in the capital, had really wanted to live in them. They said they were bad luck. Because of that, they had been used as museums, or to house guests like Kayu and his entourage. Once we had tied up the horses, Princess Tia emerged from the mansion. Lord Julius, she exclaimed, rushing over to gently hug him. Tia. Be careful you don't trip. I'm so glad you're all right. I've been so, so worried, waiting for you, with the baby. Yeah. I'm home now, Tia. Julius gently stroked her head as she cried on his chest. Their long-awaited reunion was finally here. Roroa, Aisha, and I all had the decency to give them a quiet moment together. We were the king and queens in this country, though. Our coachman, Chirukoma, rushed into the house as soon as he was done cleaning up the carriage. He must have been going to see his own wife and children. Some time after... The former royal couple of Lastania came out to greet us, then showed us to the living room. We all sat down at a table by the fireplace. With everyone gathered, Julius told Princess Tia and her parents what had happened since they left. The kingdom of Lastania had already been absorbed by Fuagar's forces, and no longer existed as a distinct entity. Julius bowed his head to the former king. Father. We lost the country due to my lack of power. I cannot apologize enough. You don't have to. Raise your head, son-in-law the former king of Lastania said, placing a hand on Julius's shoulder with a peaceful smile. Without your efforts, we would have lost not only our country but our very lives. 
It is thanks to you that our family could be reunited like this, Sir Julius. Father, while it is a shame we lost the country, what my wife and I truly wish is for you, Tia, and the children you'll give us to be healthy. So please, don't push yourself too hard. You don't need to try and get the country back for our sake. The former queen of Lastania nodded in agreement. Julius's eyes seemed to be watering at those words, but after some time he said, yes, and nodded. With his report concluded, I opened my mouth. Julius has decided to offer his services to me now. Our country will defend you with all its might, so please enjoy a relaxed life here in the royal capital. And come around to the castle to play sometimes, will you? I'll be sending you invitations, Big Sis Roroa said, grinning. But looking at these bellies, I reckon that the first place we'll be going together is Dr. Hild's clinic. Hee <laughs> hee, you could be right. Please come with me. You're going with Roroa. That's Warism, hey now, big brother. Roroa got really mad at the way Julius was frowning, but, I knew how he felt. You can take time off on the days she goes, Julius I said. Aisha followed up with, yes, that would be wise. I would feel more at ease if Sir Julius were to accompany you. You're ganging up on me with him, darling and big sis Ari. Well, when I see how you run around with that belly, I worry. Hild had explained that a certain amount of exercise was needed as part of prenatal care, but I still felt like she was moving around too much. It made my heart race when I thought she might fall down the stairs. You can assume everyone in our family, except for Roroa herself, felt the same way. While we all laughed at the sulking Roroa, the maids came in with a tea set and said, Tea is ready. As they were passing around the cups, Julius's eyes went wide. What? He stared at the dishes. What's going on? Why are these dishes here? When we realized what Julius was surprised about, Roroa and I looked at one another. Then, nodding, I told him, Julius, those are exactly the dishes you think they are. Ah. Then these are the ones we left in the house in Lastania. Princess Tia's family and Julius had all had to flee the country without time to pack all their things. Only a handful of their belongings had made it out of the royal manor in Laster. And yet, most of the things that had been in that manor were now found in this mansion. That was because. After annexing Laster, Fuagar was kind enough to send your belongings to us. Fuagar Han did. Why? Probably, as a warning. Around the time the Dragon Knights and Fuagar's army collided. Having called a truce with the Dragon Knights who had come to rescue Julius, Fuagar entered the capital of the Kingdom of Lastania, together with Hashim and a subsection of his army. When they passed through the gates, his wife Matsumi, who had come to Laster ahead of the others to calm the people there, rushed over to him. Lord Fuaga, Are you all right? Hey, Matsumi. I just got back. Fuaga dismounted from Durga and gave Matsumi a hug. As he held her, he touched her body all over, verifying for himself that she was real and there. You fought the Dragon Knights, right? You're not hurt anywhere, are you? I'm fine. I just hurt my shoulder a little. It's no big deal. The truth was that a good half of his body was aching from getting slapped by Pai's wing, but Fuagar laughed it off because he didn't want to worry Matsumi. She took his helmet off and touched his cheek. The wound on your cheek still hasn't healed. Don't be reckless. Sorry. I'll be more careful from now on. While Fuagar and Matsumi were talking, Shuukin, Kaysen, Gaten, and the others who had been fighting on the ground came back. Ha ha ha. 
It's not fair the way they can use dragons like that. We couldn't lay a hand on them Gaten grumbled, upset that the iron fan he was so proud of was ineffective against the dragon knights. We tried shooting at them when they descended to spit fire, but their hides are thick, so we couldn't deal lethal blows. It was all we could do to keep them at bay Kaysen agreed, his shoulders slumping in dejection at the fact his archers had been equally unsuccessful. Behind the two of them, the tough guys, Nata and Maumia, glared at each other as they walked over. Damn it, I haven't been able to let loose anywhere near enough Nata car paid. Hey, Maumia, come see me after this. Another test of strength. Don't you know how to do anything else, you barbarian? I don't wanna hear crap like that out of a guy who swings around a giant hammer. Today's the day we settle things. Maybe because they both prided themselves on their strength, Nata had been testing his strength against Maumiers constantly since joining Fuaga. They usually wrestled, but were an even match, and neither had been able to claim victory yet. Leaving the muscle heads to themselves, Gaten put an arm around Shuukin's neck. Hey, Sir Shuukin, don't you think we should work on our air force? The current Wyvern cavalry was soundly defeated. We should, but it's not something that's going to happen overnight Shuukin said, sounding irritated as he shook free of Gaten's arm. We've only just stepped onto the stage so there are still far too many places where we're lacking. We have to expand our territory, gather people, and build a solid base for ourselves before we'll be able to strengthen our air force. We need to take care of the things we can do one by one. Ha ha ha. Shuukin's got it right. Fuagar said, looking around to each of his retainers. But you put up a good fight against the Dragon Knights today. Take a good rest here. You've earned it. Yes, sir. Shuukin and the other retainers bowed, then left. Fuaga, Matsumi, and Hashim watched them go, then headed to the fortified royal manor. The people of Laster fell to the ground in prostration when they saw them, a show of deference to their new ruler. Casting a sideways glance at the people, Fuaga asked Matsumi, So, how does it look? Will the people follow me loyally? Yes. The fear of the demon wave still lingers. Those who've remained want a strong protector. Many of them are still emotionally attached to the royal family, but they realized it was more realistic to choose you, Lord Fuaga. Sounds great to me. While they were talking, the three reached the fortified manor. Seeing what only looked like a large house because the city was small, Fuagar muttered, This is the former ruler's house, right? Should we put the torch to it to send a message? I would advise against it, Hashim replied. Surprised, Fuagar cocked his head to the side. Didn't see that coming. I thought you'd tell me to raise the whole city to show how severe I can be. If it were to your benefit, I would tell you to do just that. However, burning this manor will change nothing. I will not recommend doing something I know is meaningless Hashim said with a shrug. Had you succeeded in eradicating the Lastanian royal family, I might have considered burning the manor so that they would not be remembered, or even destroying the city. However, the royal family and Julius are still alive. Even if you burn the manor, the people will remember their former masters. It would only spark resentment. Home. What do you want to do, then? It would be a shame to waste the manor, so let's use it as is. We'll take one more measure at the same time. And what would that be? Hashim smiled coldly in response to the question. Gather up all the personal effects left in the manor, and send them to the kingdom of Frydenia. Have the people assist in that process as well. We're going out of our way to send their stuff to them. Trying to do them a favor.
I wouldn't count on any gratitude for such a small favor. It's simply to our own benefit. By having the people gather up the royal family's things and send them away, it will impress on them that their former rulers will not be returning. They'll be helping them with the move, after all. Fuaga was half impressed and half appalled by how Hashim could discuss the nasty moves he was going to make with such a tone of indifference. I get it. They'll feel like they chased them out themselves. Indeed. It will also force the departed royal family to contend with the reality that there is no place for them to return to here. We're saying, we've sent you all you need to live, so spend the rest of your lives in Frydenaya. Makes sense, Fuagar stroked his chin as he thought about it, then nodded. I like how you're always so pragmatic about everything. We'll go with your idea. By your will. And so, Fuagar rounded up the people of Laster, and had them send back all the personal effects left in the manor. The belongings in question were delivered to the kingdom of Frydenaya before Julius, who was staying in the Nuthung Dragon Knight Kingdom, could arrive. That was what we found out from a letter Yuriga received from Fuagar. When he heard this explanation, Julius crossed his arms and groaned. Fuagar and Hashim seem to get on better than I'd expected. Yeah. I was surprised too. The method of gathering the neutral faction together to wipe them out had seemed too vicious for Fuagar. And as for the way he'd sent them their belongings, it seemed too subtle for him. Both were likely Hashim's schemes. The way Hashim could be firm or flexible as the situation demanded was frightening as was the fact that Fuagal had the capacity to accept the plans he was offered. I had thought that, strong as Fuagal was, he would find using crafty plans annoying. I had been hoping that his strength would give us an opening, like how Yang Yu failed to heed the advice of his advisor Fanzang, and was destroyed when enemy rumors tricked him into becoming suspicious of his own subordinates or how Lu Bu was unable to take proper advantage of his strategist Chen Gong. But Fuagar was surprisingly open to accepting ideas from Hashim. I considered Fuagar to be like Zhang Yu, but he seemed to have the open-mindedness and popularity of Lu Bang. If he was Zhang Yu and Lu Bang combined, that worried me, as someone who lived in the same era as him. Did Fabius feel this way about living in the same era as Hannibal the Barsid? I thought, frowning, and Julius laughed. There's no need to be so pessimistic. Fuagar only has one Hashim, but you have the black-robed and me. He won't get his way easily. Ah ha ha, hearing Julius say that so confidently, all my worries were blown away. I told you this during the demon wave too but I'm counting on you, Julius. Yeah. Leave it to me. With that, we nodded to one another, and I shook Julius's hand. Roroa and Tia watched us, smiling. Some days later, Colbert, Julius's former minister of finance, came to visit him at his new house. He was shown into the living room where he met Julius and Tia. Julius. Colbert, it's been a while. The two of them exchanged a firm handshake. I heard everything that happened in the Union. I'm just so, so happy you were safe. Thank goodness, Colbert said, overjoyed to see his old friend that he was tearing up a little. I was a little worried about whether you would be willing to rely on this country. Sorry to worry you. I've formally entered King Suma's service now. You have. But, um. Are you okay with that? Colbert asked, concerned, but Julius nodded. I bear no grudge against Suma or Roroa at this point. What matters to me now is Tia, her parents, and our unborn child. If this country is going to protect them, then I'll do everything I can to ensure that continues. You've really changed, Julius, I get that a lot. 
I look forward to working with you. Yeah. It'll be reassuring to have you with us. The two men shook hands. While they were having an emotional reunion, Tia introduced herself to Colbert's companion. It is nice to meet you. I am Julius's wife, Tia Lastania. Oh, how polite. I am Sir Colbert's self-proclaimed fiancé, Mayo Carmine. When Colbert, who was helping with Mayo's administrative duties, told her, an old friend of mine escaped to the capital, so I'd like to go check in on him she said she would come along with him. Today, Mayo wasn't wearing her armor or helmet, instead choosing an outfit similar to a dirndl that accentuated her figure. Self-proclaimed. Tia cocked her head to the side. Madame Mayo is just calling herself that. It hasn't been officially decided yet. Mayo puffed her cheeks up at Colbert's interjection. Isn't it about time you found your resolve? I and the people of the Carmine Domain eagerly await the day when you come to be my groom, Sir B. It had been quite some time since Colbert went to Randall to assist Mayo in governing the Carmine Duchy and its surrounding area. Thanks to his passionate instruction, Mayo had done a passable job as an administrator, but Colbert's own, greater talents had seen a rapid rise in his popularity there. He skillfully handled all the work put before him while teaching Mayo. There was no way she wouldn't rely on such a capable man. The bureaucrats of the House of Carmine, whose skills were beginning to develop, earnestly hoped that Colbert would marry into the family. Their calls for it grew by the day. Do you hate me, Sir B? Mayo asked, looking at him with teary, upturned eyes. Colbert grunted, then said, um. And not at all, Mayo was wearing especially girly clothes today, and it suited the way she was acting. Her attempts to boost her femininity in an effort to get his attention were working. Because of that, Colbert couldn't respond immediately, but he loudly cleared his throat in an attempt to hide that. I don't hate you, but... I'm not sure how I feel about being married for my administrative acumen. That's perfectly normal among knights and nobles. And I love you, Sir B. Well, that's a whole problem in itself. Hehe. <laughs> I see things have gotten interesting Julius said, smiling, as he watched Mayo and Colbert go at it. This is no laughing matter, Julius. Hey. Why don't you sit down and tell me all about it? Julius had them take seats on the sofa, and called the maids to bring tea. Then, sitting across from them with Tia, he asked, Now, Madame Mayo, you said your name was Carmine. Would I be wrong in assuming that, oh, yes. I am the daughter of Jorg Carmine, former general of the army. The daughter of that lion general, ha. Huh? When Julius was still in the Principality of Amidonia, there had been a standoff along the border with the Carmine Duchy. While it didn't develop into full-blown war, there were frequent clashes between border guards from the two sides. Jorg, Gaius VIII, and Julius would sometimes go to sort things out after the fact, and they had to occasionally meet each other while doing so. Julius was quite familiar with Jorg, albeit as an enemy. Come to think of it, I believe the general had a pretty female knight along with him one time we met. Was that you? Oh, um, I'm not sure I'd say that, Lord Julius. Tia called his name, seeming upset, but Julius smiled wryly and petted her on the head. Of course, you're the prettiest to me, Tia. He he. Seeing the satisfied smile on Tia's face. Mayo's expression changed to one of jealousy. Sir B, I want to be treated like that too. If you're looking for that from me, we're going to have a problem, for a long time, and without realizing it, Julius had been something of a lady killer. That, paired with how beautiful he was made him popular among the female bureaucrats in the castle. 
His father Gaius had been the same way, but was so focused on his military exploits that he never responded to their affection. But seeing the way he acted with his wife, it looked like Julius was the type who fell deeply in love once smitten. Still, Colbert, you've gotten to a ripe old age yourself, haven't you? You're almost thirty, and still single. Isn't it time you settled down? When Julius said that, Mayo loudly agreed. It's time for you to make up your mind. Are you going to take me as your bride, or am I going to take you as my groom? Those are the same thing. Seriously, what are you so dissatisfied with? I've told you that I love you for both your personality and your talents. Goo. Well, that's, that's, ah, uh, you see. Colbert couldn't find the words. As he watched, Julius came to a realization. I see how it is, did you figure something out, Lord Julius? Tia cocked her head to the side. Madam Mayo. My friend Colbert has a truly troublesome personality. Julius. Um, what do you mean? Mayo asked and Julius smiled wryly. Maybe it's because he's always dealing with numbers, but he can't handle things that are vague. It's all or nothing with him. He likes to make clear distinctions, or something like that. The reason he's rebuffing your proposal is likely that he can't decide whether it's because you love him, or because you need his abilities. Colbert became very quiet as Julius hit the nail on the head. Mayo cocked her head to the side. Ha. Huh. But they're both true, see, that's just the problem for him. If, for example, you had simply said, I love you, let's get married Colbert would likely have given you a positive response. Julius said, raising his index finger. He then raised his middle finger. Alternatively, if you had gone to him and said, I want to marry you for political reasons Colbert would likely have accepted the inevitability of it and acquiesced. Though he would accept in both cases, his treatment of you afterwards would have differed, I suspect. Basically, Colbert couldn't tell if Mayo's proposal was for love or out of pragmatic concerns, and was hesitant because he didn't know whether he should repay her with love or service. Julius's explanation made Mayo's eyes widen. Well, that's certainly a troublesome personality, yes. Ha ha, he's an awkward man. It's why my father kicked him so often. J. Julius. Unable to take it anymore, Colbert flushed red. Seeing him get so flustered, Julius told Mayo, Madam Mayo. This is what Colbert is like. So, if you truly want to be with him, you'll need to think about how you want to propose. I see, Mayo thought for a while, then finally stood up. Sir B. No, Sir Colbert. Why yes. I had thought if you had no interest in me, I would be fine with a political marriage. Even if you believed I only wanted your abilities, that was fine as long as you would be with me. Listen. I want to be loved too. I envy Lady Lysia and Madam Tia. I mean, Lady Lysia's husband has multiple wives, and they still get along amazingly. And she's got adorable kids too. She was just like me, a warrior who admired my father, but the gap between us is only growing larger. There was a little selfishness creeping into her words, but that was how you could tell they were earnest. I love you so much, Sir B. I want you to love me back. Can I get a response? Why yes. Colbert stammered, then, realizing what he said a moment later, ah. He'd practically been forced to, but Colbert had certainly given a response. Con, gratulations. Tia cocked her head to the side and clapped. Mayo was utterly verklempt, looking like she might fall backwards, while Colbert hurried to support her. Given how fast he was to react, 
Colbert no doubt felt something for Mayo as well. It's only a matter of time now, Julius thought, sipping his tea. Chapter 11, A Meeting and a Request, Evening of the Day Julius and the others came to the kingdom, Are your injuries okay now, Pi? Ruby asked, sounding worried. Yeah. The doctor examined me and said I'd be fine Pi replied with an awkward laugh. But I heard it was going to leave scars. Ah, uh, yeah. Look. Pi removed the mask which covered the area around one of his eyes, and there were clear scars that looked like cat scratches there. They were small marks that only covered the area around his eye, but that was because the wounds he had taken in his draconic form had shrunk down with him in his human one. Naden and Ruby gulped when they saw the scars. That big tiger did that to you, right? It makes me shudder Ruby remarked. I guess the one good thing is that it didn't affect your vision Naden added. Ah ha ha. But Lady Sill told me the scars look cool. Naden and Ruby looked at one another in the face of this blatant flaunting of a loving relationship before both poking Pi's cheeks. Then, to get things back on track. Naden took hold of a wooden goblet. Anyway, we're all here and well, so let's drink a toast. Naden raised her wine-filled goblet, and Ruby and Pi followed suit. Now, let's drink to our reunion. Cheers. Cheers. They clacked their cups together and then gulped down the wine. Today. The three dragons from the Star Dragon Mountain range were having a girls' party at the experimental restaurant in Panam, Ishitsuka. It all happened because Suma suggested, you and Pi haven't seen each other in a while, so why not invite Ruby and have a party at Ishitsuka? I'll let Poncho know you're coming. He was likely trying to show some consideration to Naden, whose only compatriot in this country was Ruby. He felt she should value her time with her friends. Naden had gratefully accepted the idea, and invited the two of them. The last time we were all together like this was in the kingdom of Lastania, right? Naden said after finishing her wine, and Pi nodded. During the demon wave, yeah. It's been years, huh? When you say it like that. It doesn't feel that long since we've seen each other, but a lot of time has passed, hasn't it? Ruby said, getting emotional as she stared into her cup. We never felt the flow of time this way in the Star Dragon Mountain range. Well, yeah. We must have spent an exhaustingly long time in our homeland, but the time we've spent since meeting Suma feels longer. Yeah. I kind of get it. It's the density of memories Naden said before scarfing down a piece of chicken tatsuta. Pi nodded. Every day in the Star Dragon Mountain range was the same, so none of them stuck in our memories. It was just eating, sleeping, studying, and breaking up fights between the two of you, over and over. Ugh, maybe because they'd just remembered that awkward time in their lives. Naden and Ruby both gulped down their drinks. To drown out the bitter memories. Pi sighed and smiled wryly at their reaction. Compared to that, every day feels special now. I have someone precious to me, and the time I spend with her is invaluable. I love her so much. I get it. Every day I spend with Suma and the others is special. It's the same for me with Hal and Keed. Naden giggled. I think I'll remember these days for all of my long life. If days spent without someone precious to you don't stay in your memories, then I'm sure most of my life is happening now. Hey, you can say something good once in a while. That quip from Ruby made Naden flush red with embarrassment. Why you re-embarrassing me? Way hey. Way hey. In order to mask their embarrassment, the three dragons clacked their cups together once again. Then, after some time drinking and having a raucous good time, Ruby spoke up. Oh, right, 
Ruby said. The people who are precious to you two are in a meeting now, aren't they? Pi stared blankly at her for a moment before nodding. Oh, yeah. I thought I should be at her side, but Lady Sill told me to take this opportunity to enjoy yourself. Well, there's not much we can do during the negotiations anyway. Naden shook her head in dismay. Knowing Suma, though, he won't treat her badly. Around the same time in Castle Parnam. Good evening, Queen Sil. Pardon our intrusion. Lycia and I had come to visit Queen Sil while she was staying at the castle. Good evening, King Suma, Madam Lycia Queen Sil greeted us with a smile and a handshake. If the Queen of a Nation came to visit us, she couldn't just drop off Julius and then say, OK, bye now. This room was the former royal couple's bedroom, but Queen Sil and Pi were occupying it for now. Queen Sil put her left hand over my hand which she was holding and bowed her head. I must thank you for treating Pi. Think nothing of it. I'd feel terrible if we couldn't do at least that much for you. We needed to welcome her as an honored guest, but because the Dragon Knights are chivalrous, or rather, have a tendency towards austerity, she politely declined a banquet in her honor. Instead, because she had heard about our country's medical reforms, she asked that our doctors look at Pi's injuries. I called in Hild and Brad to do the examination. They concluded, it's a painful wound, but not deep, and of no threat to his vision. I heard you wanted to have a meeting today, I said and Queen Sill's expression quickly grew serious. Normally, when I meet with foreign royals, it's done in the audience chamber or a reception room, but my wife Naden was friends with Madame Sill's husband Pi, and she wanted to keep it more casual, so I met with her in the room we were letting them stay in. Pi still had an androgynous, or rather an otoconico, look going on, so I felt weird calling him her husband though. Yes. Let's sit down. I settled into a seat near the table Sil gestured to. Has anything inconvenienced you during your stay in the castle? Lycia asked Queen Sil, and Queen Sil laughed and shook her head. Nothing at all, Madam Lycia. I am humbled by the kind treatment we've received. You even looked at Pi's injuries for us. That's good to hear. Have you been to the castle town yet? Yes. I looked around with Pi. Those broadcast programs of yours were interesting. I had given the two of them free run of the capital while they were here, albeit with the black cats watching and protecting them in the shadows, of course. Naden and Ruby would want to catch up with Pi, so the four of them went out to have fun together. Though. The draconic trio were all at a shitsuka drinking now. Suddenly, Sil got a serious look on her face, and looked at me, saying, However, if I'm out there playing around all the time, it would set a bad example for my knights, and now is a good opportunity. I'd like to talk to you on behalf of my nation. That had been my intent all along, so I nodded. I understand. Julius spoke to me about it too. This is about trade with our country, correct? Yes. Having lost the kingdom of Lastania, our window to the outside world, we will also lose our ability to procure supplies. I expect we will start to run into shortages of food and resources, so I would like the kingdom of Frydenia to take over the kingdom of Lastania's role in providing supplies to us. With Fuagar taking over the Union of Eastern Nations, half of the Nathung Dragon Knight Kingdom's border was now shared with his camp. If he got it into his mind to do so, he could put limits on the supplies that could pass that way, placing a heavy burden on the Dragon Knight Kingdom's people. Sil wanted to open new trade routes to avoid that, likely through air routes high over the Orthodox Papal State, where Wyverns couldn't reach. I crossed my arms and groaned. For my part, I have no problem with it, 
but there is a great distance between our countries. Even if you use dragons, they can only carry so much at a time. Won't prices be higher than when you were trading overland with the kingdom of Lastania? They couldn't count on traveling merchants like before. That said, the only nations of mankind that the Nuthung Dragon Knight Kingdom bordered were Fuagar's country, the vassals of the empire, and part of the Lunarian Orthodox Papal State. The Lunarians saw the Star Dragon Mountain Range, which was the center of Mother Dragon worship, as well as the deeply entwined Dragon Knight Kingdom as their enemies. They had fought with both Fuagar's camp and the Empire before, and relations had not recovered still. They were pretty isolated. If it were me, I'd consider this a good reason to mend fences with the Empire. How about it? Their Empress, Madame Maria, is a trustworthy individual. Considering the growth of Fuagar's country, I think it's worth considering. Queen Sil and Maria can both be flexible in their thinking. I'm pretty sure they'd get along. But Queen Sil silently shook her head. Madame Maria can be trusted, I'm sure. But the empire is far too large. It seems Madame Maria has things under her control for now, but that may not be true of the next ruler. If someone ambitious rises to the position again, hostilities will come easily. Because we don't share a border, you have an easier time trusting us. Is that it? Yes. I am prepared for the cost of acquiring goods to be higher. We will, of course, continue trading with all countries so long as shipping is not cut off. Think of this as us preparing for a situation where we have no other choice. And can you pay a price that makes it worth my time? I asked and Sil chuckled. Of course, we intend to make up the difference with our bodies. When Sil said that, Lysia's shoulders twitched a little. Ah, uh, she didn't mean it that way. I thought. I've heard from Julius. You want to use the Dragon Knights as couriers. Oh. That's what she... Ahem Lysia cleared her throat, trying to cover her embarrassment. Queen Sil smiled wryly before continuing. I thought it might provide a source of funds with which to buy the supplies we'll need. A dragon can carry a large amount in one trip, and so long as they aren't military supplies, it won't infringe on our contract with the dragons. I expect there will be demand, but what do you think? Well, I'm sure there will be, both at the national and civilian level. Then. Sil leaned in eagerly, but I raised a hand to stop her. There would be demand, yes. Dragons had the power to carry as much as two, maybe even four wyverns. They also had human intelligence and could assume human form, so they were able to enter any tight place, and didn't need a wide landing space. If they opened for business here, they'd have any number of customers. But. If I were to allow the Dragon Knights to fly as couriers for private individuals, those Dragon Knights would have to belong to this country. I cannot allow a foreign air force to fly around my country willy-nilly. Considering how powerful dragons were, they were less like transport planes and more like large bombers. Think about it. No matter how much they could carry, would you let fully loaded enemy bombers fly around your country to make deliveries? The dragons could burn a town or city down in an instant, so it wasn't like they had the option of flying without their bombs loaded. They would always be flying with a certain amount of firepower. Yes. You have a point. Sil had no response to my objection. I let out a sigh. I trust both you and Pi but I don't know what each of your individual dragons and knights are like. If even one of them commits an act of indiscretion, or perhaps accidentally drops their heavy load, it would be a disaster. As an example, Naden sometimes acted like a courier as part of the odd jobs she did around the capital, 
but if anything happened when she was doing it, the royal family would be held responsible. But if a dragon knight belonging to the dragon knight kingdom were to cause an incident, it would not be so easy to make them take responsibility. It would definitely require international negotiations. When I explained that, Queen Sil slumped her shoulders. It's a valid complaint. Was I too short-sighted? No, I think you're on the right track. Still, this is a problem. We won't have any way to acquire the supplies we need like this Sil groaned. It's fine I said, smiling at her. I can't let them fly around freely, but it's possible for just the state to hire them. We'll establish flight paths and timetables, and manage their freight contents and weight. When private entities want to use your services to transport a large volume of supplies, for instance, the state can make the order on their behalf, and then you will fulfill it. In my mind, it was similar to having a national space program that rents equipment for experiments from private companies. If the requests are made strictly by the state, not private citizens, it's possible. Really? Queen Sil was visibly elated. I nodded. Yes, with proper flight plans. You won't be making money hand over fist, but you should earn enough profit to buy your supplies. Oh. Thank you. I'd let Roroa, Colbert, and the Ministry of Finance work out the finer details. They would determine the appropriate compensation. This is going to mean more work for Colbert. Sorry, just do the best you can. There was actual demand. It would also help bring together the maritime alliance we had formed with the Republic of Turgis and the Nine-Headed Dragon Archipelago Union. Well, with how cold the Republic is, flights would have to be cancelled starting in the beginning of autumn, I'm sure. I leaned in a bit closer to Sil, lowering the tone of my voice to say, Now, getting right to it, I have a delivery request for you on behalf of my country. Home. Let's hear it. I decided to tell Queen Sil about a certain transport mission that was being planned. When she heard about it, she stared at me for a moment in shock, then got a big smile on her face and slapped her knee. Sounds interesting. Let us handle it for you. Thank you, Madam Sill. We have a contract, then. Queen Sill and I exchanged a firm handshake. We were the first to form an official contract with the Nuthung Courier Kingdom. Chapter 12 The Lunarian Exodus A little after Suma and Sill's meeting there was a major move underway in the Lunarian Orthodox Papal State. The hardliners who wished to join with Fuagar's new faction won the political battle, and began suppressing the moderates. The hardliners opposed Maria of the Grand Chaos Empire who had wrongfully assumed the title of saint. Fuagar's burgeoning fame following his unification of the Union of Eastern Nations worked in the favor of the hardliners. Because this was a struggle among the higher-ups of the church, most of the individual believers who made up the general populace never knew about it. As a result, the suppression was done quietly, in the shadows. Moderate bishops were taken in as heretics one after another. One night, as all this was happening, the time came for an old moderate cardinal and the saint candidate under his protection, Mary, to say their farewells. You're certain, you can't come with me? Mary asked sadly, and the old cardinal nodded. I have always intended to stay in this country to the bitter end. But if you stay, you will be, ha ha ha. I'm getting on in years. I wait only for Lady Lunaria's guidance now, so I have no lingering attachment to the mortal realm. The old cardinal placed a hand on Mary's shoulder and continued. But you are all still young, still with many things to accomplish. You must live, and keep the faith, no matter what. May the blessings of Lady Lunaria be upon you. 
Yes, Mary said, tearing up. The old cardinal smiled at her. Ah, I do have one worry though. That rotten Bishop Suyi is in the kingdom of Frydenia. I couldn't bear to see the believers in that country fall into depravity because of him. Mary, watch him closely, and see to it that he attends to his duties seriously. I most certainly will, Mary said, nodding, and placed a kiss on the old cardinal's hand. Then, rising, she said, I'll take my leave now. Bowing once, Mary left the cardinal's room. Wiping her tears as she walked through the halls of the church, she passed another girl. She was a cute little thing with a baby face and short black hair. Mary bowed, thinking to walk past her without saying any more, but, stopping and turning to look back, she called the other girl's name. Anne. The girl she'd called turned to face Mary. There was no light in her eyes, making her look almost like a puppet. Anne, I heard you were chosen as Fuagar Saint Mary said. It is a greater honor than I deserve, Anne pressed her hands to her chest and bowed her head. Mary was worried, seeing her like this. Do you understand the fate that awaits you? To support God's chosen king, Lord Fuagar. That is the mission heaven has bestowed upon me. In Lunarian Orthodoxy, saints were tools that connected the Lunarian Orthodox Church to influential figures of the time. In order to please these figures, they had to accept anything that was done to them. They were like puppets at the whims of their owners. This duty was taught to them, and they were raised solely to carry it out. It had been the same for Mary, who was chosen as Suma's saint. Now, however, Mary understood how warped it all was. And precisely why she couldn't help but extend a hand to the girl in front of her. Anne. Will you, come with me? I do not understand what you speak of. Once you see the broader world. In the kingdom, you will be able to find a life other than as a saint. Whatever would I do that? Anne looked completely mystified. I have been blessed with a mission from Lady Lunaria. Why should I need to abandon it? Why now? when I have at last been able to discover the reason I was born. Well, saints were often orphans. This was because it's easier to instill faith into a person who has nothing to cling to. In doing so, they became loyal to authority figures, and willing to give their lives for the faith. Mary had tried to warn the nearly 100 saints of the danger of their predicament, and urged them to flee the country but roughly half of them chose to stay. Were Mary the same person she once was, she might have made the same decision. Obedience to the teachings of the Lord is a virtue. However, when people speak to you of the Lord's teachings, if you do not consider that they may be giving you a warped interpretation, that is not obedience but blindness. The higher-ups, in particular, are prone to infighting, and corrupt easily after all. However, even if she invited her, Anne would likely not give up on being a saint. Knowing that so well that it hurt, Mary closed her eyes. May Lady Lunaria's blessing be upon you, at the very least, yes. And upon you, Lady Mary Anne responded without a hint of irony. She had nothing but the purest of faith, and no malice for those she dealt with. That only made it all the sadder, but Mary turned and walked away quickly. She didn't have that much time left. Mary headed for a disused chapel near the eastern gates of the city walls. When she arrived and headed in, she was surrounded by a number of girls and priests. They numbered nearly eighty in total. Lady Mary. Lady Mary, what will become of us now? They were the saint candidates who had agreed to escape with her, as well as priests of the moderate faction. Many of the candidates were younger than Mary. They had likely been willing to listen to her because their indoctrination was not yet complete. 
In an attempt to calm them, Mary said, it's going to be okay. Everything should be organized already. Then, looking around the gloomy church, she said, you're there, aren't you? Come out, please. When Mary called out, the very next moment a large man clad in pitch black armor emerged from the darkness. He wore a terrifying black tiger mask over his head. Eek! That bizarre appearance made a number of the saint candidates cry out. It's okay Mary stepped forward as if to shield the other girls, then spoke to the big man with the black tiger mask. You're Sir Suma's agent, correct? Yes, the big man with the black tiger mask put his hands together in front of him and bowed his head. I am Kijetara. I will take all of you to the kingdom at the behest of my master, His Majesty Suma Kajuya, who received a request that we do so from Bishop Suyi Lester. I see. We're sorry to trouble you. Hearing Mary's words, the girls finally realized this person was an ally, and calmed down. Seeing that, Kijetara said, I must urge you to make haste. When they learn that the saint candidates have disappeared en masse, pursuers will come after you immediately. We know. Please, lead the way. Yes, hmm. Kijetara led Mary and the girls to the city walls, not far from the disused church. Ten carts awaited them there, and men dressed in disguise to look like traveling merchants. They were all members of the Black Cats. These are our comrades. We will have you escape in those carriages. Understood. Please hurry aboard, girls. Hearing Kijetara's explanation, Mary nodded and gave the order. The saint candidates and priests split up across the ten carts. They were loaded with empty casks of wine which they hid inside. Then they headed for the gates, masked as a merchant caravan. When they arrived. Halt. Where are you going at this time of night? The gate guards called out to stop their caravan. One of the men dressed as merchants responded as representative of the group. Yes sir. We are from the trading company and we came here carrying offerings of some condiments called soy sauce and miso from the believers in the kingdom of Frydenia to Lord. Now we're returning with his gift of blessed wine. They called it blessed wine, but it was really just wine. The Orthodox Papal State had branded their own country's wine this way to present it as something people should appreciate as part of their preaching. Is that true? The soldier asked while peering inside the cart. The traveling merchant bowed his head. Yes sir. I have a note from Lord, right here too. Home. Everything seems to be in order. The soldier nodded after checking the note. The trading company was fictitious, but Queen Roroa's company did, in fact, ship condiments. As for the note he presented to the gods, it was a genuine one, provided with the help of the old cardinal. The kingdom and Mary had both been thorough in preparing for this day. Thanks to that, the carts were not searched. Very well, you may pass. May the blessings of Lady Lunaria be upon you in your travels. Thank you kindly. All right, we're going. And so, Mary and the girls were able to escape the city. When they had traveled some distance away, Mary emerged from her cask, and poked her head out of the cart to talk to Kijetara who was sitting in the driver's seat. Where to now? she asked. Under the original plan, we were to follow a poorly guarded route to the border, but, shortly before time came for the operation, we secured a reliable ally. We are going to meet with them. A reliable ally. Mary echoed, but Kijetara did not answer. The carts moved a little further, then when they crested a hill Kijetara pointed ahead of them. There they are. Mary squinted at the figures in the distance. It was gloomy because of a cloud passing in front of the moon, 
so she couldn't make them out with any clarity, but as she drew closer she realized there were a number of knights, as well as women with horns and reptilian tails. One of the knights approached the carts as a representative of this group. You are Madam Mary and her party, yes. From the voice, Mary could tell the knight was a woman. Yes, and you are. I am Queen Silmunt of the Nuthung Dragon Knight Kingdom. Mary gasped as her eyes widened with surprise. She couldn't believe a knight of Mother Dragon's religion was in the Orthodox Papal State. The Dragon Knight Kingdom was known to have a contract with the Star Dragon Mountain Range, the center of Mother Dragon worship. Lunarian Orthodoxy and Mother Dragon worship were the two largest religions on the continent, and Lunarian Orthodoxy rejected Mother Dragon worship as heresy. What is a person from the Dragon Knight Kingdom doing here? I have come to collect you at King Suma's request. King Suma's. Yes. Because our partners, the dragons, can carry carriages higher than even an anti-air repeating bold thrower can reach, and fly directly to the kingdom. Mary was dumbfounded. Partially by the fact that Suma had moved the Dragon Knight Kingdom to aid them, but also that a country belonging to their religious rivals had come to their rescue. She had been surprised by how the different faiths of the kingdom happily coexisted but this was an even greater shock to her. Sensing her internal turmoil, Syl smiled at her and said, Do you hate accepting the help of your business rivals like this? No. Faith is not a business. The tension slipped out of Mary's shoulders and she smiled back. Thank you for doing this for us. We're in your care. Ha ha ha, understood. I promise you a safe journey through the skies. Syl lifted her hand, signaling Pi and the others to transform into their dragon forms. The dragons each picked up a cart with their horses detached, then the knights climbed onto their backs, and up into the sky they flew. From there, it was straight to the kingdom. The dragon knights of Mother Dragon Worship saved the saints of Lunarian Orthodoxy. This story would be slightly embellished and spread by those like Su Yi and the adherents in the kingdom who did not desire religious strife. Later, when rumors that a large number of moderate bishops had been purged reached the kingdom, the saint candidates and priests who escaped said, the true saint was Mary, who moved the dragon knight's hearts. While this may not have been true, it did lead them to revere her. Why do they try to make me a saint when I've already quit being one, Mary was reported to say, troubled. Chapter 13, Welcoming All Who Come, Chasing None Who Leave the 1549th Year, Continental Calendar was a year of intense changes. It began with the Kingdom of Frydenia and Nine-Headed Dragon Archipelago Union's joint slaying of Oyamijuchi, and the creation of a maritime alliance based on bonds formed during that operation. This meant the creation of an alternative force that could compete with the Grand Chaos Empire and the Mankind Declaration in the West, and people must have expected an era of East-West conflict was on the horizon. However, that was forestalled by Malmkitten and their leader Fuagar. Fuagar went wild in a way that blew the slaying of Oyamijuchi out of the water. Externally, he invaded the Demon Lord's domain to retake territory, and internally, he wiped out opposing factions inside the Union of Eastern Nations. As the world appeared to be heading towards an era of two factions, he created a third. Obviously, we weren't idle as that was happening. There was the development of the new academic field of monstrology, the medical reforms led by Hild, and the research undertaken by Trill and Genia, all of which greatly increased our national power. There was also the East and West Rael song battle which pushed forward research into the effect songs could have on visualizing magic and this had a demonstrable effect on increasing magical efficiency at an individual level. It was maybe only a 10% gain on average, 
but a 10% gain in magic across the whole nation was still a big thing. Our population was also steadily rising, consequently increasing the available personnel. The baseline for the common people's lives was rising too. If the people who supported Fuaga, due to the harsh conditions of their lives, were to try living in the kingdom, they wouldn't want to return to Fuaga's country. While his vision seemed very idealistic, the country itself was by no means prosperous. Still, it was hard for these kinds of results to be noticed, and Fuaga's more showy accomplishments inevitably drew people's attention. It was now the end of the 11th month of that consequential 1549th year. Kijetara's team sent a messenger Kui to inform me that the Dragon Knights had brought a total of about 80 asylum seekers from the Lunarian Orthodox Papal State to the Kingdom. Of them, around 50 were saint candidates. I asked Queen Sil and her people to deposit them in the city of Randall which was the domain of Mayo Carmine, situated in between the border with the Orthodox Papal State and our capital Parnam. Mayo and her aide Colbert would take care of them for a time while I called Mary to speak with me about what would happen from here. I had also summoned Suyi Lester, our bishop from the Orthodox Papal State. With that arranged, I was meeting with them today, accompanied by my first primary queen, Lycia my Prime Minister, Hakuya, and my new General, Julius. I chose not to hold the meeting in the audience hall because I detest the formality of it. Rather than waste time on pointless greetings, I wanted to get right down to determining our policy. We sat at a long table, with the people from the Kingdom on one side, and the two from the Orthodox Papal State on the other. It's been a while, Madam Mary. Yes, it has, Lord Suma. Mary sat up straight and bowed her head. I must apologize for putting you through such trouble. Also, I could not be more grateful that you have taken us in. I thank you on behalf of all my companions. Mary very politely expressed her gratitude. I shook my head. You don't need to be so reserved. This isn't an official meeting. We're the ones who decided to take you in after hearing the story from Suyi. Our country guarantees your safety. Thank you. A weight seemed to have been lifted from Mary's shoulders as she looked at Suyi, sitting next to her. Thank you as well, Sir Suyi, for speaking on our behalf. Well, saving those who are lost is part of my job, you know. Maybe because of how lackadaisical he was usually, it made Suyi feel awkward to get a straight compliment, and he scratched the back of his head in dismay. I looked at Mary. Now then, Madam Mary, if you're here, that means, yes. They have decided to form an alliance with Fuagar's country. A saint has already been chosen. Of course that was going to happen, I knew it was coming, but... My shoulders slumped and I let out a sigh. Then, I asked my advisors Hakuya and Julius, do you think Fuagar will accept the offer? Without a doubt, he will. Hakuya was the first to answer. Fuagar Han's expansion is supported by his own personal popularity. His country will benefit from the backing of an authority like the Lunarian Orthodox Church. It will help him to unify the Lunarian Orthodox adherents inside the territories he's annexed. Ah. If it helps him to pacify the people after the war, that's definitely advantageous. Yes. On top of that, his rapid growth has led Sir Fuagar to be labelled an upstart. With the recognition of the god Lunariah, he will be able to silence all the people who sneer at his nation for having been a backwater minor power. I see, I agree with the Prime Minister Julius concurred. If I might add, it comes with considerable military advantages as well. This country has declared a maritime alliance with the Republic and Archipelago Union. 
If Fuagar intends to expand his faction going forward, he'll want to prevent us from working with the Empire at all costs. That means he'll most definitely want the countries that form a wedge between us, the Orthodox Papal State and Mercenary State Zem, as his allies. That is what I'd do, and he has a sharp man like Hashim at his side. He must be thinking the same thing. True. I guess that settles it, then. My two brains had come up with the same prediction. It was more or less a sure thing that Fuagar would strengthen ties with the Orthodox Papal State. I didn't really want their predictions coming true, though. Suma. Lysia pulled on my sleeve under the table. I know it's important to think about the future, but you need to decide what we're doing with Madame Mary and her people first. Oh. Right. Mary didn't say anything, but I saw a look of uncertainty on her face. She was a lot more human than last time we met, and I found myself wanting to do something for her. It's going to be okay. I won't treat the saint candidates or the priests badly. We will have to check for any spies hiding among the group, though. Once that's done, I think I'll split you up to work at churches around the kingdom, you um. It's hard for me to say this, but, Mary interrupted me. H.M. Do you have something to say? Well. The priests will be fine but the saint candidates have been educated to be loyal to the kings that Lady Lunaria sends them to. Because of how they were taught, they know little of the world, and I cannot imagine them being able to form ordinary human relationships. Oh, there was that kind of problem too, huh? Yes. In fact, there were especially zealous candidates who wouldn't listen to a word I said when I tried to warn them of the dangers of staying in the country. I wasn't able to bring them with me, oh, she probably wasn't able to just write that off as their own choice, and their own responsibility. Mary shook her head, as if trying to muster her courage, and looked straight at me. I worry that if we split up they will be isolated. If possible. Could we not separate the fifty saint candidates? Please? Mary bowed deeply again. The people from the kingdom all looked at one another. We all smiled wryly. Raise your head I told Mary. It's true we planned to split you up, but there was that story about you singing hymns while casting area heel, right? I'd like you to help with our research on that. On Area Heal. Lunarian Orthodoxy had a magic spell known as Area Heal which could heal a large number of wounded people at the same time. When they used it, the casters and targets all sang hymns. It seemed that they were increasing the efficiency of it by having both the healers and healed visualize the effect. Our experiments during the Rayal Song battle had shown that songs other than hymns could have an effect too. I want to study area heal in our country too. I had been planning to put together a choir for that, but... What about the saint candidates, can they sing? I have this mental image of nuns singing love songs to angels. I was reminded of a movie my grandpa liked with some powerful nuns, but obviously, there was no way Mary would get the reference, so she just looked at me in confusion. Um. I don't know about love songs, but, she placed her hands over her chest and smiled. We have been trained in the arts in order to make rulers like us. I believe we can live up to your expectations. Mary took the job. She sounded awfully confident despite her humility, so it sounded like I could look forward to the results. It might be good to have Juna direct the choir. I smiled and nodded. That should be good, then. I'll arrange for the saint candidates to do that. Yes. Ha ha ha. Good for you, little Miss Mary Suyi replied with a cheerful cackle. He wouldn't be laughing for long, though. Now then, 
with the saint candidates taken care of. Suyi. H.M. What's up? You are to become an archbishop. Come again. Suyi looked at me slack-jawed, as if he didn't understand what I was saying. This was Hakuya's idea. Explain it to him, would you? Understood. Hakuya nodded. With the Orthodox Papal State having joined with Fuagahan, and us sheltering Mary and her associates, relations are bound to deteriorate. It will get bad enough that we can't just have Sir Suyi lazily dodge the issue. You, could be right, Suyi said, coming back to his senses. Now that things have come to this point, I want to completely cut off the believers in the kingdom from the Orthodox Papal State. If they were to go over your head and incite their adherence to action, it would be real trouble, after all. To that end, I want you to become an archbishop leading a new sect of Lunarian Orthodoxy. You're telling me to go independent. Ah. It's not like we're telling you to change what you worship. There's no need to stop worshipping Lunaria or alter how you carry out services. Only the person at the top of the organization will change I added for the frowning Suyi's benefit. The idea was to imitate the Church of England from my old world. They created a new denomination, Anglicanism, to shut out the influence of the Roman Catholic Church. I think we learn it in school that, the king created a new religion because his old one wouldn't let him get a divorce. There are a lot of popular embellishments that make their way into that kind of story, so I don't know how true it is. Still, I don't know about calling myself an archbishop, Suyi sounded reluctant, but I needed him to make a decision. Hakuya turned to Suyi with a cold expression. Now that they have escaped here to the kingdom, the Orthodox Papal State will no doubt condemn Mary and the others as heretics. If the connection to the Orthodox Papal State remains strong, they will still be in danger. We can't be sure that they won't have their adherents in the country attempt to assassinate them. I believe, as the one sheltering Madame Merilla, you should understand that well. Merilla. The high elf they say snuck into the temple, Mary's eyes widened in surprise. Suyi scratched his head, but eventually gave up and let out a sigh. Well, if I become archbishop. You'll protect the little miss and the rest, right? Of course I said with a firm nod to show I was not taking on the task lightly. As far as our country is concerned, this will be a new Lunarian Orthodox religion. Let's call it Kingdom Lunarian Orthodoxy for now. If Kingdom Orthodoxy will not incite its believers, carry out festivals, and work to provide emotional support for the people, then I think we can build a good relationship. Sigh. It's a pain in the butt, but I'll have to do it. You'll take the job, then. Yes, Uyi reluctantly accepted. So don't you go back on your word to protect the little miss. I gave him a big nod. I'll take on that task as king of this nation. But I don't think this will be all that bad a deal for you. If you become an archbishop, you can nullify Merilla's status as a heretic. She'll be free to walk the streets in Parnam, where public order is maintained, at least. Ha ha ha, that's just great. She'd better be grateful. Suyi cackled. I looked at a bewildered Mary. Madam Mary. Why yes. Though things have turned out this way, as you can see, Suyi doesn't have a shred of dignity. If we let him act as Archbishop, there's going to be people who take him lightly. I'd like you to watch him and ensure he acts with dignity. Ah. Uh. Hey. What do you think you're doing? Suyi cried out hastily. Having been chosen as a saint once, Mary seemed to have the respect of the devout followers, and she could make up for Suyi's lack of dignity and charisma. If anything, 
it seemed likely that Su Yi would be leader in name only, while she took control of the church internally. Effectively, the secret boss of Kingdom Orthodoxy. Mary seemed dazed for a moment, but soon started to chuckle. He he, that was my intention all along. I will keep a close eye on Archbishop Su Yi and ensure that he acts in a manner befitting one addressed as His Holiness from now on. You heard her. Good for you, Su Yi. You've got a reliable right hand. Now I've got another woman on my back, nagging me. It's not good at all. Your Holiness. If you do not speak with the proper deference to those who stand above you, it will set a poor example for those beneath you. And she's super into it already. Damn it all. Su Yi's shouting made everyone else laugh out loud. One day in the twelfth month, 1549 th year, continental calendar, it had been about a month since Mary and her people arrived. On this day, I had come to the mountains in the southwest of the kingdom, along the border with the Republic. I was together with Lycia, Aisha, and Juna with our newborn child. Roroa was still pregnant, and Naden couldn't handle the cold, so they were holding down the fort back in the capital. With us, we had also brought the science team consisting of over-scientist Genia, Merila the High Elf, and Princess Trill of the Empire. The Republic team of Kayu, Taru, Liparina, and his newest servant Naikichima, were tagging along as well. Watch your feet, sire, Lady Lycia. Thanks, Aisha Lycia said, taking the hand Aisha offered her. We were currently walking through a large tunnel that had been built in this mountain. This tunnel, reinforced with Roman concrete and magic, had a road running partway through it, so we had been able to come that far in carriages. However, the path was unpaved from there on, so we had to disembark and walk. Lycia let out a white breath. Ah. It's warmer here in the tunnel than outside, isn't it? It's still cold, though. It's so cold this time of year that Naden refused to come with us, after all. But, it sure is dark in here, huh? Well, we do have lamps Aisha said in front of us, helpfully holding up a lantern. The tunnel didn't have lights that were on at all times like a modern one would. The light most we used in the street lights in town stored up energy during the day so it couldn't be used to light the inside of a tunnel. But if we tried to keep campfires or oil lanterns going, that would end badly. We'd have to light our own way, like an old steam engine going through a tunnel at night. While we were talking about it, Kayu came up to us with a laugh. Well, you just have to live with it in this season he said. If we're going from the kingdom to the Republic in winter, there's going to be snowy mountain passes to cross. Even with the right preparations, it's a risky business. That's true, and the Roro Amaru hovercraft that we have traveling along the coast is full of supplies. It'd be rough for ordinary people to get a ride. Bukyakya. Hence the tunnel, right? This tunnel ran several hundred meters and was a joint investment by both the Kingdom and Republic. This was done in order to make travel between the two in winter just a little more possible. Although, because of the difference in financial strength, Kayu haggled me down a lot. Ultimately, the Kingdom paid a much larger share of the cost, but, I would just consider it as official development assistance. Now, for constructing the tunnel we were finally able to put the complete drill to work. Trill's obsession can pierce mountains. That's pretty incredible, huh? Genie remarked. He he he, when we loaded the drill on Makadra and tested it against Oyamaijachi, that helped us find some points for improvement. It really cut down the time it took to complete Trill responded gleefully. This tunnel was built by boring with the drill machine, reinforcing it with enchanted steel arches and Roman concrete. 
Honestly, I had left the design entirely to the engineering team, so I had no idea how this tunnel compared to the technologies in my old world. From the look of things, it seemed solidly built, though. At this size, you could take a rhinosaurus through Aisha said, looking up at the high ceiling. Yeah. It will only fit one for now, but I'd like to lay another tunnel beside this so that rhinosaurus trains can run back and forth. Millimeter HMK you agreed with me, smiling. There's only one line back and forth now. As we were walking, we came to a place deep inside. There was rock blocking the way ahead, but a chill air blew past it. There was a drill with a tunneling shield nearby, and the engineers were close. We seemed to have reached the end. Now, let us put on the final touches, big sister Genia. Yeah. Okay, I'll leave that to you. Genia raised her hand, and the waiting engineers moved into action. They activated the drill and made the shield portion spin. Then the rhinosaurus tied behind it started walking to push the drill forward. Rumble. The drill loudly chewed through the bedrock. We watched it move forward a while before eventually a cold wind blew inside, and a light flooded into the tunnel. The drill had pierced through the mountain, and we could see vast fields of snow on the other side. A long tunnel across the border into snow country, I said. Yeah. It's our homeland, the Republic of Turgis. Kayu rushed towards the exit. Taru. Leaperina. Nike. Come on. Good grief, wait for me, Master Kayu. Taru and Leaperina raced out onto the snow after him. Nike followed behind, spear resting on his shoulder, filled with dismay. Cold. Do I really have to live in this country from now on? Nike shrunk into himself, and Kayu slapped him heartily on the back. You're my retainer now, so duh. Snow country's nice once you get used to it. I'm starting to miss the northern heat, Nike grumbled as Kayu made a nuisance of himself. From now on, huh? I thought before asking, you're going home, Kayu. Sure am. Thanks for taking care of me for so long, bro. Kayu said, rubbing the end of his nose. Sir Gurren, head of the Republic, had already finished laying the groundwork inside his country, and was awaiting his son's return. With the tunnel to the Republic completed today, it was decided Kayu and his crew would be going home. Incidentally, before he left the capital, I'd gotten my family and comrades together to give him a big going away party, so today he was just leaving. Kayu walked over to me and extended his right hand. I've learned a lot from you in the last few years, bro. Like that there are all sorts of ways to rule, and policies that seem pointless may have hidden purposes. Thanks to that, I feel like I know the kind of head I want to become for the Republic. Kayu sounded a little embarrassed. I extended my own hand and took his. I think you're way more suited to being a ruler than I am, you know that, Kayu. I always have. Bukyakya. You just don't seem like much of a ruler, that's all, bro. And with that, we exchanged a firm handshake. Next to us, Lysia and Aisha were saying their goodbyes to Leaperina. So long, Lady Lysia, Lady Aisha, thank you for everything. Having you all leaving at once feels sad. Were you able to make fun memories in the kingdom? Yes. But, when I look at the two of you, H.M. I remember you chasing me around during the song battle. Pfft. Ha 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 ha, the two laughed. It's nothing to laugh about. You traumatized me. Leaperina protested with teary eyes. They look like they're having fun, I thought. Meanwhile, Taru was parting with Genia and the engineers. 
It made me realize all over again how deep the bonds we'd all formed were. I'm going to miss you all. We'll be talking weekly over the dual voice broadcast to share reports, won't we? Besides, you'll come to our wedding, right? I'll send an invitation. Of course, but try to choose some time a little warmer. Winter's pretty rough. Even just standing here chatting I could feel the chill. The Republic sure is cold. Kayu couldn't help but chuckle at my shivering. Yeah, I know. See ya. Kayu lifted his cudgel with a grin. Until next time, bro. No, my friend, King Suma of Frydenia. Yeah, take care. My friend, Kayu Tizia. Kayu didn't turn back again after that. They faced forward, returning to their homeland. We watched them go, waving to their backs. Epilogue the Great Tiger Kingdom of Han, first day, first month, 1550th year, continental calendar, Fuagar made his move right at the beginning of this year. Shan Castle in what had once been the Kingdom of Shan, the mightiest country in the Union of Eastern Nations, was now known as Han Castle, the new home of Fuagar. In the audience hall there, with the flag of his ancestors hanging behind him, Fuagar stood before his commanders, brave, cunning, and fierce, in front of a throne that was raised several steps above them. I hereby rename the Union of Eastern Nations the Great Tiger Kingdom of Han. It was a declaration of the end of an old state, and the birth of a new one. This country will continue liberating the Demon Lord's domain with one unified will. Lend your strength to me, Fuagar Han. I will build a strong nation that no one, man or demon, can tread on. Yeah. Fuagar's followers cheered with throaty voices. On this day, Fuagar finally announced the founding of the Great Tiger Kingdom of Han, and took the throne as the first Great Tiger King. With the extermination of his political rivals inside the Union of Eastern Nations the previous year, he had already effectively made the country his own but this was a declaration to everyone inside and outside the country that he was king here now. During his speech, he was flanked by his wife Matsumi and advisor Hashim. In his role as master of ceremonies, Hashim declared, in celebration of our king's ascension to the throne, a messenger has arrived from another country. Step forward, Saint Anne. A young girl in a white habit stepped forward from the line of people in attendance. She walked to stand before Fuagar, sinking to her knees, and putting her hands together in front of her chest as if in prayer. Then she spoke in a quiet but clear voice. The Lunarian Orthodox Papal State recognizes Lord Fuagar as the Holy King chosen by Lady Lunaria. May your hands protect the faithful and your words lead the devout. The orthodox papal state swears to walk by your side. That's so. Fuagar said simply. Originally, religion was something Fuagar could do with or without. He found it better to act himself than to beg for divine intercession. The way he saw it, doing so would likely turn his fortunes, and God would probably side with him anyway. That's why being recognized as a holy king by a theocratic state didn't evoke any strong emotions in him, but Hashim had insisted that an alliance with the orthodox papal state would be indispensable to their further expansion. Let me be a king worthy of the honor you have given me he said, hiding his true feelings. And bowed her head. My life is yours to command, Lord Fuagar. I will serve you as I serve Lady Lunaria. I offer my body and soul. Use me as you see fit. Oh, yeah. Thank you for your trouble. Fuagar had heard from Hashim that the Orthodox Papal State sent beautiful and submissive young girls to influential figures of the time as saints. He preferred a woman like Matsumi who had a mind of her own, and felt no attraction to one like Anne who left herself to the whims of fate. 
still, he felt some pity for her, so he meant to treat her well. I hope that by living in this country, she'll be able to smile like Yuriga one day, Fuagar thought, compelled by his nature as an older brother. Anne stepped back, and Hashim took a piece of paper presented to him on a tray by some bureaucrats. Yet another country sends us congratulations on this auspicious day. The king of our neighboring country, Sir Sumer El Fryden, has sent kind words through Lord Fuagar's younger sister Lady Yuriga. I will read them now. Hashim read off an inoffensive statement from Sumer celebrating the founding of the great Tiger Kingdom and wishing for amity between their two countries. As he did, Matsumi, who was standing beside the throne whispered, Couldn't Yuriga make it today? I told her in advance not to, Fuagar whispered back. Matsumi cocked her head to the side. Why is that? It's your big day. If she comes home, Suma's people may get wary and refuse her reentry. Foreign royalty who haven't sworn loyalty to you are just a source of trouble, after all. As long as we're expanding, he won't know what to do with her. Is that right? Fuagar smiled wryly at the disappointment in Matsumi's tone. Yeah. But it sounds like Yuriga had no intention of coming anyways, you know. Ha. Huh. She didn't. When I told her she didn't have to, she told me she couldn't anyway because, she has school and, she wouldn't get off with just supplementary lessons if she took off for another extended leave now. Do you think school's really more important than her brother's moment of glory? He <laughs> he. It sounds like she has a lot of friends, so she must be enjoying life in the kingdom. It wouldn't be good for her to get too influenced though. Fuagar shrugged. He seemed unconcerned, but sensed that Yuriga might decide to settle down in the kingdom. Yuriga was clever. She was also the kind of person Fuagar liked, one who could think with her own head. If, having thought things through herself, Yuriga took a different road, that could be interesting in its own way for Fuagar. Fuagar Han's ascension to the throne as the Great Tiger King, and the founding of the Great Tiger Kingdom of Han would have a massive impact on the situation on the continent. For one thing, it essentially rendered the Grand Chaos Empire's Mankind Declaration toothless. The unification of the Union of Eastern Nations resulted in the loss of many signatories, leaving the Empire's two vassal states and Zem as the only other remaining members. Furthermore, because of the Great Tiger Kingdom's conquest of the Demon Lord's domain, its purpose had also been lost. However, thanks to Empress Maria's charisma, they were still the largest and most powerful country on the continent. There was also another large faction, overshadowed by the Great Tiger Kingdom, the Maritime Alliance consisting of the Kingdom of Frydenia, the Republic of Turgis and the Nine-Headed Dragon Archipelago Union. This alliance was founded on the Law of the Sea which said they would each help the others in times of trouble on the waters, and was designed to let them immediately form a unified fleet, essentially a shared one, in the event that any of these countries was in danger. The Kingdom of Frydenia and the Nine-Headed Dragon Archipelago Union combined had the largest maritime force in the world obviously overwhelming the Great Tiger Kingdom with its almost non-existent fleet, but also the Empire, which was always a country with a heavy focus on land. While the Great Tiger Kingdom and Empire competed for supremacy over the land, the Maritime Alliance was growing at sea. The Great Tiger Kingdom of Han The Grand Chaos Empire The Maritime Alliance in the 1550th year of this world's continental calendar, these three forces would struggle for supremacy. And, it would also be the year when an event would happen that shook all three. Afterward thank you for purchasing volume 14 of Realist Hero. Dot Yomru here, and we have a proper afterward, not a midword, this time. 
the theme of this volume is the expansion of Fuagar's power. The great man chosen by the times moves his allies, and his enemies too. For those of you who have a hard time imagining the charisma that draws people to Fuagar, please try listening to songs like Gun no Yumiya Shinzu wo Sasajiao, and Gunj. That propulsive feeling of Move Fight Burn your life away Fuagar's charisma is like a concentrated version of that. Those drawn to him burn their lives away with a sense of intoxication. That's why his road to glory is stalked by death. His allies will give their lives for him, and his enemies die satisfied to face a foe as strong as Fuagar. This point is in contrast with Suma. Suma's camp tends towards pragmatic compromise. The way they see it, if they die, there's no point in any of it. What glory is there in death? They are willing to put their opinions aside and use whatever they can. That's why they can hire former enemies like Julius. It's an environment where someone like Julius can say, I guess I'll have to do it and help out. It's also part of why so few named characters die in Suma's story. From a storytelling standpoint, the former is probably more exciting. The popular figures in history aren't the conservative but the revolutionary ones. However, if you look at it from the perspective of the many who lived in the same era, I have a feeling that opinion might change. Now then, I give my thanks to the artist Fuyuyuki, to Mr. Satoshi Yuda of the manga adaptation, to my editor, to the designers, to the proofreaders, and to all of the people involved in the anime adaptation as well as all of you reading this now. This has been Dojyomru. I also have another new series going on sale in Japan at the same time as this volume, Yoshio Kun no Ohitori Samakuza. It's a school series, completely different from realist heroes fantasy, with a touch of SCIFI. I started writing it with the thought, what kind of story can I tell in this sort of world? However, as I'm sure realist hero fans will know, I love oddly detailed world settings, and planting certain gimmicks in what I've written. It may read like a common story in a school setting at first, but if you can read into the character's actions, you may find something feels off. If that caught your attention, then please check it out as well as Realist Hero Volume 15. Table of contents cover color illustrations world map characters prologue, The Young Tiger Awakens Chapter 1, The Wavering States Chapter 2, Assassin and Ripples Chapter 3, The Wavering Nations Chapter 4, A Family Divided Chapter 5, Battle of the Sibyl Plains Chapter 6, Turning Point of History Chapter 7, Groundwork Chapter 8, A Large Skirmish Chapter 9, the Defectors Volunteer Their Services Fridonian Terminology Explainer, The Five Great Colored Retainers Chapter 10, Those Who Were Reunited Chapter 11, A Meeting and a Request Chapter 12, The Lunarian Exodus Chapter 13, Welcoming All Who Come, Chasing None Who Leave Epilogue, The Great Tiger Kingdom of Han Afterward About J Novel Club Copyright Sign up for our mailing list at J Novel Club to hear about new releases. Newsletter and you can read the latest chapters, like volume 15 of this series, by becoming a J Novel Club member. J Novel Club Membership Copyright How a Realist Hero Rebuild the Kingdom, Volume 14 by Dojyomru Translated by Sean McCann Edited by Mayu This book is a work of fiction. Names, characters, places, and incidents are the product of the author's imagination or are used fictitiously. Any resemblance to actual events, locales, or persons, living or dead, is coincidental. Copyright Copyright Symbol 2021 Dojyomru Illustrations by Fuyuyuki All Rights Reserved Original Japanese Edition Published in 2021 by Overlap, Inc. This English Edition is published by Arrangement with Overlap, Inc.
Tokyo English Translation Copyright Symbol 2021 J Novel Club LLC All Rights Reserved In accordance with the U.S. Copyright Act of 1976, the scanning, uploading, and electronic sharing of any part of this book without the permission of the publisher is unlawful piracy and theft of the author's intellectual property. J Novel Club LLC J Novel Club The publisher is not responsible for websites, or their content, that are not owned by the publisher. Ebook Edition 1.0, October, 2021